1219. The Oak. Morning, Lola, Osama said. Keeping well? Good, yes. And you? Terrific, thanks. Excellent, yes. Excellent. We smiled brightly at each other. Quite honestly, relations with old Prune Eyes have been a little awkward since he joined us for Tranny Night. He only came once and couldn't be persuaded to return, claiming it was due to calibre of movies. Has resumed his solo trips to the pictures in Ennis on Friday nights. In meantime, continues to be perfectly delightful barman, and still laughs when I inquire, is it lumpy, about soup of the day, but perhaps not quite as heartily as he used to. I looked around for a seat. Only other customers in pub were Considine and the Ferret. Unusual to see them. Considine usually at work on a Friday. He and the Ferret embroiled an intense-looking chat. Considine spotted me. Lola, he called. Join us. Reluctant to. Quite shy around Considine, and had never been introduced to Gillian the Ferret, but obliged to sit down and shake hand of Gillian who looked exactly like Cartoon Ferret. How talented cartoonists are. They can take any creature, dingoes, bulls, ferrets, and while retaining distinctive features, can render them cute. Gillian really very pretty, but, yes, undeniably like a ferret. How are you, Lola? Considine asked. Top notch. Do not know what it is but have uncontrollable impulse for sarcasm every time meet him. Yourself? Top-notch also. Yes, him sarcastic too. Gillian spoke up. Lola, Rossa would like to ask favour. And I'm thinking, Oh, mother of sweet suffering Jesus, what now? Is it not enough that I give my home over to trannies one night out of every seven? What more do they want? Go on, Gillian urged Rossa. Can I borrow your plunger? You mean coffee plunger? I asked. No, Gillian said. Other one. I'm having problems with plumbing. Euphemism for girly innards? God, no. House plumbing. She tried to explain. Something to do with drains. Cannot supply further info. Whenever hear the word drains, momentarily black out. Plunger under your sink. Rossa said. Borrowed it once before from Tom Toomey. Handed him key to the house. Go, take the wretched appliance. Do what you need to do. Return it to where you found it, but please do not involve me because we'll faint. Off he went, leaving Gillian and me alone. He should be at work, she said. He took day off to help me. Kindly of him. More silence. Then she said, is wonderful thing you are doing. Not entirely sure what she was referring to. The plunger? The Friday nights? Is great outlet for Rossa. Or should I say, Chloe? Oh, yes. And you don't mind? Worst things he could be doing? Impressive girl. Riddled with sang froid. The pity is, she said, that I'm no use to him. I live in jeans and don't wear scrap of makeup. Yes, her ferrety little fizzog, free of all artificial unguents. It's funny, I remarked. He makes far better looking woman than he does man. Oh, yes, smile fading, expression faintly huffy. You not think Rossa is good looking man? Cripes had just insulted her boyfriend. Of, of course, is good-looking man. Simply meant, is more groomed as a woman. Must go. Have urgent appointment in Galway. Luckily, actually had urgent appointment in Galway, as would have driven the 70 miles to Eyre Square, centre of Galway, simply to extricate self from awkward situation. 1430. Big, shiny American bank, Galway getting little bits and pieces of styling work. This job had come from unexpected source, in Ketchy. She didn't want to drive from Dublin, and I was in locality. Suited us both. Female CEO was getting head and shoulders taken for company prospectus. 
Brief was to make her look warm, efficient, steely, feminine, approachable, hardworking, humorous, and deadly. Easy. All about the accessories. 1839. Terrible bloody traffic. Friday night exodus from Galway. Afraid I'd be late for trannies. Finally reached home and jumped from car, only to discover had no house key. Limbo danced under wire fence to Rossa Considine. Key, he jingled it at me. Replaced plunger under your sink. Much obliged. Cease and desist from further details. That sort of thing gives me the heebie-jeebies. Hey, Considine. Some sort of ruckus out by front gate. Someone shouting from darkness beyond the house. Listen, dude, don't bother, right? She's just a tease, yeah? Startled, Ross and I strained our eyes at the blackness where the voice had come from. Jake walked into pool of light spread from the front door, like denouement in bad thriller. He looked at me and sneered. You didn't hang around. Won't be long now before you've slept with every man in Nokovoy. Let her alone, Rossa said low and quiet. Only borrowed her plunger. Yeah, Jake laughed nastily. She let me borrow her plunger for a while, too. Now, just a... Rossa said. Stop, I said. Don't bother. Fascinating. That's what it was. A master class in how not to win someone back. If there had been tiniest pocket of Jake love remaining in my heart, would have been erased forever by this lunacy. Will I walk back over with you? Ross asked me. No, no, it's only a few yards, and you've to get ready for tonight. But your man seems a bit unhinged. He's harmless. Would prefer to accompany you, if it's all the same. But he will shout at us. Sticks and stones. Okay, I will wave the sticks and I will throw the stones. 1927 Had noticed interesting phenomenon over last few weeks. Evenings didn't really get going until Chloe arrived. Natasha, Blanche and Sue, the new girl, were getting changed in kitchen. But I felt as if we're hanging around, killing time. Sue was bachelor smallholder from Out the Road seemed to function as actual postal address. His real name was Spuds Conlon. Presumed his real real name was not actually Spuds, but refrained from asking why called Spuds. Presumed it was because he A. ate Spuds, B. grew Spuds, C. um... He was scrawny, bow-legged man, missing many, many teeth. Took lot of persuasion to get him to remove his flat cap. Reminded me of Chicken from Third World, sorry, developing world, country. The sort you would see pecking on dirt road as you whiz past in your air-conditioned jeep. Nothing like plump Irish chickens, all top-heavy with breast. But bird where you would have to do much poking with your fork in order to find any bit of meat at all. Where's Chloe? Noel yelled from kitchen. Need her to do my nails. Any minute now. Then in came Chloe, with sparkling eyes, smiling mouth, pleasant comments, and readiness to help the other girls. Very, very likable. If she really was woman, would have wanted to befriend her. Love your hair, Chloe. Long, dark wig she usually wore, but back combed slightly and pinned on top. Was feeling Jacqueline Suzanne, she said. Now that Chloe mentioned it, Jacqueline Suzanne was exactly what I was feeling, too. Unsettling to be stylist, i.e. a person who makes their living from anticipating and enacting fashion trends, to be overtaken by tranny man. Unlike my other trannies, who had their look and stuck to it, Natasha, leopard skin, Blanche, tailored classics, etc., Chloe arrived in different look every week. This week, black leggings, shiny pewter-coloured ballet flats, and excellent metallic off-one-shoulder sweater dress, also in pewter colour. She probably really could pass for a woman. Tall, yes, and not skinny, definitely not skinny, but not like Brick Shithouse either, unlike, say, poor Blanche. 
shapely legs, perhaps a little too muscular around the calves and thighs, if you wanted to be critical, but didn't want to be critical, and really lovely face, very pretty dark eyes, enhanced by expert makeup and lush dark lashes. Clamour came from kitchen. Chloe's here! Chloe's here! Chloe, come in! Need you to help me with my monobrow! Chloe flitted about helping the other girls. She had much specialist information because had done year of eco-swash training in Seattle, a city with sizable cross-dressing population. She knew about male foundation, a thick, wet cement-style unguent which filled in gaps and entirely covered evidence of beard on face, and set into a natural-looking attractive finish. She advised on waxing of chests, shaving of backs of hands, helping affix false nails, etc. But despite giving freely of her knowledge, she looked like princess, and the best others could manage beside her were ugly sisters from Panto. Plan for the evening, we would watch film, The Devil Wears Prada, delivery of new stock at Kelly and Brandon's, then have deportment lessons, where we would practice walking like ladies, had got book on subject. 1957. Ready for film? My hand poised over remote. Just need to do a little tinkle. Better refresh my lipstick. Must look in handbag for my glasses. Girlish clamour eventually died down. I hit play. Song started. Then four slow, heavy raps on front door. Jake? And if not Jake, then who? Not another bloody tranny. Girls, anyone got any friends they've invited and not told me about? Fearful shaking of heads. You sure? Because if I open that door and find Tranny outside looking for sanctuary, we'll be very cross. No, promise. Then hide, I urged. All of you. They scampered away upstairs and I opened front door. Large, intimidating-looking policemen in navy serge uniform and brass buttons standing there. Game was up. Mixed emotions. Undeniable relief that Friday nights had come to end. The responsibility had been heavy one. But also sadness on behalf of trannies. Feared they'd get into trouble. That their names would be published in the Clare Champion and they would be laughing stock throughout county. Am guard lions. Can I come in? Deep voice boomed from beneath peak of cap. Why? Believe you hold cross-dressing events here on Friday nights. Was almost blinded by shininess of his enormous polished black boots. It is not illegal. My voice wobbling. Doing nothing wrong. Tom Toomey knows and doesn't mind. Had continued to check with Tom every time a new girl joined. His unvarying response was that so long as no one broke the toaster again, he didn't care what we did. No one said it was illegal. Can I come in? No. Sudden defiance. Tranny's inside. Nervous dispositions. Need to protect their identities. Look. Sudden drop in decibel of voice. Would like to join in. Oh, for the love of God. Cannot believe this. Simply cannot believe this. Who knew there were so many trannies in County Clare? In Ireland, for that matter. You are tranny, guard lines. Not gay, but yes, like to dress up in ladies' clothing. Heart heavy in chest. You'd better come in, then. 2003. Ran up the stairs. Trannies clustered in my bedroom, their little fizzogs bruised with anxiety. There is policeman here. No, Noel began moaning. No, 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 no. It's over. I'm sunk. I'm ruined. I'm... Stop it. He is one of us. You. He is cross-dresser. Lipsticked mouths fell open. Pancaked jaws swung with surprise. They clattered downstairs in their high heels and suspiciously circled guard lines, like a pack of mascarad hyenas. I affected introductions. How you know about us? Noel asked with some defiance. 
Happenstance, Natasha. Happenstance? Guard lines had slow, ponderous way of speaking, as if giving evidence in petty larceny case. Please explain. Noel sounded positively bitchy. Guard lines cleared his throat and got to his feet. On the morning of Tuesday, December the 2nd, a housewife to be known from here on as Mrs. X, domiciled in the townland of Kilfenora, North Clare, mistakenly took delivery of a parcel from on post. Please sit down, I murmured, is not court of law. Rest of you also sit down. Enjoy your little drinkies. Yes, thank you, guard lines. Continue. Mrs. X, a busy woman, the mother of three children under the age of four, neglected to notice that said parcel was not addressed to herself, but to one Lola Daly of Knockavoy, nosy bitch, Noel said, and had it opened before she knew what she was doing, direct quote, nosy bitch. On divesting the box of its packaging, the housewife discovered strange undergarments within, to the sum of four. Pervy was the word she used to describe them. In considerable distress, she summoned the parish priest, who blessed the garments with holy water and advised bringing in the local constabulary, who happened to be none other than my good self. Had half noticed that consignment of underwear had failed to reach me, but so many deliveries of clothing arrived on almost daily basis had never fully focused on missing order. On account of my specialist interest in the subject, Guardline said, I recognized the items for what they were, merely reinforced jocks. Nothing at all pervy about them. Did not explain this to the woman. Simply removed the items and the box addressed to Miss Daly for safekeeping and swore Mrs. X to secrecy. How? Noel demanded. How you know she'll keep her mouth shut? Because I have something on her. Everyone has their secrets, Natasha. Mrs. X will keep her mouth shut. Oh, well, good, good. I then proceeded to make inquiries about Miss Lola Daly and discovered that gatherings were held at her Nokovoy address at seven o'clock every Friday night. I put two and two together and concluded that the Friday night gatherings and the reinforced jocks were linked. My conclusion was correct. Nothing short of amazing. Noel had changed his tune considerably. That's three of us who have come to you, Lola, by accident. Me, Chloe, and now... Dolores, Guardlion said. My name is Dolores. Welcome, Dolores. Yes, welcome, welcome. That is all very well, I said. But what about my delivery of reinforced jocks? Impounded. Write them off. Blame it on on post. 2032. Dolores Lyons, very tall. 6'3", or thereabouts. Large framed and actually extremely overweight, but carried it well. Unbuttoned thick serge jacket. Releasing enormous stomach harnessed to supersized rib cage, and I thought, my biggest challenge yet. 2207. Everyone gone except Chloe, who was helping with tidying up. And then there were five, Chloe said, clattering wine glasses into sink. You seem to have vocation, Lola. I don't want feckin' vocation. But that's the trouble with vocations. You don't choose them. They choose you. Chloe amused at my plight. Think of Mother Teresa. When career guidance asked her, what would you like to do when you grow up, Mother Teresa? Maybe she said, I'd like to be air hostess. Unlikely, don't you think, that she would have said, would like to befriend lepers? Unlikely. Yes, Lola? Unlikely. Glad you find this so funny. Maybe Mother Teresa didn't even like lepers. Maybe she had a thing about lepers, but lepers didn't care and flocked to her anyway. Chloe highly entertained. 
I lined up empty wine bottles by door for when I go to Bottle Bank with Rossa Considine. As the tranny seemed to be flocking to you, Lola, go to Bottle Bank with Rossa Considine. Saint Lola, patron saint of cross-dressers. Chloe is Rossa Considine. Why is life so effing peculiar? Saturday, 13th December, 11.22. Phone call from Bridie. I'm rough as a badger's arse, she said hoarsely. Christmas party last night. You were lucky being self-employed. Unemployed? No need to endure Christmas party. Oh, God, Lola. Rough as a badger's arse. Where you hear that expression? Telly. Good, isn't it? Yes, very. Been thinking. About Paddy de Courcy. A man like him could get booty call off anyone. Your point, badger's arse woman? He wasn't ringing you for booty call. For what, then? Was suspicious. Unlikely Bridie was going to say, because he still loves you. Was keeping you sweet on side. Why Paddy needs to keep me sweet? You have stuff on him. A few weeks ago, there was lots in papers about that D. Rossini and her sex life. She nearly had to resign. You could spill the beans to papers about all that peculiar sex Paddy made you do. Would be explosive sensation. Wasn't peculiar sex. Moral high ground was mine because Bridie had recently admitted terrible, shameful secret. Since she got married, relations with Barry had taken downward turn. He did end-of-year appraisal, he works in HR, and told her they had had sex only 15 times in previous calendar year. Once a month, plus extra go on his birthday, their anniversary, and the day Kildare won All-Ireland Football Championship. Strange, as neither of them Kildare fans. Perhaps it is bypass-related. Oh, yes, was peculiar sex, Lola. I admit that at the time I felt like sexual dullard compared to you. But looking back, not a lot of love in that sort of sex you had with Paddy de Courcy. And bet you didn't tell me half of what went on. Startled. Bridie been taking mind-reading lessons. He said he missed me, clutching at straws. Course he missed you. Alicia the horse unlikely to indulge his need for kinky sex. Not kinky, erotic. Kinky, 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 kinky. Bridie, strongest-willed person have ever met. 12.04. Internet cafe. Popped in to see Cecile. Popped in. Do not like that phrase. Reminiscent of small-minded yummy mummies wearing pristine pastel-coloured linen trousers. We'll cease and desist from using it again. Had feared Cecile would take again me when I rejected Jake, especially considering she had brokered our alliance. But her response was complete opposite. Gleeful she was, as she reported on Jake's glum state. She informed me it was high time that Gombin got what was coming to him. The snivelling little gobhawk didn't know when he was on to a good thing, she said. Tis soft the wool grows on him. Fascinating, if baffling, usage of colloquialisms. 1527. Coming home from town. Rossa Considine outside his house, tinkering with his car. Hey, I called to him. Hey, yourself. How come you're not down in potholes like peculiar person? Going tomorrow instead. Right. Listen. Been thinking. About? He got up from his tinkering and walked out to meet me on road. Soon be Christmas. We should have Christmas party. Our Friday night gang. What's brought this on? Thought you were a reluctant participant in cross-dressing, sorry, tranny activities. Am. But was talking to my friend Bridie. She had Christmas party last night. 
kept saying she was rough as a badger's arse, was taken with the phrase, You can get drunk any night of week. Need an excuse. If start getting drunk without needing excuse, I'm afraid we'll be drunk all the time. So, what you thinking of? Tuesday after next? Is day before Christmas Eve? What you doing for Christmas? Going to Birmingham for four days. My dad lives there. Then going to Edinburgh with friends Bridie and Trees for New Year. Won't be back to Knockavoy until 4th of January. So we better have party Tuesday 23rd. Any later is too late. I can organise mince pies, mulled wine, crackers, that sort of thing. What would cause extra work for you? Let me discuss it with the others. The trannies had formed some sort of informal network where they contacted each other by email during the week. I was not party to it. Was glad. Shallow bitch! It was Jake. Had appeared from nowhere and was going past on a bicycle. Was not sure which was most disconcerting. His sudden appearance? Or the fact that he was on bicycle? Being on bike did nothing for his sex appeal. He was definitely not bicycle person. Few people are. Yes, shallow, but not a bitch, I shouted after him. Realised he couldn't hear me, but needed to defend self, so turned to Rossa Considine. I'm not a bitch, I said, was on rebound. Why you say you shallow? Because of my job. Everyone says stylists shallow morons. Once heard a great phrase. Cocaine is God's way of telling you you have too much money. Likewise, when enough styling jobs to keep all stylists with roof overhead, a country has perhaps become too prosperous. So you get in plenty work at moment? Oh, no, but that is my fault. Have lovely client, Sarah Jane Hutchinson. She referred new client to me, but I couldn't go to Dublin, so lost new client. Why couldn't you go to Dublin? Apart from it being totally kip of a place. Because ex-boyfriend lives there. Last time I went, saw him with his horse-faced fiancé. Almost puked in the street. And that was the least bad thing that went wrong. So just operate out of County Clare. I shook head. West Coast styling never going to be as effective. Most rich women live in Dublin. Most of good shops are in Dublin. Yes, can get things couriered to here, but is a lot more expensive than when I physically run around the good Dublin shops, filling up wheelie bags with top-notch stock. I see. Styling is fear-filled job at the best of times. Yes, honestly, Rossa Considine. Can see from your fizzog you are not convinced. Obviously, is not as important as eco-swat job you do but to the people I help, is important. Hey, who you telling? I know value of what you do, Lola. Looked hard at him. Sarcasm, Rossa Considine? He sighed heavily. Not sarcasm. Tell me more of fear side of job. Well... If I turn up at session and discover have misread client's desires, or she has lied about size, always happens, they say size 10 because too ashamed to admit size 14, there is no room to manoeuvre. In Dublin, could run out and get more clothes. But down here, if mistake is made, no opportunity to remedy it. We are stuck with wrong clothes, and the session is disaster. See your point thoughtful, interested look on his face. Unusual response. Well, suppose he is a tranny. Cripes, Rossa, better go home. All sensation gone from my feet. We had been standing in the cold for ages. You like to come in for a cup of tea or something? Oh, no, no. Suddenly shy. Monday, 15th December. 1929. Mrs. Butterley's. Heartwarming news, courtesy of Mrs. Butterley. Osama no longer alone. On Friday nights, 
he will be accompanied to pictures in Ennis by Ferret Kilbert. She has car and will drive him, so he doesn't have to get bus. Also, it will give her something to do while her boyfriend is dressing up in women's clothing. Although Mrs. Butterley didn't say that. That was own private thought. Community spirit in action. Tuesday, 16th December, 11.22 Lying in bed, idly having thoughts. If I was a man, would fancy Chloe. Wednesday, 17th December, 12.23 Passing Internet Café. Cecile sees me and beckons hand in invitation. I wave cheerily at her, but continue to walk briskly. Shameful to admit, but have started to avoid Cecile, because her County Clare dialect has become too hard to comprehend. Suspect could discern better if she spoke in French. From pitifully few intelligible bits and pieces she told me, it seems that Jake and Jazz have become item. He says to her, Do you want to be buried with my people? Very pleased. Hopefully it indicates cessation of Jake's cycling abuse. 1907 Going downtown for my dinner. Rossa Considine arriving home from work. He called out to me, Operation Badger's Arse coming together nicely. Good. Good. Friday, 19th December. Rossa Considine had lied to me. Operation Badger's Arse not coming together nicely at all. Operation Badger's Arse been hijacked by Natasha. Don't want to spend our Christmas party stuck here watching It's a Wonderful Life and eating fruitcake she said, with fox-featured defiance. We want to go out dancing. A little sanity, Natasha, I beg of you, I cried. We'll be lynched in Baccarat. Baccarat, the local disco. No, Natasha shook head. I know venue that is sympathetic to our needs. In Limerick. And the problem is, we need minivan. Someone needs to be designated driver. I'll do it, Chloe said. This week wearing unbelievably stylish halter neck dress. From Topshop. Ordinary woman's dress, simply size 18. No, you won't drive, Natasha snapped. Is our Christmas party, us ladies. And if Lola won't drive, Lola might find difficulty with local welfare payments. Is blackmail? Chloe was scandalised. Natasha! Lola was the one who suggested Christmas party in the first place. But Natasha had filled other trannies' heads with talk of a disco where they could dance freely with their own kind. Please, Lola, Blanche said, would love to go. Yes, would love to go, Sue said. Yes, please, Lola. Guard Dolores Lyons begged, with piteous puppy dog eyes. We'll do it, said grumpily. These bloody trannies. No, Lola, Chloe protested. It's okay, I said to her. It's my vocation. We'll do it. Was joking when said you had vocation? But it seems to be truth. Saint Lola of the trannies. Cross dressers. Natasha snapped. Trannies, 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 trannies! Was in no mood. Shut up or I won't drive the van. Excuse? Could I suggest solution of sorts? Chloe trying to restore calm. Lola, we could go out another night. Locally, so no need for driver. After Christmas? When you back from Birmingham? Pour drink into you and get you rough as badger's arse. Doesn't have to be with the ladies from here. Could be with other knockavoy pals of yours. Like who? The surfer. Jake, is that his name? Twinkle in Chloe's eyes. Yes, we could invite Jake. Laughter bubbling in stomach. He could stand on far side of pub. And shout at us. 
dissolving into laughter while Natasha looked on coldly. 22.13 Everyone gone except Chloe. Habit now for Chloe to stay behind after others had gone to help me clear up. You think Noel's wife really believes he's out with the lads every Friday night? I asked, tipping uneaten savoury snacks into bin. Hard to say. Maybe easier for her to just pretend to believe. You're lucky, I said. Gillian's really cool. Not at all bothered. Very lucky, Chloe acknowledged, following me into kitchen. Gillian remarkably easygoing. She says if she had choice, would prefer me to give up potholing. Too dangerous, she says. Chloe squirted washing up liquid over dirty glasses, then out of blue asked, You ever have cross-dressing boyfriend? Pause. Long pause. Too long because answer was a short one. No, I said. But... But? Had a boyfriend who had other... interests? Chloe stopped running hot water into sink. Interests? You know, sexually. Careful face on Chloe. No readable reaction. That sort of thing is fine, she said, if you enjoy it was interesting. Is good to push your boundaries. No? Yes, if you are both happy. Had unexpected flash of memory. The time Paddy took me to Cannes. Private plane. Limo to meet us at bottom of steps. Massive suite in Hotel Martinique. Our arrival. Bed strewn with stiff carrier bags from expensive shops on the Quasette. Me running about from room to room, squealing. Until came face to face with beautiful, cold-faced Russian woman in Chanel suit, waiting in living room. What's she doing here? For a short-lived moment, thought she might be secretary. Paddy might have to do some work over weekend. Then he said, This is Alexia. She's going to be our friend while we're here in Cannes. Friend? Friend? Oh, no. And Paddy said with wolfish grin, Oh, yes. Felt rush of nausea and chill down arms as I remembered. Lola? You okay? Chloe asked, concern in voice. Yes, fine, fine. Just that boyfriend I mentioned. Yes. He made me have sex with a prostitute. Russian one. Then he had sex with her, and I had to watch. Uh, and you were okay about it? At the time, thought I was. But now? No. Voice choked and whole body trembling. All of a sudden, think it's appalling. Shameful. Humiliating. Can't believe I did it. Not pushing boundaries. Not being sexual adventurer. Simply let myself be humiliated. Voice getting higher and faster, gasping for air. Come and sit down. In living room, she took me on her lap, like mother with small child and held me so tightly that I eventually stopped shaking. I grabbed air with my mouth, forced it down into lungs, until breathing became normal again. Lent against her. Great, great comfort in the way she held my weight. And I thought, how nice and big her hands are. Could have refused him, I gulped. Suppose I should have. But you couldn't. Because if you could, you would have. Yes. Yes. So grateful she understood. Was afraid to. Afraid he would mock me. Afraid he would not love me. 
afraid. Just afraid. There were other times. Other terrible things, too. Didn't know why that particular event was so outlandish that it had to rush up from my gut and out of my mouth. O oh, 44. In bed. Couldn't sleep. Thinking about admission had made to Chloe. About how having a threesome with a prostitute had seemed almost normal. But now, didn't seem normal. Seemed sick and strange. In fact, obvious to me now that right from beginning, sex with Paddy had been sick and strange. Imagine that I had thought being taken to sex shop on first date was erotic. Saw now that it was a test. He was checking me out to see how much I'd take. And he'd decided I'd take anything. Even though went through with the business in Cannes, I must have known it was wrong, because I'd never told anyone else about it. Time was when I had boasted about sexual shenanigans I got up to with Patty. But point came when I had stopped telling Bridie and the others. Had detected change in their attitude. They'd stopped being impressed and jealous, and were becoming something else. Concerned, I think. Saturday, 20th December, 8.33. En route to Christmas party styling job in Tipperary. Rasa Considine getting ropes and that sort of stuff out of car boot. He came over to Dividing Fence and asked, How are you today? Very kindly expression on face. And for a moment, I wondered why. I had forgotten that I told him about Paddy and Alexia. Because, of course, hadn't told him. Had told Chloe felt angry that he knew, as if Chloe had broken confidence and told him, like Rossa was her twin brother. Good. Must go now. He could keep his sympathy and kindly eyes and all the rest of it. If I had wanted kindness off Rossa Considine, would have told Rossa Considine. 1917. Passing the Dungeon. Ho! Lola Daly, a word if you please. Boss on the lookout for me. I stepped inside, accepted quick drink. Is it true, Boss demanded, that ferret Faith Kilbert is keeping Osama company on Friday nights while the rest of ye are running around wearing ladies' clothing? Aghast. Utterly aghast. How do you know about ladies' clothing? It's meant to be secret. No secrets in town like this, Lola Daly. Not for long. Never really believed your revenge clothing movie club story. So last night, spied on ye. The three of us hid outside and looked through windows. Surprised you didn't hear us laughing, the scarts and screeches that were coming out of us. Almost slipped another disc, the master said. Laughed so much. Cripes above. I'm hurted you didn't trust me, Lola, Boss said. Thought we were friends. Are friends, Boss. Yes, we are friends. Shamed. Has been kind to me. Bullying me to get dole. Buying vitamin B capsules, etc. But not my secret to give away. Know exactly who every one of your ladies are. Ran check on license plates tipped his head at Moss. Moss is connected that way. Found out names and addresses. Oh, God. If Noel knew that his Friday night activities were public knowledge, he would have conniption, whatever that is. And one of my ladies was officer of the law. Laid my hand on Boss's arm. Not something would usually do, except in time of crisis. You mustn't tell anyone, I beseeched. I beg of you, these poor men, it's the only outlet they have. Who would I tell? Everyone, of course. Sure, what harm are ye doing? Not like ye're making snuff movies up there. I haven't ye given the rest of us a great owl laugh. Cease and desist, no laughing at the trannies. Actually, the master said in pompous, pompous voice, 
indicating incoming lecture. Incorrect to call them trannies, as none of them gay. Spots Conlon is. He is not. He is. Drunken encounter on shore leave in Singapore doesn't count. Long dissertation from the master on sexuality and cross-dressing ensued. Sunday, 21st December, 2047. The Oak. Although Sunday night, place thronged. Festive season doubtless to blame. Had to wait ages for my non-lumpy soup of the day. Poor Osama run off his Egyptian feet. Considine in the thick of large cluster of macho men, wearing sizable muddy boots, sitting with muscular legs wide apart and dwarfing pint glasses in their manly hands. His potholing buddies, I deduced. If only they knew what Considine got up to on Friday nights. But perhaps they did. After all, Gillian knew. Rival cluster of surfy people, including Jake. Braced self for abuse, but he ignored me. Too busy doing elaborate tongue kissing with Jazz. Jazz was the tattoo girl from party in Surf Boy's house all those weeks ago. The one who'd said to me, remember my name, and I had promptly forgotten it. Jake gave me sneery sneer then increased snogging intensity and slid his hand under Jazz's waistband, openly groping her left buttock. I gave kindly smile. Hoped they'd be happy. Was horrified to discover this wish was sincere. How could I be so unaffected by seeing him with another woman? Had he meant nothing to me? Was I numb, strange, damaged oddball who would never have normal relationship again? No remind itself. Had been mad about Jake until he began displaying signs that he had plans to wreck my head. Also, let's not forget, had been on rebound. Monday, 22nd December, 5.05. Unable to sleep. Waiting for dawn. Memories of Paddy bothering me. Had actually been woken by them. Try to think of happier things. Operation Badger's Arse coming together nicely. Minivan booked from Greggens of Ennestymon. For all your car hire, pharmaceutical and undertaking needs. Catchy slogan. Chloe had organised it. But couldn't lift mood. In blackness of pre-dawn. Felt lonely, lonely, lonely. And wished could talk to Chloe. She had understood when had told her about Paddy. No judging, just kindness. Incredibly strange situation. Chloe available to me only one night out of every seven. Like once a week Cinderella. And not as if could ring her in the meantime or anything. Closed eyes, trying to fight past bleakness and go back to sleep. But couldn't shift the terribleness. Mum? I asked. But instead of hearing her, a horrible Paddy memory flashed into head. Mum, I called again. But the awful pictures in head insisted on playing themselves out. Had been sick with severe flu sort of virus. So unwell that I was staying in Paddy's apartment for a few days until was better. In mornings before he left for work, he dosed me with Uniflu and Lucozade. Then same again when he got home at night. One of those nights heard him come in. He turned on lights and woke me from sweaty, delirium-style sleep in which had been dreaming about walking through enormous house looking for bathroom. Half awake, realised wheeze needed to be made, and after a few moments of desperately wishing had colostomy bag, forced self from roasting hot sheets and into bathroom. Was sitting on toilet, my forehead leaning against cool of tiled wall, when saw that Paddy had followed me in. <sighs> no big deal. From very start, he'd insisted on bathroom open-door policy. Never really got used to it, but considering everything else we got up to, insisting on privacy to make my wheeze seemed pointless. How are you feeling? he asked. Sick as dog. 
How your day? Ah, you know. I got up, flushed, ran hands under deliciously cold tap, and when tried to return to bedroom, Paddy blocked my way. What? I asked. You. He pressed my back against rim of sink. He couldn't be. In my condition. But hardness of his erection through his trousers left me in no doubt. Yes, he was looking for sex. I could hardly stand. His hands were on my shoulders and he was kissing side of my neck. Paddy, I said, not now. Don't feel able. He slid palms of his hands under my pyjama top and tweaked each nipple into erectness. Had to bite back urge to scream. In a moment, his lad was out and he was tugging at my pyjama bottoms. My still erect nipples were rubbing against nubby pyjama fabric and the sensation made me want to tear at my skin. No, I said, louder this time. Paddy, I'm sick. Tried to twist away from under his grasp, but he was so much stronger than me. Paddy! Louder this time. I don't want to do this. But my pyjama bottoms were yanked down to my knees, my thighs goose pimpling at the air, and Paddy was shoving his way up into me despite my dry resistance. It hurt. Short, brutal thrusts, each one accompanied by a grunt. Please! Shut up. Ground out between clenched teeth. Instantly I stopped struggling and let him batter his way into me, the rim of the sink digging painfully into my back. The grunts got louder. The thrusts became more like stabs. Then he was shuddering and groaning. He went slack, draping his body over mine, so that my face was buried in his chest could barely breathe, but didn't complain, waited for him to do whatever he needed. After some time had passed, he pulled himself out and smiled tenderly at me. Let's get you back to bed, he said. I stumbled towards the bedroom, and because hadn't known what to think, decided it was best to think nothing. Day or two later, I decided his behaviour was understandable. Because I'd always gone along with the kinky stuff, he must have thought my sex drive was as high as his, and not even a bout of flu would diminish it. Tuesday, 23rd December, 1930. Chloe arrived. Gave me a hug. Since had spilled the beans about Paddy and the Russian prostitute, seemed natural to hug. I'm early, she said. Hope you don't mind. Just wanted to check you still okay to drive tonight. Confident about route, etc.? Can go away and come back at 8.30 when others arrive, if you like. No. Come in. Come in. How you feel, she asked, after the stuff you told me on Friday. Hope you weren't embarrassed. Or sorry you told me. No, Chloe actually remembered other stuff. Then was telling her about the time had the flu. Then other memories came spilling out. Chloe kind. Didn't say, why you not just leave him? Didn't ask anything frightening or unanswerable. Just listened and held me tight and let me cry. 2030 Lying on bed, eyes covered with two cotton pads soaked in cucumber toner, to bring down crying swelling. Excited shrieks and screeches from downstairs as ladies changed into their glad rags. 2115. Operation Badger's Arse officially launched. Natasha, Blanche, Chloe, Sue, and guard Dolores Lyons, all seated in minivan. Chloe in front beside me. Everyone in their dazzling finery. Apart from Dolores, who was dressed as female guard, right down to the truncheon. Was feeling considerably cheerier. Cannot beat a good cry. 22.30. Club HQ. 
Limerick. Parked the minivan. Piled out into car park. Mood high strung. Combination of anticipation and anxiety. This would be first public outing as a lady for all of them. Except for Chloe, who had done it many times in Seattle. What if Natasha had her information wrong, and this club HQ was simply normal, tranny-free disco? We would not walk out alive. But from calibre of other women in car park making their way towards club entrance, adjusting wigs and private parts saying, Oh, shite! in male-sounding voices as they went over on their ankles because of height of their heels, I deduced we were in right place. Come on! Chloe and I strutted forward, the others falling in behind us, and were graciously granted admission. Small, dimly lit place. Glitter ball. Bubbles of moving colour on walls. Loud music. Thronged with glamorous-looking women and happy-looking men. Hello, sexy, one of the happy-looking men said to Natasha. I love redheads. I bet you've some temper on you. Like to dance? Why not? Natasha said. And off she went. We were barely in the door. There is actual name for men who fancy trannies. Admirers. And Club HQ was riddled with them. Dolores was next to be selected to dance. Her bloke said, I love a woman in uniform. Care to take a twirl? Then, no time later, Blanche was swept away. Sue, Chloe and I found a ledge to bounce our sticky pink drinks on. Stared out at dance floor. Some cross-dressers looked like real women. Because they are, Chloe shouted above the music. Wags. Wives and girlfriends of cross-dressers who come to be supportive. Fascinated, I was had thought every woman would be revolted by her man dressing up in ladies' clothing. Because I found it repulsive, I suppose. Not repulsive per se, but repulsive in man I was having relationship with. How could I ever find him sexy again if caught him wearing pink frilly knickers? Incoming bloke, I yelled into Chloe's ear. We'll ask you to dance. But he didn't. He selected Sue instead and I was astonished. Chloe was the only one of my girls who hadn't yet been asked to dance, and she was easily the best-looking and best-dressed, in claret wrap-around dress with lustrous sheen, both sexy and stylish, zigzagged patterned tights, and ankle boots with stunning heels. You're giving off the wrong signals, I yelled at her, sticking too close to me. You go off and dance. No. I'm grand. Jesus. Chloe was staring in drop-jawed amazement at dance floor. Is that Sue? Stretched to see better. Jaw dropped just like Chloe's. Couldn't believe what was seeing. Astonishing the talents we all carry inside us. In one life, Sue, a taciturn, flat-cap-wearing, small-time potato farmer. But in this one, she was spectacularly gifted dancer moving her body like shimmering mercury. Lithe, lissom, head going one way, shoulders going another. Legs that normally looked scrawny as chickens were taut and defined in shiny tights. Creating quite a stir out there. She really is grooving, Chloe said with admiration. Who knew? Despite Chloe's beauty, no one approached her. And eventually she said, Let's have a dance, Lola. Better than standing here like a pair of Egypts. Okay. Fabulous dancer, Chloe. Great fun. Best time had had in ages. Two admirers cut in on us, then cut out again very quickly when they discovered I really was a woman. What about her? One of them jerked his thumb at Chloe. No, she's a man. He stared doubtfully at Chloe. Ah, look it, we'll leave you to it. 2.07. Everyone back in minivan, returning home. Mood, high-pitched and excited. Babble of voices as stories exchanged about admirers. The pleasure of being out in public as a woman. The many compliments received. Everyone happy. Despite it being 2am, 
many cars on road. Christmas parties and such like. Progress slow. Progress slower. Progress stopped altogether. Queue of cars like evening rush hour. Glow of lights from up ahead. What's going on? Garda checkpoint, Guard Dolores Lyon said. He indicated walkie-talkie. Silly of me, but hadn't thought it was real. Operation Sober Christmas. Garda checkpoint. Sudden and terrible fear filled vehicle. Not because I was drunk, I wasn't. But was driving carload of trannies. One of them a guard. Not only that, but dressed as guard, albeit female one. Could he be done for impersonating an officer? Knew what they were thinking. We would be hauled out of car, hands on roof of vehicle, frisked in private places. Families would be informed. Names leaked to press. We were sunk. Turned to Chloe. Our eyes met. We both reached for map on floor. I'm doing U-turn, I said, but she already knew. I'll navigate, she said. I put foot on pedal and did immediate and neat turn in road, then whizzed back towards Limerick, away from the police. But Dolores had more bad news. Other checkpoint up ahead. What do you mean? I mean other effing checkpoint up ahead. Waved walkie-talkie to emphasize point. We're driving straight into it. We were trapped. No, 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 Natasha moaned. Get a hold of yourself, Dolores cried. I've got so much to lose. Need to get off main road, Chloe said, poring over map. You've got so much to lose. I am officer of the shagging law. How you think I feel? As they squabbled in the back over who had the most to lose by exposure, glow from the other checkpoint became visible in night sky. Traffic beginning to slow. Shit, I breathed. Lola, Chloe said, according to this, should be small road to left coming up. It's here. Here! No signs to indicate small road came upon it too suddenly. Twisted steering wheel sharply to left, and, as made the turn, tires screeched loud enough to alert Plod, who were standing in middle of road, lit by sodium glow, like aliens emerging from spacecraft. Even as I plunged car into dark side road, aware of them tensing and staring at us, shouts filled the air. Fuck, they've seen us. Just keep driving, Lola, Chloe said in calm voice. Right turn will be coming in 400 yards. Take that. They're following us, Dolores cried. I can hear them on walkie-talkie. You serious? Yes, yes, two officers in a squad car. Shock so bad, actually felt myself lift and float. I was in car chase with police. How had this happened? They'll know local roads better than us, Sue said. We are fucked. Just keep driving, Lola, Chloe kept repeating in a calm, calm voice as I hurtled along narrow, twisty, potholed road in pitch black. Now, ladies, listen to me. Shortly we're going to pull in, and the four of you are going to get out. Quick as you can. Then hide yourselves. Lola and I will keep driving, and they'll keep following us. Hopefully, I could hear her think. We'll come back when we can. Turn right here, Lola. My response is super fast. Terror is a marvellous thing. Chloe, you get out too. Why should she stay with me and take the rap? No way am I leaving you on your own. Oh my God, is that sirens I hear? Yes, horrors. Even worse, could actually see the plod's headlamps. Countryside so dark that, depending on twist of road, at times they were lighting my way. Okay, Lola, Chloe said. Get ready to pull in. Rest of you, prepare to jump overboard. Road too narrow to conceal four trannies. Couldn't see how throwing them from car would save them. But had swerved into scooped out entrance to something. Trannies tumbled out like skydivers. Doors slammed shut. Pulled away in hail of gravel. What was that place? Quarry. How you know about it? On map. On map. 
Jesus, most women can't make head nor tail of maps. Squad car still following. But knew it was, because siren still wailing. Village coming up. We'll pull in? Okay. Remember, we have done nothing wrong. Okay? Here we are. Stop here. Parked car beside dock and pub. Nervous. Peelers pulled up behind. Two got out, looking very, very cross. Angriest looking one ordered me, Get out of car! Chloe and I both got out. I asked, as innocent sounding as possible, Is there a problem, officer? Why you drive away from road check? Uh, what road check? Gave me knowing stare. Thought he had me on drunk driving. Why you not stop when you hear siren? Did. Stopped at first safe spot. Another hard stare. Blow into straw, milder looking one told me. Then they exchanged spiteful smile, promising each other they would push for custodial sentence for me. To their great and bitter surprise, I passed breathalyzer, and they couldn't get me on anything else. License clean. Car not registered as stolen. No dead bodies in boot. No drugs in car. Just two girls on their way home from night out dancing. Fifteen minutes later. Policeman very reluctant to leave. Knew something was being hidden from them, but they couldn't nail it. Slowly they got back into squad car, all the while giving me filthy looks. You'd better make sure you never cross my path again, Miss Daly, angriest one said in farewell. And a happy Christmas to you too, officer. Beside me heard Chloe snigger. Have to admit, actually said it because showing off in front of Chloe. If on my own would have been far more respectful. Engine started, lights on, exhaust pumping smoke. Squad car left us. Watched until it vanished from view, then I asked, They gone? Chloe stared down dark road. Red rear lights had disappeared. Even sound of car had stopped. Pure silence. They're gone. We'd got away with it. We'd got away with it! Suddenly fizzing with adrenaline, with joy, with relief with pleasure at having pulled a fast one. Chloe, you were brilliant. Turn right, pull in. No, you were brilliant. Left turn coming up. And you just kept your cool and did it. Thelma and Louise, that's who we're like. Wanted to high-five her, hug her, pick her up in my arms and twirl her around. In the end, settled for snogging her. Grace. Casey Kaplan tore a sugar sachet open with his teeth. Gobshite, I murmured, amazed, almost pleased, that Kaplan had found yet another way to irritate me. Yeah, gobshite, TC agreed. What's wrong with using your fingers? I know this might sound mad, I said in an undertone but I almost enjoy hating him. Me too. Kaplan's desk was set a little way off from the cluster of features, far away enough for us to be able to bitch about him, but close enough that we had to do it quietly. Discreetly, we surveyed him tipping the sugar into his coffee, then we were agog, stirring it with a blue biro. Gobshite, TC breathed. Yeah, gobshite. I whispered. What's wrong with using a spoon? He could just shout into Coleman Brine to bring him one, and Coleman would jump to it. Probably offer to stir his coffee for him. With his Mickey. Yeah, with his Mickey. Suddenly Jacinta's witchy face appeared between TC and me. I hate him too, she hissed angrily, but do some fucking work. Office-wide, the mood was volatile. Half the paper had given up smoking on the 1st of January. 
Eight days in, it was ready to blow sky high. Because I'd gone through my initial withdrawal in October, I wasn't too bad. It didn't mean that I didn't ache for cigarettes because I did, but I wasn't locked into a state of near-blind rage like everyone else. Mind you, nor did I feel the comfort of marching shoulder to shoulder with fellow sufferers because I knew what was going to happen. Tomorrow was Friday, and after work everyone would go to Dinnigan's, and three quarters of those who had given up would resume smoking between their third and fourth drink. The other quarter would fall off the wagon over the weekend, and come Monday morning I would be restored to my position of lone non-smoker. Or rather, non-smoking smoker. There were one or two people dotted among the staff who had never smoked, but I felt no kinship with them. Grace, Jacinta urged, work! Reluctantly, I returned to my story, and when my mobile rang, a thrill, small but nevertheless a thrill, lit me up like a power surge. Any kind of diversion would do. I checked the number. Was it safe to answer? Dickie McGuinness. McGuinness here! The static was so bad I could barely hear him. He sounded like he was ringing from Mars, which meant he was probably fifty yards down the road in Dinnigan's. Dickie, we miss you. Dickie had been out on a story since the start of the week. It must be great working crime. So long as you came up with an expose of ne'er do wells a couple of times a year, you could spend the rest of your time enjoying a life of leisure. Grace. I've something for you, Static fizzed on the line. I dread to think. Dicky could be very vulgar, especially when he had drink in him. Do you want? He dipped out of coverage. Don't you? What is it? Do you want it or don't you? Yes, I said. What is it? The name of the person who paid the two characters to burn out your car. My heart seized up in my chest, and I pressed my phone so hard against my ear that the cartilage clicked. Alerted by intuitive nosiness, T.C. abandoned his typing to look at me. Are you listening? Dickie demanded. Yes. Do you want it or don't you? Of course I fecking do. Half the office jerked their heads around to stare in my direction. Am I... Uh... I... to... self here. No, Dickie, I'm here. It's the line. Tell me. John Crown. Say it again. John Crown. C-R-O-W-N. Like Crown of Thorns. John. J-O-H-N. Like John the Baptist. I've never heard of him. Wa ni Salome. No, John Crown. I've never heard of John Crown. Up there for eh, b dancing. A great ball of static roared on the line. Then I was suddenly disconnected. With clumsy hands, I rang him right back and got a two-note high-pitched tone I'd never heard before. Maybe he really was on Mars. I tried again and got the same noise, then again. I stared at my phone wondering what was going on. Was I calling the wrong code? Was my phone broken? Or was it simply the dicky effect? He worked hard to create an air of mystery around himself, and to be fair to him, he sometimes pulled it off. What's going on? TC asked. Nothing. I clicked off a quick text to Dicky asking him to call me. I will ask again, T.C. bit out the words. What's going on? Nothing. I needed him to be quiet. My thoughts were racing. John Crown. John Crown? Who was he? Did I know him? What had I done to him? Had I written something bad about him? I searched in my head flicking back through all the stories I'd ever covered. But I couldn't get any matches. My thighs were shaking and I planted my feet firmly on the carpet tiles in an effort to stop them. Knowing the name of an individual who hated me enough to set my car on fire was distressing in a way I couldn't ever remember feeling before. 
In the five weeks since Dicky had told me that it hadn't been an accident, I'd been in such deep shock I wasn't sure I believed it was true. The only time I felt the fullness of my terror was in the early mornings. Six mornings out of seven, the fear was waking me at 5.30. However, learning this man's name had brought the horror of it right up against me. It was unavoidable. I was petrified. It's obviously not nothing, T.C. persisted. Do I look stupid? Yes, really stupid, especially when you're doing a Sudoku. You press your tongue against your upper lip and we can see the funny black bits under your tongue and you don't even know you're doing it. I looked up from examining my phone and made humble eye contact with him. Sorry, T.C. Who's John Crown? Tara asked. Yeah, who's John Crown? As well as the narkiness, another feature of a nicotine-starved workplace was a great hunger for entertainment. I don't know. You do? Yes, you do. Tell us, you do. Lorraine didn't ask me anything. She'd buckled and resumed smoking on the 3rd of January. Joanne didn't question me either. She'd never smoked in the first place. As people frequently observed, she'd never really fit in. Your ear is bright red, T.C. observed. It looks abnormal. Actually, it was very painful. Could I have broken it? Can you break your ear? Work! Jacinta hissed like a goose. All of you! Work! Can we get cake? Tara asked. Oh, yes, please, Jacinta, cake! No, no, we can't bloody well get cake! I couldn't work. The pressure in my head was building. John Crown? Who was he? Why would he pay people to steal my car? Why would some complete stranger do that to me? Perhaps it was a case of mistaken identity. But how could I find out? Without explaining myself, I slipped out of my seat and made my way to the fire exit. I needed some peace to think, and perhaps the cold air might calm down my red ear. The fire escape, strewn with a thick carpet of cigarette butts, was deserted. I sat on a metal step. The air was bone-cold and misty, and the quiet roar of the city was all around me. But at least people weren't yelping into my banjaxed ear about cake. I took a deep breath and acknowledged something. Damien might know who John Crown was. I could ask him. But something, and I didn't know what it was, was stopping me. The same something that had stopped me from telling him what Dickie had originally told me, that my car had been burnt out deliberately. Usually I told Damien everything. Well, nearly everything. I mean, he didn't know that every month just before my period, I had to pluck three wiry whisker-style hairs from around my mouth. Not that it was exactly a state secret. If he asked me straight out about it, I wouldn't lie. But I wasn't going to unilaterally volunteer the information. Anyway, I didn't know why I hadn't told him that someone had had it in for me. Maybe I was afraid that if he knew, it would make it real. And it was real. I started shaking again, but at least this time I could blame it on the cold. God, what a life. All this on top of me going out of my mind about Marnie. Shortly after I'd last seen her, the worst case scenario came to pass. She'd lost her job, Nick had left her, taking the two girls with him, and he'd put their lovely big house on the market. The only reason it hadn't sold yet was because we were in the depths of winter. But it wouldn't be January forever. Christmas had been utterly miserable. Bid's fourth bout of chemo had finished on Christmas Eve, but there was no way of telling if it was working. Apparently it didn't bring about gradual healing. In fact, it might have no effect whatsoever until the very last dose on the very last day. Until she had a scan after her final bout in February, no one would have a clue if she was going to live or die. Poor Ma and Dad were showing the strain, and it was sad to see because Christmas usually energised Dad. He had a conspiracy theory which got a great airing every year, kicking off in early December. He would rant and rage at anyone who would listen that the Christian churches were in cahoots with big business compelling people to spend shed loads of money on novelty socks and cranberry sauce and bottles of Advoca. 
In other homes, you know it's Christmas when the decorations come down from the attic. In ours, Dad's first conspiracy theory rant declared the season open. But this year, apart from a half-hearted tirade on the uselessness of potpourri, he barely bothered. Marnie came to Ireland, without the kids, of course, and passed through the celebrations like a whey-faced sleepwalker. Up to that point, I'd been able to prevent Ma and Da from knowing about the drinking. But if Marnie decided to go on about, there would be no way of keeping it from them. The carry-on of her was so bad she could end up on the six o'clock news. Perplexingly, though, she didn't drink. Mind you, she didn't eat or sleep or speak, either. But I was tentatively hopeful. Perhaps she had finally come to the end. Perhaps the shock of Nick leaving her had finally done it. It was Damien who suggested that I ring Nick to apprise him of the progress. But Nick was nothing like as pleased as I was. Ten days without a drink. Not good enough. Needs to be a lot longer than that. But Nick, if she had your support... No, Grace. I can't do it to the girls. But no. I didn't like it, but I sort of understood it. I decided that when Marnie returned to London on the 30th of December, I would go with her to get her over the hump of New Year's Eve. In fairness, I said, New Year's Eve is enough to turn even the Dalai Lama into a pisshead. Damien offered to come with us, and I was tempted. I wanted to be with them. It felt as though I'd barely seen him in weeks, even though I had. After all, I lived with him. But having forced him to give up cigarettes because of one member of my family, I thought it was pushing my luck to ask him to babysit another of them, and on New Year's Eve. Go out, I urged. Have fun. I'll be back in two days. I've had enough so-called fun to last me the rest of my life, he said gloomily. Certainly enough seasonal cheer. His siblings were great ones for Christmas, and threw a variety of bashes. Mid-December, Christine and Richard had a glamorous white Russian ball, where the invitation ordered you to wear white. Or what? Damien had asked the little rectangle of stiff cardboard. Or we'll be sent to Siberia. Two days before Christmas itself, there was a three-line whip from Deirdre. A family dinner, she'd said, as we'll all be with our own families on the day itself. She'd created a Christmas grotto in her dining room, the floor strewn with pine needles, sconces flickering, and she served a full-on traditional dinner to twelve adults and ten children without her smile ever once faltering. On Christmas Eve, the cousins, who were aged around nine to eleven, put on a Christmas review, with puppets they'd made themselves. In a way, this wasn't the worst of the gatherings, because conversation had to be minimal in order to hear the puppets' dialogue. But in another way, it was strangely depressing. These weird children. Shouldn't they be out nicking lip glosses from boots? There were also any number of impromptu get-togethers, from potluck suppers to, we'll be in the dropping well from 9.30, do come. Damien and I had to show our faces at a couple of the events, because if we didn't, we'd learnt this from previous years, his mum rang us and said everyone was worried about us. Christmas is the pits, Damien mused. I know we say it every year, but let's go away next year, Grace, to Syria or someplace Muslim where they don't have it. Grant! I'd have gone this year if it hadn't been for Bid. And Marnie. But bad as Christmas is, he said, New Year's Eve is worse. I hate it. Who doesn't? But whatever you get up to, it's got to be better than sitting in Marnie's mausoleum drinking apple ties. Juno's having a party, he said. My heart was suddenly heavy. It felt like Juno had us bombarded with invitations. Since the night Damien and I had had dinner with her, she'd tried to lure us along to hundreds of different affairs. In fact, once I focused on the exact number, it turned out to be only three, which I found amazing. It felt like so many more. Damien had persuaded me to go to one of them, on the Friday before Christmas, an afternoon mulled wine thing. I'd only gone because I was carrying around a suspicion that Juno and her husband must have split up. Why else would Juno have got in touch with Damien so unexpectedly? But as we arrived, 
standing on the front steps, smoking a cigarette, was a stout, red-faced man, who squashed my hand with drunken bonhomie and introduced himself as Warner Buchanan, Juno's husband, the bloody husband for my sins. Then he recognized Damien, and I swear to God, I wasn't being paranoid. His expression became wary. You're the first one. First husband. Damien politely admitted that he was indeed, and Warner's face fell. It really did. I wasn't just imagining it. It sank down into jowly discontent, and beside Damien's handsome good looks, Warner looked disheveled, and actually a little pitiful. And it occurred to me that if I was comparing Damien and Warner, and finding Warner a bit lacking, what was to say that Juno wouldn't also? Warner slapped an arm around Damien's shoulders and led him into the house. You and I should swap war stories, he roared. But I wasn't convinced by his display of camaraderie. Too little, too late is what I would have said had anyone asked me. But they didn't. No one was interested in me. Juno, as if alerted by a sixth sense to our arrival, swooped out into the hall and yelled at Warner. Get your fat hands off my lovely Damien! She kissed Damien again on the lips, then me, but not on the lips. Grace, she said, aren't you at work? Yes, I said, but I've mastered the cunning art of bilocation. No one laughed, because no one was listening. There are loads of people here that you know from school, Juno said to Damien. Let's get you a drink. It was the kind of party where they absolutely pour drink into you where people end up falling into walls and passing out spread-eagled on the bathroom floor and having to be put to bed in the spare room. Much as I wanted to join in the seasonal good cheer and imbibe enough to end up comatose, I was driving. I found a seat and nursed a hot Ribena. As Juno squared a flush-faced, flutered Damien around the room. My first husband, I kept hearing her say. Isn't he gorgeous? Look at the cut of Warner next to him. Isn't he an absolute bloody fright? She must be really drunk to talk about her husband that way, I decided. But she didn't look drunk. In a slinky, beaded, champagne-coloured dress, no foul rugby jersey with the collar turned up today, and her blonde hair twinkling in the light from the chandelier, she was radiant and pretty. Actually, I'll tell you what she was. She was dazzling. As I drove him home, Damien declared himself delighted that he'd attended and expressed his drunken appreciation that I'd accompanied him. The next morning, however, was a different story. We were meant to be braving the scrum, shopping for Christmas presents for his enormous bloody family, but he felt so queasy that he refused to get out of bed. So Juno's having a New Year's Eve party, I said. Now, why doesn't that surprise me? Does she do anything other than throw parties? I won't go if you don't want, Damien said. I hate New Year's Eve, and I hate parties. I had to laugh, in order to pretend I wasn't a possessive bunny boiler, but I couldn't sustain it. I burst out, what's Juno up to? Why has she suddenly emerged from nowhere with her feckin' DVD? Why is she so mad keen to be friends with you? What's her game? There's no game. It was a short, simple sentence, three to four words. So how had Damien infused it with such defiance? Or perhaps he hadn't. Well, why do you want to see her? I just couldn't see the appeal. Well, I'm not that bothered, Damien said. Aren't you? No, really. In that case, go with my blessing. So Marnie and I flew to London, and the first thing I did was a trawl of the house, where I found bottles of vodka in all kinds of hidey holes. Pour them away, Marnie said. Get rid of them. Like I was going to suggest, we drank them. On New Year's Eve, we spent the afternoon with Daisy and Verity. We tried our best, but Christ, Daisy's glow had disappeared. From day one, she'd been a charming, beautiful child and now she was flat and plain and sullen. 
As for poor Verity, she was a ball of twitches and ticks. They kept asking, kept asking, why they didn't live with Marnie any longer, and when they'd be coming home. Soon, Marnie kept promising. Soon. When Nick came for them, they both cried violently, and I thought my head would explode. But their tears were like nothing compared to Marnie's. She convulsed so long and hard that I actually wondered if I should try to get medical help. All I ever wanted was to be a mother. The words were wrenched from her. How did I let this happen? My children have been taken away from me, and it's all my fault. You just have to stop drinking, I said. Then you'll get them back. I know, I know, Grace. Oh, God, I know. And I just can't understand why I keep... I'll tell you the most awful thing, Grace. All I want right now is a drink. Well, you're not getting one, I said grimly. Have a sausage roll and get through it. As the clock hit midnight on New Year's Eve, Marnie had finally stopped crying and was two weeks sober. New Year, new start, I said, as we clinked our glasses of apple ties. Everything's going to be okay. I know. The following day, as I climbed into the taxi taking me to the airport, she said quietly, It really is going to be okay. She gave me a smile of such sweetness that it shifted me back into a mindset where I wasn't climbing the walls with worry the whole time. I'd forgotten what it felt like to be normal. It was lovely. All I had to worry about now was my aunt dying of lung cancer, and someone with a big enough grudge against me to burn out my car, and my boyfriend's ex-wife sniffing around. Glorious! But an hour later, after I'd checked in, I decided to give Marnie a quick call, and she didn't pick up. And I knew, standing in Terminal 1, with crowds of post-festive people pushing and shoving all around me, that she had started drinking again. I turned around, yes, dramatic as it sounds, and went right back to her. I was so angry I could hardly see. What the fuck are you at? You've thrown it all away. I'm sorry, Grace. Tears poured down her face in a torrent. Being away from the girls, the pain is awful. Whose fault is that? You're just a selfish bitch, and you could stop if you tried hard enough. My jaw clenched with purpose. I hit the phones and rang 16 treatment centres. <laughs> Who would have thought it was such a growth industry? And to my amazement, many of them were booked out. Busy time of year, one bloke laughed ruefully. Peak season. Like we were talking about a holiday in the Maldives. Maybe it should have been a comfort to know that I wasn't alone but actually it was a shock to discover that there were so many other selfish bitches in the world. Even if there had been availability in any of the rehab places, not one of them would take Marnie unless she admitted she was an alcoholic. And she wouldn't. For someone so seemingly fragile, she could be as adamant as bejesus. Grace, I'm going through a bad patch. I can't stop right now. I need it to get me through this, but this will pass. How will it pass? Nick and the girls will come back. Everything will be okay, and then I won't need to drink so much. But Nick and the girls won't come back. I was almost in tears with frustration. They left because of your drinking. Why would they come back when you're still drinking? I'll get stronger, and when I'm stronger, I'll stop. The pain won't be so bad, and I'll drink less. But I'd learned a thing or two from my conversations with the treatment centres. Things will only get worse. You're an alcoholic. That's what happens. She shook her head. I'm just unhappy. My yawning terror was that she had nothing left to lose. Everything was gone. Why would she stop? I got a flight home later that evening. I had to. I was rostered to work the following day. But I'll be back at the weekend, I warned Marnie. It's Thursday already. 
so it was. I'd sort of lost track of the days because of the Christmas break. Okay, I said with grim cheeriness. In that case, I'll be back tomorrow night. And, I continued, surprising myself because I hadn't planned this, I'll be here every weekend for the foreseeable future. Why? she asked. To keep you off the fucking sauce. Why else? But the following night, last Friday, when I'd arrived to find her passed out in the kitchen, stinking of urine and as slight as a child in my arms as I moved her upstairs to bed, for the first time, Christ, the fear, I understood the real reason I'd decided to visit every weekend. I didn't want to leave her alone for too long because I was afraid that she might die. Anything could happen. She might tumble down the stairs and break her neck. Her body might just give up from so much alcohol and so little nourishment. And she'd always been a candidate for suicide. I tried talking sense to her, but all weekend she held tight to her mantra. She would stop when things were better. It sent me wild with frustration. But as I left her on Monday morning, I saw something different in her. Fear. What did she have to be afraid of, I wondered. She was grand. She was the one drinking her head off, having a great time. But once my bout of sarcastic inner dialogue passed, I started having creeping thoughts that perhaps Marnie wasn't simply insanely selfish. That perhaps she couldn't stop drinking. And that no matter how much she insisted otherwise, she knew it too. When my bum started to go numb from cold on the fire escape step, I decided I'd better go back into the office. Funnily enough, the freezing air hadn't cured my ear. It actually felt worse, like it was on fire. When I approached my desk, Tara looked up hopefully. Did you get cake? Uh, no. We thought you'd gone to get cake. Sorry, no. She didn't get cake? Claire asked. You didn't get cake? TC stared at me accusingly. So where the hell were you? But I never said. For the love and honor of Jesus. Jacinta slammed a pen down on her desk. If it means that any of you will do any work this afternoon, I will buy you a fucking cake. She grabbed her handbag, black, of course, it being January, and stormed towards the swing doors. Don't get an orange one. Or coffee. She swiveled around to look back at us, planted her legs wide like a superhero, and yelled over the heads of countless staff, I will get whatever flavor I fucking well like. There was one person who would definitely know who John Crown was. He would know because he was a smart arse who knew everything. But I would not ask him. I'd go to my grave, still ignorant, rather than ask him. I didn't mean to look. I actually meant to look at my slice of cake. Walnut and coffee. Jacinta had found the worst in the shop. But my eyes were operating independently of the rest of me, and they went ahead and stared in the direction of Casey Kaplan. He was on the phone, and when my treacherous eyes met his, he smiled and winked. I tore my eyes back from him and focused on my cake. Maybe if I could pick the walnuts out, it mightn't be so bad. Then I grabbed my phone and tried Dickie again. Still on Mars. Kaplan. Can I have a word? He had his feet up on his desk, looking like a sheriff in a cowboy movie. I found this profoundly irritating. He swung his feet onto the floor and sat up straight. Grace Gildee, you can have anything you want from me. Is this a private word? Should we repair to Dinnegan's? Shut up. You know everyone, right? Well... Not everyone. No need to be modest. We all know you're fabulous. I need you to help me. His body became still, and when he spoke again, the bantering tone had disappeared. Just a soupçon of advice, Grace. When you require someone's help, it oils the wheels somewhat if you can manage to be nice. 
I stared stonily at him. Nice, er, he amended. You stole my Madonna story, I said. You owe me. He tilted his head in acknowledgement. If this is what it takes to balance the books. Does the name John Crown mean anything to you? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Who is he? He stared at me. You don't know who he is? I wouldn't be asking you if I did. <laughs> I'd say you know him. I've never heard of him. Why do you want to know? Suddenly distraught, I said, that's my business. Grant, sure, sorry. John Crown is a driver, a rich man's fixer. I kept looking at him. I needed more than that. But you might know him better as Spanish John. Spanish John? Paddy's driver. He works for Paddy de Courcy. I was going to vomit. The urge happened so quickly. A draining away of my blood, a wash of puke in my throat, a tingling in my feet and fingers. And ear, for what it's worth. Paddy had arranged, paid, for my car to be burnt out. It was unbelievable. It was like having wandered into a true life crime. But I knew it was real because the timing was right. Six days earlier. Grace, are you all right? Yes. Look. I lurched towards the ladies and my lunch roared from me. My stomach convulsed and squeezed until all that came up was bitter yellow bile. Once I knew, it was like I'd always known. I should have known. I wasn't stupid, and I knew what Paddy was like. He'd known how much I loved my car. He'd watched me driving it, whizzing around with pride and pleasure. I got to my feet and on trembly legs made my way to the taps. I looked in the mirror and I asked my waxy reflection, What can I do? Nothing. Forget it, I advised myself. It was done. It was over. It was in the past. The most sensible thing I could do was to pretend that it hadn't happened. We needed a new couch. The frame had cracked on our current one. Grace, Damien said, I'd rather saw my own leg off than spend a Saturday in the January sales traipsing around a furniture shop. But we need to buy a couch this weekend. I can't, I said desperately. I have to go to London. I can't stay away from Marnie. There was just the tiniest of pauses. I know, I know, I understand. I'm sorry, Damien. I'll come with you to London, he offered. Why won't you let me come with you? Because it would be awful for you, I said. I'd feel shitty about your weekend being ruined too. Couldn't be any more shitty than having to go to World of Leather. I sighed and shook my head. It would. Why won't you let me help you? He sounded suddenly angry. You're so independent. I thought that's what you liked about me. I tried a smile. I've changed my mind. Damien, it's just... Having to watch Marnie all the time, it's so... sordid. It's so soul-destroying. And I had a suspicion that Marnie mightn't like it if I arrived with Damien. Not that I was making any progress with her, but I had a feeling that Damien's presence might shame her into drinking even more than she already did. Let's see how I get on this weekend with her, I said. Could that be some sort of compromise? Okay. On Friday night, when I let myself into Marnie's house, I was very glad I'd talked Damien out of coming with me. Marnie was lying in the hall, naked. Why? God only knows. And so drunk she was incoherent. I poured water and B vitamins into her, as advised by the helpline, sobered her up, and got her through Friday night without her drinking again. 
Then I slept with one eye open, at least that's what it felt like, and got her to an AA meeting on Saturday morning. On Saturday afternoon, I made her go for a walk, then cooked dinner for her on Saturday night, and again slept with one eye open. Different eye this time, just for the variety. But somehow, on Sunday morning, she got her hands on some alcohol. One minute we were having a perfectly normal conversation about Sienna Miller's thighs, then the next I noticed her words were slowing and slurring. I was astonished. I thought I'd disposed of every bottle in the house. Then a disappointment so bitter swept over me that I wanted to simply lie down and sleep forever. Where did you get it? I asked. Got nothing, she mumbled. Let's have some music. With astounding speed, whatever she had drunk, she must have imbibed an awful lot of it, she passed out. Angry and frustrated and oh so depressed, I rang Damien. How is she? he asked. Comatose. What? I thought things were going well. So did I but I think she has a bottle salted away in the bathroom and I can't find it. I've done everything bar move the bath into the landing and I still can't find it. He sighed. Come home, Grace. You're not helping her. Don't say that, Damien. Silence fizzed on the line. After a while I asked, How was the poker game in Billy's last night? Hugh turned up. Your brother, Hugh? That's the one. He bumped into Billy at a funeral, got himself invited along. Ah, here. Hugh was like a radioactive terrier, all teeth and hunger to win. His competitive spirit would have changed a casual beer and cards night into something with a nasty edge. Did he win? Need you even ask? All fifty-one euro and seventy cents. It's not even like he needs the money. Not like us. You know, Damien, one day it'll all come crashing down. Go on. Damien liked this game. Hugh's kids. Agrippa, Hector and Ulysses, the poor little bastards. They'll join the Moonies. Say that Hugh, or Brian, or preferably both, will get done for having sex with one of their anaesthetised patients on the operating table. Damien laughed quietly. That's my favourite. They'll be struck off, and it'll be a huge scandal. And in the meantime, you'll be made editor of the press, the youngest ever. Yeah, he sighed a little disconsolately. Time for me to stop slagging his family. Personally, I could have gone on for ages longer, but too much bitchiness made Damien uncomfortable. Because, credit where it's due, they never meant to make him feel bad. It was never deliberate. So, what are you doing today? I asked. I'm going out to buy us a new couch. No! I barked with shocked laughter. No, please, Damien, God alone knows what you'll come home with. It would probably be black leather and enormous. Get brochures, get swatches, but Damien Stapleton, I'm warning you, do not buy anything. Don't you trust me? To buy a couch? No. Ring me tonight with a report, and I'm telling you again, you buy something at your peril. On Monday morning, I woke at 5.30am in Marnie's bed. I had the quickest shower ever. It was an unnatural time to be washing myself. And as I got dressed, I tried to give Marnie a rousing, you won't drink, you can do it, speech. But it was too early and too cold and I couldn't summon the energy. All I could do was beg. Just don't drink. Please, Marnie. Please. I'll be back on Friday. Just try not to drink until then. I caught the 7.45 flight to Dublin and got a taxi to work. Straight into a black handbag day. I'd have delighted in any other colour, even red. I was so tired, and black was so wearing. Ideas, Jacinta commanded, 
smoldering with a bitter black energy. Sibling rivalry? No. The renewed popularity of poker? No. Alcoholism in women in their thirties? No. Back to the drawing board. Grand. As soon as she'd left my desk, I rang Damien. He hadn't phoned me last night, and I was afraid it meant that he'd been persuaded by some slimy sofa salesman to buy a half-price shop-soiled monstrosity. Why didn't you ring me last night? I asked. Because you didn't buy a couch, did you? No. You sure? Yes. That's all right, then. It was terrible, Grace. The places were overrun with couples fighting, and it was roasting hot and really crowded. Just like hell. Anyway, I got brochures and yokes. Maybe we'll take a look at them tonight, when you get home from your me time with the boys. I don't have to go. Why wouldn't you go? Because I haven't seen you all weekend. Ah, no, go on. It's important to have a routine when everything is a bit fucked. Anyway, I'm too knackered to be any fun. I'll see you in bed. With the aid of unseemly quantities of coffee and sugar, I dragged myself through the day. Unusually, for a Monday night, people were going to Dinigan's. But I decided I'd rather go home because I hadn't been there since Friday morning. But as soon as I turned my key and let myself into the house, I knew something was wrong. Off. Call it what you want. I could smell it. I wandered from room to room, sniffing, concentrating, trying to nail down the elusive, discordant, alien presence. Something didn't belong. It hadn't been here when I'd left the house on Friday morning. Whatever it was, it had moved in sometime over the weekend. I stared at the sofa brochures on the kitchen table. Was it them? But surely it couldn't be. I climbed the stairs and the sense disappeared. I must have been imagining it. I was just tired, very tired and overwrought. But when I walked into our bedroom, I sensed it again. Or did I? It was hard to trust my own experience. For a long time, I perched on the edge of the bed, sniffing the air and analysing. Smell or no smell? Imaginary or real? And what was it of, anyway? I needed to talk to Damien about it. I'd ask him later. Or maybe tomorrow, when I wasn't so tired. I fought my way upwards, but slabs of exhaustion pushed me back down into sleep. I had to wake up. I had to come too. Why was it such a struggle? What day was it? Maybe it was Saturday. A nice day, and I could eddy back down into the depth. But then I knew it was Tuesday. I had to get up and go to work. But I was so, so tired. Also, my nose hurt. Last night I'd been reading the new Ian Rankin. One of Damien's siblings, I couldn't remember which, had given me the hardback for Christmas. And I'd fallen asleep, and it had landed on my face, and the bloody thing weighed a ton. I opened my eyes and groaned. Oh, God. Damien emerged from the bathroom, a towel around his waist, his face half-shaved. Are you okay? he asked. Very tired. You were comatose when I came in last night. Taking lessons from Marnie. You want anything? <laughs> Plenty. My sister to stop drinking, my aunt to recover from cancer, to have never met Paddy de Courcy. Coffee? He headed to the bedroom door to go down to the kitchen. Hey, Damien, I called weakly. Was anyone here over the weekend? He turned to face me. No. But there was a little flicker, a tiny little something. I was on it immediately, my heart suddenly pounding. What? It's nothing. Obviously it's not nothing. Okay, he sighed. I met Juno. I thought I was going to puke. The tiredness. The shock. But she wasn't here. We just went for a quick Indian on Sunday night. Warner was away. 
Then he added, and I couldn't decide if it was defiance I was hearing, and so were you. Why didn't you tell me? It was nothing. A last minute thing. I'm telling you now because I didn't want to tell you over the phone while you were at work yesterday. But if it was important enough that you didn't want to tell me on the phone, then it's obviously not nothing. You're being ridiculous, he said firmly. Was I? If there really was anything going on, he wouldn't tell me he'd met her. Or would he? Was he simply covering his tracks in case they'd been spotted together? Would he even have told me if I hadn't guessed something had happened? Or was I just going mad? I thought I could trust Damien. But could any human being really trust another? I love you, he said. She's nothing to me. Then why see her? After a pause, he said, I won't see her any more. Okay. I hadn't the energy to be feisty. What? Okay, then, don't. Don't see her. Okay, he nodded his head. Done. Marnie Sky News was her only friend. It gave her vital information without passing judgment. Today, it told her, was Thursday, the 15th of January, 11.40 in the morning. Also, that there had been a coup in Thailand, but she wasn't so interested in that. The last day she had any memory of was Monday. Grace had left for Dublin at ten past six in the morning, and as soon as the taxi taking her away had turned the corner at the bottom of the road, Marnie was overwhelmed with guilt and loneliness, and had retrieved the vodka she'd hidden in the bathroom. Since then, she'd come in and out of reality only briefly. But now she was sober. She was shaky, fearful, nauseous. But she didn't want a drink. It happened that way. It seemed to go through a cycle. She'd start drinking and be unable to stop. And then, almost abruptly, although she could never predict exactly when, it would come to an end. Today. All she wanted was her daughter's. The smell of Daisy's skin. The feel of Verity's trusting hand in hers. Oh, the guilt. God! The guilt, the guilt, the guilt. They were so young, so fragile. How had she ended up in this life? How had they all ended up like this? She, living in this huge empty house, her daughters and husband in an apartment two miles away. It was so strange, so not what she had planned, that it was hard to believe it was real. Perhaps it wasn't real. Maybe she'd never been married. Maybe she'd never had children. Maybe she'd imagined her entire life. Maybe she'd never been born. She managed to frighten herself so much with this line of thinking that she had to get up and walk around the house trying to see reason. She was being silly. Worse than silly. But the thoughts wouldn't stop. I'm not real. I was never born. She needed to talk to someone. But who? They'd just think she was a nutter. I am real. I am real. Struggling for breath, she rang Grace at work. Am I real, Grace? Oh, for the love of Christ, what's up with you? Marnie explained as best she could. Am I going mad, Grace? In a very quiet voice, Grace said, It sounds like you've got the DTs. No, not at all. Delirium? Tremens? I just miss my daughters. As soon as Marnie hung up, the panic returned, choking the breath out of her. She was fixated on Daisy and Verity. If they existed, then she existed. Perhaps she should talk to Nick. Perhaps he could confirm whether or not Daisy and Verity were real. However, 
All-consuming as her fear was, she knew she couldn't ring Nick when she was in such a state. He thought badly enough of her as it was. But the fear squeezed tighter and tighter, and eventually she found herself grabbing the phone and calling his office. And even as she asked to speak to him, she was seized with a terror that a voice might say, Nick Hunter? No one of that name has ever worked here. Someone who sounded like Nick answered, and seemed to know who she was. The clouds of horror dispersed, then regrouped. She had a wild moment when she wondered if the part of Nick was being played by an actor. Nick, I have to see the girls. She needed physical evidence. They're in school, Nick said. School? That must mean they existed. Can I go and see them? No, no! Then, more calmly, he said, No, Marnie, it'll upset them. They haven't seen me in weeks. Whose fault is that? After he had left her, left her, Nick had decreed that Sunday afternoon would be their designated time. But on the first Sunday, the unprecedented strangeness of getting a mere afternoon of their presence. She, their mother, who had given birth to them, had compelled her to have a drink before they arrived. Then another. By the time Nick showed up, alone, doing a recce while the girls remained in the car, Marnie was accepting of the situation. But Nick pronounced, like an autocrat, that she was drunk, that it would upset Daisy and Verity to see her in such a state. For shame on you, he had said. He changed her allocated time with the girls to Saturday morning, then to Friday evening. Dirty tricks, Marnie had told Grace, messing with my head, using the children as pawns. No, surely he's trying to find the best time so that you'll be sober. Dirty tricks. Marnie had a revelation, which instantly dispersed her panic. She'd take the girls to the zoo. She'd go to their school right now and take them out of their classrooms, and the three of them would go to the zoo together. They'd love it. Well, Daisy would. Verity was afraid of animals. And the weather was very cold. Maybe not suitable for the zoo. But that was just defeatist thinking. Yes. They'd go to the zoo, and she'd buy the girls sweets, zoo t-shirts, anything they asked for. Anything to let them know how much she loved them. How sorry she was to have broken up their lives. Then she'd go to Nick and persuade him to come back. Once the decision was made, she was frenzied at the idea of all the different actions she had to execute before she would see them. What could she dispense with? No need to eat? No need to wash? Uh, no, perhaps she'd better. It had been a while. She darted under the water and squirted herself with shower gel. But another flurry of anxiety propelled her back out of the shower, still covered in suds. No time to rinse off. Dragging a towel around herself, she looked for something to wear. And the first thing that came to hand was a floaty dress. She'd never worn it much, and now was as good a time as any. Then she took a bundle of banknotes from a little carved box on the windowsill. Nick had cancelled her cards, but way ahead of him, she'd withdrawn thousands from the cash point and hidden it all around the house. Who knew she could be so clever? Then she was leaving the house and getting into her car, and as she drove through the gate she had a moment when she wondered what life would be like if she was banned from driving if that case ever came to court. But why would they ban someone like her? Well, she was no criminal. Besides, she had two young children. She needed her car. As she stopped at the lights, she saw an off-license. Well, the off-license. There was a time when she had rotated five or six different ones, never visiting the same place more than once a week. Now the one nearest to the house was the one she invariably used. She surprised herself by pulling in. Force of habit, she thought. Blame it on the car. 
and entering the shop. Five bottles of Absolute, she said to Ben. Sheepishly, she added, having a party. Aren't you cold in that frock? Ben asked. It's below freezing out there. Um, no. But she was suddenly aflame with embarrassment. This was a floaty summer dress. She had bare arms and no coat. What had she been thinking of? She grabbed the carrier bags and anxiously returned to the car. The moment she was back in her seat, she was breaking the safety seal on one of the bottles, tilting her head back and pouring the liquid magic into her. She gulped it down, then wrenched the bottle from her mouth, gasped for breath, then tipped her head back again. Within seconds, the humiliation melted away. Her purpose was restored, and fueled by molten stars, she sped to the school. With buoyant confidence, she swung through the double doors. Two women appeared in the corridor. She recognized one of them. Headmistress, good afternoon. I'm here for my girls. Mrs. Hunter, they're in class. I know, but I'm taking them out for a treat. I'm afraid that won't be possible. Ah, uh ha. -huh. She suddenly saw what was going on. He told you I was coming. My husband? But it's okay. I'm their mother. Mrs. Hunter, please let me see them. If you could perhaps speak a little more quietly, please. Come into my office. We'll discuss it. Which rooms are they in? Okay, don't tell me then. I'll find them. They physically manhandled her. They actually restrained her as she attempted to run down the corridor, flinging open classroom doors. She tried to twist away from their hold. Get your hands off me! Alerted by the commotion, heads began to peep out of classrooms. Alarmed teachers, followed by wide-eyed, giggling little girls, spilled into the corridor. Then she saw Daisy. Daisy! It's me! Mum! We're going to the zoo. Get Verity. Daisy seemed frozen to the spot. Go on, quick. One of the giggling girls asked, Daisy, is that your mum? No. The next time she woke, Grace was in the bedroom with her. Was it the weekend already? How many days had she lost? What time is it? She croaked. Grace looked up from her book. Ten past nine. Morning or evening? Of what day? Thursday night, the 15th of January, Grace said. Do you need to know the year? What are you doing here? I came over after work. I'll take tomorrow off and stay for the weekend. Marnie suddenly knew why Grace was here in London. It was that phone call she'd made to her earlier that day. Hard to believe it was still the same day, when she'd asked Grace if she was real. Oh, God, no. She'd behaved like a mad person and scared Grace into getting on a plane. She was so ashamed she could hardly utter the words. Grace, I'm so sorry. I, I was a bit anxious. But I'm okay now. That was actually a lie. She needed a drink right now. The want was making her tremble and sweat. It was pointless checking for her bedside bottle. Grace would have emptied it. But there was one hidden in the loft space above the bathroom. If she balanced on the side of the bath, she was just tall enough to lift the MDF rectangle and retrieve it. A memory zipped through her. A split-second sequence of colour and noise. Shouting and scuffling with the headmistress at the girls' school. Yelling at Daisy that they were going to the zoo. The headmistress taking away her car key. Being driven home by one of the teachers. No, 
It hadn't happened. She clambered out of bed and went to the window. Her car was out there, parked innocuously in the drive. A great wave of giddying relief almost brought her to her knees. She had dreamt it all. One of the teachers brought it back here, Grace said from behind her. It all happened. It's all true. Lurching and sinking with shame, dragged towards the centre of the earth with its weight, Marnie remembered Daisy's face. The hatred stamped on it. She couldn't let Grace see how she felt. She'd seize on the weakness and try to crowbar it open. But the need to drink was upon her with renewed intensity. It couldn't be ignored, sidestepped, resisted. It was too big. Grace... Her voice was trembling. I've got to go to the bathroom. I'll come with you. Don't. I just need to pee. Trust me. Trust you? Grace was scornful. I'm begging you. Hot tears were suddenly pouring down Marnie's face. Just let me go to the bathroom alone. No. I know you've got drink hidden in there. I'll get on my knees, Grace. I'll beg you. Is that what you want from me? She toppled to her knees, and Grace seized her elbow and yanked her painfully upwards back onto her feet. Get up. Get up, Marnie. For God's sake, get up. Now Grace was crying too, which Marnie had to admit was a novelty. Look at you, Grace said. Marnie. This is breaking my heart. Please, Grace, Marnie begged. Please stop coming here. They held on to each other, part scuffle, part embrace. I can't change. Stop trying. Don't do it to yourself. You've got your life. What about Damien? Doesn't he mind that you're always here? Never mind, Grace said wearily. Ups and downs. Everyone has them. It didn't take Grace long before she brought up the subject of rehab. You could set your watch by it. If you just gave it a try, Marnie, something might stick. But Marnie didn't want anything to stick. It was what she was most afraid of. Alcohol was all that was keeping her going. Grace eventually gave up and changed the subject. Have you heard from that Rico bloke since he left work? No, Marnie said quickly. That was an episode so shameful she could never let herself think about it. Ever. If thoughts of Rico appeared in her mind, she immediately drank them away. Or Guy? Guy. At the sound of his name, guilt flooded her. He'd been kind and patient, astonishingly so. He'd had no choice but to sack her. No. Do you mind? Grace asked. Please let's not talk about it. Grace drove Marnie to an AA meeting at lunchtime on Friday. She made Marnie go to meetings every time she visited London, but she no longer sat in on them. Instead, she waited outside in the drafty hall because, Marnie knew, Grace was worried that by flanking Marnie at the meetings, she might be inhibiting Marnie's big admission. The admission that she was an alcoholic. But as far as Marnie was concerned, Grace could have saved herself the hard bench in the cold hall. She might as well be in the warm room drinking tea and eating jammy dodgers with the alcoholics, because there would never be a big admission. Good job, too, Marnie thought, looking around the room. Because if there was ever anything she'd wanted to get off her chest, she'd be hard-pressed to get a word in edgeways. Chatty lot, alcoholics. I drank because I hated myself. Thought I was the most special and different person alive. So complicated no one could understand me. Then someone told me that alcoholism is called the disease of... Terminal uniqueness. Everything was always someone else's fault. 
One day I woke up and just couldn't do it any more. I don't know what was different about that day. Maybe I just had enough of treating myself and everyone around me like shit. I thought I was doing everything I could to stop drinking. But the truth was I tried everything to stay drinking. I loved it more than anyone or anything else. And it was when I realized I actually couldn't stop that my power of choice had gone. Marnie, would you like to say something? All right, then. To be fair, Marnie had to admit that they always invited her to share. But she invariably shook her head and looked at the floor. But today she said, Yes, actually I would. A frisson of anticipation moved through the room. They thought she was going to admit she was an alcoholic. I'd just like to say that my husband left me and took my two little girls and won't let me see them. He's cancelled my cards and he's selling my home. When the meeting was over, the Jules woman appeared, her jaunty ponytail swinging. Hey, Marnie. Like to go for coffee? Yes, yes, she would. Grace shoved her towards Jules like a pushy mother. Off you go. I'll come back for you in half an hour. In the coffee shop across the road, Jules put a smoothie down in front of Marnie and said, So how are you? Not so good. I miss my little girls. She poured out the story. My partner left me too because of my drinking, Jules said. Took the kids with him. Well, it was great, really. I could drink as much as I liked without anyone on my case. I had such a great excuse. All that self-pity. But it's not self-pity. Not in my case. No, I'm just saying it was in mine. Yes, Jules said thoughtfully. I'd drink red wine and cry and phone them when I was drunk and tell them that I loved them and that it was their daddy's fault that they weren't with me. A bit like watching a weepy movie, I suppose, crying for all the wrong reasons, but I enjoyed myself. Terrible thing to do to kids, of course, but I couldn't help myself. Marnie listened in fascination. Jules had been far worse than her. At least she didn't ring the girls and slander Nick. Well, not often. If you were that bad, Jules, how did you stop drinking? By coming to the meetings. So how come they haven't worked for me? Are you an alcoholic? N no, no, the opposite of anything. I'm just very unhappy, and alcohol helps me cope. There you are, then, Jules said cheerfully. Why would they work when you're not an alcoholic? But... Marnie furrowed her forehead. What had just happened there? Jules had foisted some sort of sneaky mind game on her, yes? But she wasn't able to twist her brain around it. Sorry, gotta go, Jules said. I have to pick up my kids. See you tomorrow. Actually, no, Jules. Marnie had just made a decision. I don't think so. I'm going to stop coming to these meetings. Grace would kick up a stink, but... They're not helping me, Marnie said wearily. But why would they? Like you said, I'm not an alcoholic. Actually, it was you who said it, Jules said. Whatever. Anyway, I'm not coming to any more meetings. They're just a waste of time. Jules nodded sympathetically. I'll miss you. I'll miss you too. Marnie said politely, although she wouldn't. Not that Jules wasn't nice. Before you go, Marnie said, can I ask you something? Your kids. Who has custody? You or him? You're not going to like this. Jules's face burst into a grin. My partner and I got back together. After I stopped drinking. No! Marnie put her hands over her ears. I don't want to hear your propaganda. Stop drinking and everything will be perfect. But Jules just laughed.
she found herself lying on the hall floor. The house felt cavernous and cold. A black shadow passed over her like a bird of prey. What was that? A fast-moving cloud beyond the front door? A lorry trundling past? It felt like death. Lola Friday, 16th January, 10.07 Phone rang. In Ketchy. Again. She'd gone to Nigeria for first two weeks of January, only genuinely quiet time of year for stylist, but since her return was all go. Had me effing tormented, if you want the truth. She was in process of hiving off her clients from mine. Hiving off? Where she learned that expression? Certainly not from me. As she had predicted correctly, what with her being fabulous and everything, not being sarcastic, or perhaps only mildly, not every client wanted to be hived off with her and Bibi, but preferred remain with me. Quite respectable list, actually. Heartwarming. Nice to be thought well of. But in Ketchy, going back on original promise wouldn't take some of my ladies at their word. Some of mine, i.e. the biggest spenders, she wanted for her own. Kept ringing me. Horse trading. I snapped phone open. In Ketchy? Tone of voice conveying, what the F is it this time? How about this, she says. I listened. What insulting, lopsided bargain she proposing? We'll give you Adele Hostess, Faye Marmion, and Drusilla Gallop, if can have Nixie Van Meer. Bloody cheek! Adele Hostess wouldn't spend Christmas. Faye Marmion, pathologically impossible to please. And Drusilla Gallop, the worst kind of offender. Wore the dresses, but pretended she hadn't then tried to return them, stinking of fags and Coco Chanel, and with long-last foundation smeared around collar. Nixie, by contrast, was loaded, extravagant, and pleasant. Three clients, in Ketchy urged, for a price of one. Deal or no deal? No deal, I said. Nixie Van Meer, not for sale. We'll see about that, in Ketchy muttered darkly and hung up. Cripes! Put head in hands in attitude of weariness. Was fighting for livelihood here. So, question had been trying level best to duck and dodge. What was I still doing in Nakavoy? My time in exile was up. My sentence had been endured. I was free to go. Needed to go, if wanted to hold on to any clients. Had responsibilities to them. A society woman without a stylist is as much use as one-legged man at arse-kicking competition. My ladies had been more than patient during my autumn sabbatical, or breakdown, if we are to speak freely, and if I didn't appear in Dublin soon, they would think was never coming back, and would make alternative arrangements. In Ketchy, sensing my weakness, was circling like shark. Because, honest truth of matter, Unwilling, yes, deeply unwilling to leave Nokovoy. Institutionalised in Kulchi land? No longer able to cut it in the big city? Not that Dublin exactly big city. Not talking Sao Paulo, 20 million people. Or Greater Moscow area, 15 million. 10.19. Phone rang again girded loins to withstand Nketchy's pressure. However, not Nketchy, but Bridie's Auntie Bunny. Did I mention that families specialise in peculiar names? Even Tom isn't Uncle Tom's real name. Real name, Coriolanus, and Tom only nickname. He insisted on Tom because didn't want people trying diminutives of Coriolanus and calling him Anus. True story saying she wanted to stay in Uncle Tom's cabin for Easter week. 
getting my spoke in early, she said. The place gets booked up so fast. Yes, of course. Ha <laughs> ha. Popular spot, yes, despite no telly. Hung up. Swallowed hard. Tremendous shock. Really quite cataclysmic shock. Ears tingling from it. Writing on the wall. Universe entirely unequivocal. Had to return to Dublin. Of course, had known couldn't stay here forever. Of course, had known that soon would be spring. And Bridie's extended family's thoughts would turn to mini breaks. Fresh air. Ozone. Of course, knew was lucky to have stayed so long without interruption. Was not stupid. Merely gifted at self-delusion. Over the months, had elected to indulge in some light denial. If I pretended would never have to leave, then would never have to leave. But denial a faithless, flimsy friend, and no protection against the truth when it decides to come after you. Okay. Shameful admission. Here we go. Had been toying with embryonic notion of remaining in Nokovoy. Yes. Surprising, I admit had entertained fantasy of somehow managing to retain nicest and or most profitable, overlap very rare, Dublin clients, commuting to take care of their needs while building up client base down here. Details not fully fleshed out in head, but knew it would be hard work, would involve lots of driving, lots of sweet-talking clients nervy as racehorses, who usually insisted on round-the-clock hand-holding, and would never make as much money as if Dublin-based, but worth it if happy, no? But a universe having none of it. Universe was ousting me from lovely little house and ordering me with long, bony, grim reaper-style finger back to big city. Was plunged into wretched despair, almost as bad as desperation had experienced during cheerless Christmas dinner with Dad and Uncle Francis. Had come to Nokovoy to escape shambles of life to hide out until restored to mental health, but unexpectedly had become happy here. Only saw it now that it was nearing end. Effing typical, of course. 11.22 Wandered into kitchen, stood at window, gazed out at Considine's house and wondered if Chloe would come to tranny night tonight. She hadn't come last week our first Friday back after the Christmas break. No invitation had been extended to watch Law and Order. In fact, hadn't seen her since Thelma and Louise night. Exceedingly worried, if truth be known, that my impromptu kiss may have caused trouble for Considine and Gillian, and fatally wounded my friendship with Chloe. Was not first time had kissed a woman. Paddy had seen to that but was first time had done so without big hairy man watching and masturbating. Chloe, exceptional kisser. Slow and sweet and sexy. Kissing with whole mouth. Not just doing hard, tongue-darty swordplay that many people think is good kissing. I'd felt quite swoony in my head, and knees were going weak. Then Chloe went rigid as plank and wrenched away from me. Outrageous reality of situation was like bucket of ice cubes tipped overhead. I, I forgot, I stuttered. Gillian. Poor little ferret face. Thinking her boyfriend was having innocent night out dressing up in ladies' clothing. And instead was in sexy clinch with me. Chloe, uh, sorry. I I'm sorry. No, Lola. My fault too. And just got carried away. Adrenaline of the escape. Uh, will never happen again. Yes, uh, me too. Uh, adrenaline. We got back into minivan and drove back to get girls in speed limit breaking silence. Early next morning, went to Birmingham for four days of wretchedness of quite spectacular proportions with Dad and Uncle Francis. I tell you, that pair. They could not enjoy themselves if you put gun to their head. Then on to Edinburgh, with Bridie, Barry and Trees, staying with one of Bridie's many, many cousins, for several days of drunken debauchery, singing The Flower of Scotland, and doing strange stuff with lumps of coal, 
although, believe I may have mentioned in passing I'm not a cold person, this was not problematic. Without doubt, have developed schoolgirl crush on Chloe. All the more silly because Chloe, not a real woman. But worst aspect of whole business was Gillian. I was deeply ashamed. Karmic no-go area, putting moves on attached individual. Nice and all as Kiss had been, wished desperately had never done it. Tried to confide in Blardy and Trees, in distressed attempt to untangle snarled-up feelings, but got no sympathy. Your life like soap opera, Bridie declared, then proceeded to tell all her cousins. Cousins told all their friends, and no one stopped telling until whole of Edinburgh greater metropolitan area knew. Kept stumbling across conversations about myself. So then she gets her eye off this surf boy, and apparently you'd want to see him. He's fucking gorgeous and mad about her, even though he's far better looking than her. And is she glad? No. Instead, she gets this thing for her next-door neighbour. A transvestite? Yes, that's right. Uncle Tom's next-door neighbour. The tranny has a long-term girlfriend. But this is the best bit. Lola doesn't fancy the tranny when he's in man clothes. Only when he's in ladies' clothes. Yes, I know. And she's not even a lezer. When man in tartan tam shanter engaged me in chat at a piss-up and told me about Bridie's loony friend, the story had mutated so that Jake was now round-the-world yachtsman and Rossa Considine was transsexual who had lopped off his doohickey in bid to woo me. Happy now? I asked Bridie. Ah, sorry, Lola. It was just too good a story. Back in Knockavoy on 4th January, all anxious and longing for it to be Friday so could gauge how things were with Chloe. But Friday came, and Chloe didn't. Natasha appeared, and Blanche, then Sue and Dolores. But no Chloe. Maybe she didn't know we had started back, Natasha said, brow furrowed unbecomingly. Maybe she thinks next week is first week back as if tranny nights were like evening classes. Maybe. I felt sick. Of course she hadn't come. Chloe's loyalty was to Gillian. But was hungry to promise Chloe that Thelma and Louise kiss would never happen again, that it was one-off reaction to unusual, highly fraught situation. Had to take bull by horns. Rural phrase which now understand, bull's terrifying but could not summon required nerve to propel self across the grass to Constantine's front door and request audience. Too scared, yes, that he would tell me boldly to fuck off, and that would be the end of that. Hoped that could just leave it to fate, that might bump into him over weekend. Kept nervy eye out, but no sign. Short relief from hideous anxiety when jumpy thoughts alighted on ocean that he might be away on mini-break, down some foreign pothole. But early Monday morning was woken by him slamming front door. Hopped out of bed and spied on him striding to eco-car, leaving for work as normal. He didn't look up, and then knew for sure something was awry. Hated self. In despair. Spied on him Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and today. And he never once looked up. Obvious was blanking me. But I still hoped that Chloe would show up tonight as usual. 16.01. Popped over to graveyard before it got dark. Mum? I don't want to go back to Dublin. All have to do things we don't want. You think I wanted to die and leave you? No, but only ever intended to be temporary thing. You living in Nockavoy? Okay. After all, was probably not really in communication with Mum. Was just listening to voice in my own head. And in fact, could do exactly what wanted to. Why you ask my opinion if you're just going to disregard it? Mum's voice exclaimed. Although, of course, might be wrong on that score. 
I'm sorry. While I'm here, what will happen with Chloe? Will she come tonight? No answer. Mom? Mom? You will have to wait and see. 1829. Phone rang. Bridie. Come in, Lola Daly. Your time is up. Believe you're being turfed out of house? Yes. So question is, are you well enough to come home, or are you still nuts? Ask me, I think you're worse. You went down to Nogavoy, nice heterosexual girl. Now you coming back part leather. Is there purpose to this phone call, Bridie? Attitude of coldness. Or are you doing it simply to taunt me? Only joking. You seemed sane enough in Edinburgh. So how you feel about de Courcy? Don't know. You wish him well? You feel you could throw confetti at his wedding? Only truly over a man when you can throw confetti at his wedding. Certainly don't feel like that. But no longer thought about Paddy every waking second, and no longer dreamt about him every night. The days were gone when was hair-rendingly crazy because couldn't be with him. In fact, narrowing feelings down here, didn't want to see him. Actually, didn't want to. Ever again. Now that was new. Also, something else new, but couldn't identify it. Sadness? No. Longing? No. Grief? No. Anger? Getting warmer. Hate? Maybe, but not quite. Not exactly. Something. What was it? Fear? Could it be fear? Yes. Might be fear. 1901. Natasha and Blanche arrived. 1915. Dolores arrived. 1927. Sue arrived. As I granted her admission, was frantic with anxiety. Where's Chloe? Sue asked. Not coming tonight, Natasha said. Yes, Lola. Sorry, forgot to tell you. Chloe texted me. Can't make it tonight. Why not? My voice shrill. And why she not text me? She had my number. Didn't say why. Now, does my penis look big in this? 1956. Sat girls down and broke news that current arrangement was nearing an end. Tom Toomey's family want the house for mini breaks. And time I went back to Dublin for work. Oh, Natasha said. When you going? When indeed. Sometime in next two weeks. Nothing to stop me from going right now. Wouldn't take ten minutes to fling clothes back into suitcases. But needed time to come to terms with departure. The girls exchanged glances and shrugged, and one of them said, Always knew it couldn't last forever. Baffling response. Had expected wailing and gnashing of teeth and pleas to stay. Instead, atmosphere of mature acceptance. Why? The disco before Christmas, that was why, had shown the trannies that there was great big tranny world out there. They didn't need me any more. You've outgrown me, I said, then broke down into choking sobs. You came to me as little fledgling chicks, and now, now, you're all grown up. Thought you'd be glad, Natasha said sourly. You've done nothing but complain. Saturday, 17th January, 10.15. Got up, got dressed, and left house. After sleepless night was finally doing right thing. Was going to talk to Rossa Considine. Eco-swat car in drive. 
hopefully he at home and not down a pothole. Also, hopefully not in bed with Gillian. Although they didn't seem to do that, spend the day in bed. They were up and at him outdoorsy types. Constein opened door as if he'd been expecting me. Followed me into sitting room where we perched on edge of couch, ill at ease and sad. Strange atmosphere prevailed, as if we'd once been in love, but it was all over now. You didn't come last night, I said. No, told Noel to tell you. He did. Rossa, my behaviour that night we escaped from the guards, I assure you it won't happen again. Is okay. I, I apologise, Rossa, I sincerely do. And to Gillian, from bottom of my heart. I'm so ashamed, but will never happen again. Was just insane adrenaline mad moment. Please come back. We miss Chloe. Sorry, Lola, he said with regret. Chloe's gone for a while. I promise won't lay finger on her. Nothing to do with you, Lola. Not your fault. Just one of those things. For the best. But... Tears in my eyes. For mythical character. Sorry, Lola, Considine said with infinite kindness. Know how much you liked her. Oh, please don't cry, Lola. Come here. Took me on his lap the way Chloe used to, and I sobbed against his shirt. Will she be back? Probably, yes, at some stage. Just, you know, didn't. Must be something to do with Gillian. Maybe she'd finally started kicking up at her boyfriend wearing ladies' clothing. But by time Chloe comes back, I'll be gone. What? Barked word out. He sat up straight, nearly sending me toppling onto floor. His body rigid and no longer comfortable to lean against. Yes, Considine. Have to go back to Dublin. Toomey family want the house, and I need to go back to job. That thought of leaving cried all the harder. Remarkably sad. When you going? Don't know. Haven't decided yet. Can't bear to. Soon, though. Next two weeks. Right. His body sagged, and although once again comfortable to lean on, it was different. Not as pleasant. Like a couch that has lost its oomph. Felt the weight of his head leaning against mine. Mood a peculiar grieving one. Like we were both mourning loss of Chloe. No, it sounds stupid, but simply telling it like it was. Considine patted hand on my back, and my sobbing slowed, then stopped. I closed eyes, feeling a bit calmer, warm. Nice smell from Considine's throat. Big, big sigh came all the way up from pit of my belly. Exhaled in long, loose breath of acceptance. Pushed self away from him. I'd better get up, Rossa Considine. If stay any longer, we'll fall asleep. Lola, sorry I've upset you. It's okay, it's okay. I had done my best, and was leaving Nokavoy anyway. Leaving all of this tranny malarkey behind. You want to come over on Wednesday for law and order? He asked. One final time? Thought it was on, on Thursday night. New year, new schedule. On on Wednesday nights now. You come over? Okay. Hadn't got what had come for, but okay. Twelve, twelve. Knockavoy, Main Street. Saw Jake and his mouth sauntering along in Love God fashion on other side of street. Braced self for insults. But he gave cheery wave. Devoid of bitterness, obsession, insanity. So it is true. According to usual sources, Cecile, he is fully restored to old cocksure self. He has reduced jazz to shell of a girl, made casual, cruel attempt over Christmas New Year wasteland of time to come between Kelly and Brandon, and is now embroiled with engaged woman from Outless Canner Way. 
I am blip on his otherwise impeccable record. 12.16. Supermarket. New Vogue Inn. Kelly had it on special order for self. Obliged to tell her to cease and desist, as would be returning to Dublin. She expressed sadness at my imminent departure, then turned attention to shockingly high cost of Vogue. Nearly a tenner, she cried, clinking change out into my upturned hand. And nothing in it but ads. Hey, all excited. How you get that mark? What mark? That. She indicated small, baldy-looking circle of shiny pink skin in middle of my palm. Is it burn? You self-harmer? She asked eagerly. Kelly fascinated by lifestyles of starlet types she reads about in cheap magazines. Little girls with big handbags, bulimia and spells in rehab under their belt before 18th birthday. Would love to meet real self-harmer. Birthmark, I said apologetically. Born with it. Then added, because she looked so disappointed. Sorry. 1315. Passing the dungeon. Ho! Oh, Lola Daly! A word, if you please. I stepped in. Item of gossip for you, Boss said. Hot, Moss said. Red hot the master confirmed. Shameful thrill ran through me. This trio know everything. Whatever they told me would be true. Are you ready? Boss asked. I nodded. Gillian Kilbert, also known as Ferret Face, and Osama the Barman are an item. Extreme shock. Gillian? And Osama was seized with terror. This my fault? Had I driven wedge between Gillian and Considine, propelling Gillian on revenge fling? Does Rossa know? I asked. No. So how do you know? Expected it. Have watched Situation with interest since they first began going to them Danish films together on a Friday night. Thought they were both ripe for it, the master said. Little bird tells me, Considine and Ferretface haven't done the needful for many weeks. In fact, not since the night they got back together. How the hell you know that? Bad Bernie feeling at invasion of Considine's privacy. Small town. Anyway, sure enough, instead of coming straight home from Ennis... Gillian and Osama have taken to parking the car half a mile out the road there and snogging the heads off each other. They didn't go to film at all last night, Boss said. Just parked the car in their favourite spot and, well, you know yourself. That Bernie feeling intensified. Have you nothing better to do than spy on people? Startled hiatus. What's up, Lola? Boss upset. Thought you'd enjoyed the bit of news. Not right that I know and that Rossa doesn't. Someone will tell him soon enough. Moss seemed to think that this was good thing. But not. Sudden and extreme compassion for Considine. Proud man. And although sometimes cranky, a decent man. I too have been the rejected sap in my time. I should tell him. But could I? Despised all that nosy Parker fake sympathy. Thought you should know. Although my sympathy not fake. And if did break news to Considine, he would hate me forevermore. Messengers always got the blame. Did not want him to hate me forevermore. Discovered unexpected fondness for him. You leaving? Alco's corner cried as I got to my feet. Yes. Needed to think about this. Left pub, to sounds of boss muttering. Don't know what's up with her. Jesus Christ. As stepped out into daylight, first person I encountered was Gillian. I was rooted to spot with guilt, shock, then more guilt. Hello, Lola. Happy New Year. She stopped for chat. Seemed in blithe good form. Um... 
You okay? Cripes alive, was trying to decide what right thing was. She was right in my path. What were chances of that happening? Was she there for reason? But this was hard. A, I was fine one to bloody well talk, having made pass at her boyfriend, even though not him was interested in, but his lady alter ego. B, interfering in other people's affairs, anathema to city person like myself. Gillian, cleared throat, is none of my business, and I'm not passing judgment, really, not at all, but heard, heard that you and Osama, I mean Ibrahim, have been, what would I say, all sounded sordid, fumbling in laybys? You know what I'm getting at? I said, mortified. She was staring, ferret face immobile, eyes full of fear. People talking about it, I said. Rossa will find out. Would probably be better if he heard it from you. Where are you here? Not in there. She tipped her head at the dungeon, her little face white as milk. I inclined chin in reluctant assent. Would not wish this fate on worst enemy. Boss, Moss and the Master being privy to their intimate business. Fuck, she whispered. Okay. She nodded, 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 then scampered up the street and dived into the oak. No doubt to consult old prune eyes. 1537. Not spying? No. Simply happened to be cleaning windows in preparation for my departure when saw a ferret face and old prune eyes approach up the road, reeking of determination. Like gunfight at the OK Corral. At Considines, they turned right into his boreen, rapped on door, and short while later were granted admission. Door shut firmly behind them. I listened hard, anticipating perhaps shouting and crashing of breaking crockery, but heard nothing. 16.19 Ferret face and old prune eyes emerged, heads bowed in what assumed was shame. Could discern nothing further. 18.24 Cleaning oven, although had barely used it during Knockavoy's sojourn, when heard knock on the door. Rasa Considine leaning against door jam, looking mildly dishevelled. Badger's arse, he said. Have you? Your badger's arse night. You were promised one and you never got it. How you feel about doing it tonight? Right now. What wonderful idea. Let me just take off apron. Of course, was simply being kindly person. Considine needed excuse to go out and get mouldy drunk, to drown pain of ferret betrayal, and was dressing it up as gift to me. However, was, yes, proud he had picked me over his potholing buddies. Mind you, knowing those macho types, I expect they would mock him something ferocious. Ha ha, you hear about Considine? So crap in bed, his girl ran off with suicide bomber. Ha 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 ha. 1837. Standing in Knockavoy Main Street. Which pub? I asked. The Oak. The Oak? You blame me for expecting boycott of the Oak? Fair play to him, man of forgiveness. Unless he planning to deck Osama. No, no decking. Purchased drinks from Osama. Aspect civil. Impressive. Rasa Considine like Gandhi. Osama, on other hand, was creeping about, eyes lowered with remorse. No sparkling, pruny-eyed smiles this evening. Couple of drinks in, Considine cracked and told me about Gillian and Osama. I behaved as if was first had heard of it. Is tragedy, I said. Meant it. Other people's breakups give me pain. Almost like it's happening to me. How you feel? Is end of an era, he said. But had run its course. We should never have got back together after first time we broke up. Reasons we broke up were all still there. I had no interest in her depressing films, and she had no interest in my, 
what you call it, trannyism. Or potholing. And they're happy, the pair of them. Not pleasant to be rejected, I prompted. Just a little bit sick of men denying their feelings. No. Stings. You're right. But we'll survive. No need to put on brave face. Being cuckolded, Marjorie Allingham, is humiliating. He twisted round to look at me. In amazement, he said, You want me to be depressed? No. Want you to be honest? Am being honest. No, you not. Am, Lola. Am. Me and Gillian gone bad ages ago. And me to, to, whatever, to do something about it. Hoped it would get better. Or hoped, just hoped wouldn't have to do hard thing. Don't tell me you relieved. Not relieved. Not so simple. But decision was pending. Now decision made. Actually, yes, now that you mention it, am relieved. God's sake, tutted to self. Another drink? 2049. Still in the oak. How you feeling now, Considine? Rough as badger's arse. Wrong usage of phrase. We are not meant to feel rough as badger's arse now. We are meant to feel rough as badger's arse tomorrow morning. I know, I know. Surprisingly attractive smile. For a moment he looked so like Chloe. But we'll not see each other tomorrow morning. Little stumble in mutual eye contact. So let's say it now. Uh, took me a moment to recover from the eye awkwardness, then cried gaily, Okay, rough as badger's arse it is. 21.17 Still in the oak. Brandon and Kelly came in for post-work libation. Expressions wary when they saw me and Considine. News of the cuckolding had obviously reached them. Lola, Rossa, how are you? Rough as badger's arse. 21-21. Still in the oak. Cecile popped over to say hello. God bless all ear, she chirruped. How she could think? Rough as badger's arse. We told everyone we met we were rough as badger's arse, was crying with laughter, really very funny, and, of course, was quite drunk. We are the badger's arse gang, Considine declared. The notorious badger's arse gang. Let's go and see Mrs. Butterly before she goes to bed. 2140, Mrs. Butterly's. Oh, hello, Lola, Rasa, how are ye both? Rough as badger's arse, Mrs. Butterly. No need for language or shouting. She looked almost alarmed as Considine and I clambered onto breakfast bar stools, gripped by weeping-style hilarity. Or unbridled mirth without letting me in on the joke. Tried explaining to her, but laughing too much. Also, what is funny about saying rough as badger's arse 800 times? She tried hard to understand, but much shaking of head and saying, No, still not funny to me. Now, Eddie Murphy, he is funny. You see him in Big Bomber's house. Considine's mobile rang. Is Gillian, he whispered conspiratorially, even though had not yet answered phone, so Gillian could hear nothing. Wanting to know how I am. You ready? Yes. He opened phone. Gillian? Listened for a moment. We'll tell you how I am. Gleefully gave me the nod, and we both yelled into mouthpiece, Rough as badger's arse! Go home, the pair of ye, Mrs. Butterly said. Irritable. Had had enough. I'm going to bed. To watch Eddie Murphy and Dr. Doolittle. Considine snorted. Or Beverly Hills Cop. Constantine and I almost incapable with merriment as she ushered us down from our breakfast bar stools and towards door. 
2201, Nakovoy Main Street. We staggered up road, staggering not from drunkenness, but from howling with laughter. Progress slow, as had to stop every four seconds to double over. Ho, oh, Lola Daly, Rasa Considine, heard ye were on the rampage. A summons from sulphurous interior of the dungeon. In we went. Were bought many, many, oh, many drinks. Bloody great night. Sunday, 18th January, 1003. Only one way to describe how I felt. As rough as a badger's arse. Worst hangover had had for a long time. Concerned for Considine. Good chance last night's badger's arse glee had worn off, and he was in the horrors. Part hangover, part cuckoldage. Nothing worse than waking up morning after the day before when you were dumped. Especially if you got mouldy drunk to drown sorrows. Texted him. Seemed silly urban thing to do, to text someone living next door, when could just get out of bed and communicate in person. But didn't want to barge in on his sorrow. Also feared might vomit if I stood upright. Morning. Am rough as badger's arse. You? Reply came quickly. Rough as badger's arse too. Sent another. You down a pothole? Speedy reply. You mean real pothole or emotional one? Had meant real one, but this was leading question. Emotional one? Immediate reply. No, think is just hangover. Fecking men. Just when you think they're opening up to you. Decided to go back to sleep. 15.10. Beep, 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 beep. Text noise woke me. Groped for phone. Message from Considine. Walk on beach? Kill or cure. Novel notion. Painkillers, flat coke, expensive crisps, couch and duvet, the normal person's response to hangover. Nevertheless, replied, Why DL not? See you 20 minutes, your gate. 1530. There he was, in serious-looking fleece and stampy-style boots. Hair uncombed, as if he'd just tumbled out of bed. And pale. Oh, yes, really quite pale. As soon as saw him and his pale green fizzog, I was seized by paralyzing mirth. Forward propulsion halted by it. He too was in grip of spasm of hilarity so powerful he was clutching his sides. When, eventually able to speak, he called, How you feel, Lola Daly? Rough as badger's arse, Russell Considine. You? Rough as badger's arse. One of those hangovers where everything seems funny. 1627. Walk over, thanks be to Cripes. Feeling miles better, Considine said happily. You? No, have pain in ear from wind, and nothing will fix hangover except glass of Fanta and plate of chips. The oak? Why may not try somewhere different? Wanted to save him from own macho posturing insisting by his very presence in the oak that he didn't mind at all, at all, that his girlfriend had left him for Osama. The hole-in-one? Would rather set my face on fire. 1703. The oak. On second Fanta. Plate of chips in front of me. Planned to have cheesecake of day. Strawberry, next. Considine's phone beeped. Text from Gillian, he said. Checking I haven't topped myself. I guilt flinched. Will it happen every time Gillian Kilbert is mentioned? Till the end of my days? Considine noticed. What's up? Had to ask. Needed to know. Made self ask question. Like squeezing icing out of cone-shaped force bag. Did you and Gillian split up because of... That business with Chloe and me just before Christmas. No. Keep telling you. 
has been dead on its feet for the last Christ knows how long. Did Gillian ever say anything about me? N no, he said, but hesitation was there. She did, I cried. She did, tell me. What? So you can feel even more guilty? Just tell me, Considine. She said, you know that day of the plunger, that there was tension, like sexual tension between us. What? Gillian Kilbert, cheeky bitch. Thinking she can deflect attention from her own adulterous liaison by accusing you and me of tension of a sexual nature, I said. Don't mean to kick a man when he's down, Considine, but don't fancy you. She didn't mean that, Considine said patiently. Obviously, she was talking about buzz between you and Chloe. But what Gillian base her statement on? Cripes alive, you didn't tell her about the snog, did you? Hid my eyes with my hands. No, especially considering it hadn't even happened on plunger day. He was laughing. She said we were sarcastic to each other. What do you say to that? That we were sarcastic to each other because didn't really like each other. Most obvious solution is usually the correct one. Grace. I need to talk to you, Damien said. I went cold all over. I've something to tell you, he said. Christ alive. This was supposed to have been a lovely romantic evening. I'd flown back from London this morning. I'd been there for ages, since Thursday, since Marnie made an alarmingly maddened the head phone call and Damien had insisted on cancelling his Monday night poker game so we could have some rare time together. But even though I'd lit my precious jasmine candle and we'd knocked back a bottle of red, the romance hadn't really kicked in. I was too tired, and as the couch was broken, I was in the only armchair, and Damien was bolt upright in a hard kitchen chair. By mutual unacknowledged consent, we'd eventually given up on conversation and turned on the telly. There was a documentary on about incredibly violent gangs in Brazilian prisons, the sort of thing we usually relished, but neither of us was paying attention to it. I was thinking about Marnie, how she seemed to be getting worse, how she had started being a bit peculiar even when she was sober. I couldn't shake this awful feeling that things were coming to a head. Damien, too, was locked in his thoughts, obviously going through stuff, analysing, sorting, and it must have been because I was so knackered, instead of peppering him with questions like I usually would, I let him do it in peace. Grace, I've to tell you something, he repeated. It sounded like he'd arrived at some sort of a decision, and suddenly I was so frightened. Was this really happening? I realised I'd been waiting for this, without even knowing consciously that I had. When I'd let myself into the house this evening, I'd thought I'd felt that strange presence again. It was hard to know for certain because I'd been flat out looking for it. I'd wandered from room to room, flip-flopping between thinking, maybe yes, maybe no. Unable to decide if something, someone, had been here over the weekend. Someone who shouldn't have been. Now Damien was going to tell me, and the fear, I can't tell you. I was suddenly drenched in sweat. Is it... My voice was croaky and I cleared my throat. It's Juno. What? Damien frowned. Juno? No. It wasn't Juno? But then, what was it? Who was it? I wouldn't have thought it was possible to feel any more afraid than I had twenty seconds previously, but there we are. I did. I've found out by accident, Damien said. Found out what? But now that I know... Know what? It's about D. I was so surprised I couldn't speak for a few moments. D. Rossini? Yeah. 
They're putting a story together at work. Apparently she's been harboring illegals. Oh! I knew it was true. I'd seen it myself. But I couldn't find the words. I was still in the fear. They're going massive on it, Damien said. If it comes off, she'll never come back from it. I stared into his eyes, searching for... What? A second layer of truths? The stuff he hadn't said? That's it? I said. That's all you wanted to tell me? I've taken the risk of my career telling you that... Why? What did you think I was going to say? Nothing. Not Juno, he said in exasperation. Not still. Didn't I say that I wouldn't see her? Yes, yes, yes. I don't know why you think I would ever get involved with her. I know you love me. Yes, I love you. Of course I love you. But even if I didn't, after what Juno did to me... His voice was high with frustration. You know I'd never trust her again. He glared at me, and I glared at him. Then we both began to laugh. Do you want to hear this or don't you? He asked. Yes. He set it all out for me. His paper, the press, had a source who'd come with a story that D. Rossini was part of a small, clandestine circle who were helping young women, mostly Moldovans, who had entered Ireland illegally. The women were living as slaves, were beaten, starved and pimped by the men who'd brought them into the country. But obviously they couldn't look for help from the legal system because, legally, they didn't exist. So Dee and her merry band of do-gooders are helping them. The women get access to a doctor, they get new documents, they stay with one of the do-gooders until it's safe. Then they go home. That wouldn't be so bad, if Dee was helping illegals to leave Ireland. Damien shook his head. They don't send them home because apparently it's just as bad there as it is here. They try to fix them up with live-in employment, as a nanny, that sort of thing. Some of the women they sent to the UK. Which will do wonders for Irish-British relations, he said wearily. An Irish government minister facilitating the entry of illegals into Britain? I'm fond of Dee. Very fond. She's a true idealist. But sometimes... Who's putting the story together? Current affairs. Angus Sprott and Charlie Hazlitt. It's code black. You have codes? You're also macho in there in the press. So how did you find out? Charlie hacked into my files. I wondered why he couldn't have just asked me for whatever he needed. The obvious conclusion was that he was working on something dodgy. He shrugged. How could I resist? It can't be that code black, then, if you were able to just hack into the file. His new baby is teething. He isn't getting much sleep. I guess he forgot to secure it. How far advanced are they? When are they planning to run the story? As soon as they've got pictures. And when will that be? The next time one of the women is spirited into Dee's house. Photographers are watching the place 24-7. I was shocked. D under constant surveillance? Like a terrorist? The question that always cropped up whenever D was in trouble cropped up again. Who's doing this? Like, any idea who the source is? The source? Right. I know. The identity of sources was never revealed because then, duh, they wouldn't be sources anymore. Keep your knickers on. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway, the crisps have to be behind it, because it'll knock out not just D, but the entire New Ireland party. There are rumours that a general election will be called soon, probably in March. Like last time, the nappies won't win enough seats to form a government on their own. But if New Ireland is in disarray, they won't have a coalition partner, leaving the way clear for the crisps. Damien, I've got to tell D. Why do you think I told you? But if anyone finds out it came from you, he'd lose his job. He paused. 
I've thought about it. Let's take that chance. Damien, you're... you're very good. D? Who knows about it? I'd managed to get her early in the morning, before work, in her office in Leinster House, and I made her sit down, then I told her what Damien had told me. The blood receded from her beautiful face, and she became waxy and immobile. How? That's what I'm asking you. Who knows about it? She undid her top knot and ran her fingers through her loose corkscrew hair. Then she rounded it all up again, bringing stray springy strands into the fold, and twisted it back onto her head even tighter than before. Finally she spoke. Only the girls themselves. And a handful of other people. But there are so few of us. And we all want the same thing. She suddenly focused on me. And you know, Grace. But as you're here warning me, I presume it's not you. What about the other people? Damien said there's a doctor. And a person who does documents. Could it be one of them? They've got as much to lose as me. Who could have accidentally found out? Who comes to your house? Uh, have you a boyfriend? She shook her head sharply. You said that to me before, and you did have one. I'm sorry about that, but I really don't have one now. Your daughter? She lives in Milan. A cleaner? You've been to my house. Does it look like I've a cleaner? Friends? You have friends over for strange-looking pasta. You had Damien and me. She placed her palms flat on her desk. Again, very attractive nail polish. A type of dull heather shade. As was the case with all Dee's nail varnishes, it was nicer than it sounds. Look, Grace, this is how it works. It's planned. Helping a girl get away isn't easy, and the window of opportunity is quite specific. I always have advance notice, usually a few days, when a girl is coming. So I clear the decks, make sure no one else will be in the house at the same time. But Elena, Elena was an emergency. They don't happen often. The fact is, Dee, that someone knows, and someone has told. They're only children, you know, she said sadly. Young girls. You wouldn't believe the appalling things that are done to them. They're raped, starved, beaten, their bones are broken, cigarettes are stubbed out in their vaginas. Stop! I couldn't not help them. Dee, I'm on your side, but you're breaking the law. I'm not saying it's not a cruel law, but you're a government minister. If you don't want to lose your job and your career and your political party, and you will, if this comes out, you'd better find out who's behind this. And find out quickly because the press are keen to run the story. It's got to be Bangers Brady and his Christian progressives. And that's the obvious conclusion. But who in the Christian progressives? They're a big party. It could be any number of them. No, Dee, you have to focus. Someone has it in for you. She rolled her eyes. Every day of my life I know that lots of someones have it in for me. What I mean is, D, you're so used to being pilloried from all quarters that you've forgotten that terrible things don't happen simply because of random forces of evil swilling around in the ether, but that terrible things happen because individual human beings make them happen. I thought it was a very good speech, actually. I wondered if she was impressed. She looked like she was fighting back a smile. And this was no smiling matter. Briefly, I had a spy film, Betrayal All Round, No One Can Be Trusted moment, when I wondered if Dee herself was the source. It was like seeing double, but in your brain. Dee? Grace, I'm not laughing. I'm very grateful. I'll go through everything I have. I'll talk to the others. I'll find out who's done this. Dee, you need to find out fast and get them to stop the story. 
And in the meantime, you can't have anyone, any of the girls, showing up at your house. Once the press have photos, they're running the story. Morning, 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 morning. I greeted TC, Lorraine, Claire, Tara, and yes, even Joanne. Still freezing out there? TC was keen to moan about life in general, and usually he would find a willing accomplice in me. Still freezing, I replied briskly, scanning the deluge of press releases in my mailbox. Without wasting time wondering if they were good or bad, I picked out five possible stories to pitch to Jacinta whenever she came in. Then, watched with extreme suspicion by TC, I began to write names in a random fashion on my jotter. D. Rossini Toria Rossini Bangers Brady Toria Rossini's husband, whatever his name was. Christopher Holland Me Damien Paddy de Courcy Sidney Brawley Angus Sprott Scott Holmes, the journalist who'd done the horrible piece with Christopher Holland. Anyone I could think of who had been connected with Dee over the past six months, I scattered their names around the page. What are you up to? TC asked. Nothing. I shielded the page with my arm. I was doing something that I'd read of detectives in Val McDermott novels doing. They write down everything they know about a case, including all the confusing loose ends, and they look for a pattern or a connection. But maybe it doesn't happen in real life. Maybe real detectives can't break into houses with a credit card either. Maybe real detectives in Hawaii never say, book em, Dano. But I didn't know any other way. I bounced my pen off my page. Who else? Dee's ex-husband, of course. As I sightlessly scanned the office, seeking inspiration, David Thornbury unfolded himself from his desk and grabbed his cigarettes. There's another one, I thought, and scribbled his name down. He'd had an exclusive on Dee's daughter's unpaid wedding scandal, which Big Daddy hadn't let him go with. While I was about it, I wrote down Coleman Bryan's name too. Then I scribbled a series of questions, scattering them around the page, trying not to overthink them. Who painted Dee's house? Where was her daughter's wedding held? Who recommended the hotel? Where did Dee meet Christopher Holland? Who was his previous girlfriend? Who was Dee's previous boyfriend? Who told Dee about the Moldovan girls? Who did the documents for them? Did they know someone in the crisps? Did they know Christopher Holland? The page was pretty full. Maybe I was going to have to go to the stationery cupboard for a bundle of index cards and write stuff on them. Then fling them around the floor to see what story unfolded in the formation they landed in. But maybe real detectives don't do that either. I stared at the page, dense with writing. Assuming I'd included everything that was relevant, and Christ alone knew whether I had or hadn't, somewhere in there was a connection which should hint at the person or persons who were gunning for D. I drew arrows, connecting names to statements, trying to stay open-minded, trying to let a different energy guide me. But I don't believe in energy. I don't believe in intuition. I don't believe in hunches. I'm not that kind of journalist. My skill is in wearing people down, in chipping away at the poor bastards, keeping on and on at them until they eventually crack and give me a quote or a story just to get rid of me. I studied the results. Not encouraging. According to my arrows, Bangers Brady had painted Dee's house, Christopher Holland was his own previous girlfriend, and Dee's daughter had married me. There's one, TC said leaning over and pointing as if he was helping me to do a Sudoku. Look, that one there. Paddy de Courcy, linked to who recommended the painters. That could make sense. It could have been him. Here she is. Lorraine had spotted Jacinta arriving. God, no. It's red today. Red. Three weeks of black had been very wearing, but red would be worse. It presaged rage, raised voices, and definitely, definitely no cake. I folded my page into my pocket and readied myself for Jacinta's fury. 
The tail end of the January sales was what she wanted covered. How low did they go? What happened to the unsold clothing? Destroyed? Returned to the manufacturers? Offloaded onto TK Maxx? Find out about Miss Sony, she ordered. There's loads left in the Brown Thomas sale, but they're sticking hard at 40% off. I couldn't help suspecting that Jacinta had a personal interest in this story. Traipsing in and out of clothes shops which offered the ragged dregs of Christmas party frocks, I kept thinking about Dee. And I kept coming back to her runaway boyfriend, Christopher Holland. He had, to quote Hercule Poirot, means, motive, and opportunity. As he had already shafted Dee way beyond the point where he could ever be forgiven, there was nothing to stop him from shopping her on harbouring illegals. Casey Kaplan had mentioned him having gambling debts, and much as I'd prefer to think that Kaplan was full of shit, maybe Christopher had needed more money. He'd been in Dee's house a lot. Whatever she said about compartmentalising her life, he could easily have coincided with one of the girls. No life was entirely airtight. I mean, I knew about Dee sheltering women. Therefore, her life was evidently not airtight. I was just some stray journalist who happened to turn up on the same day that a badly beaten woman had taken up residence in Dee's bedroom. Luckily, I liked Dee. But she might have done another interview that day. Some other journalist might have come along and sat in her kitchen and eaten homemade macaroons and then gone upstairs and... And... What? What was it? Something in my head had caused an adrenaline surge. Suddenly alert and thinking with crystal clarity, I stopped dead in the street and a man slammed into the back of me. Sorry, sorry, I exclaimed, while he muttered about feckin' Egypts who have no respect for other people. I stepped out of the pedestrian traffic and backtracked through my recent thoughts, examining each one. Some other journalist? No. It wasn't that. Sat in her kitchen. No, not that either. Eaten homemade macaroons. That was the one. The homemade macaroons. I hadn't eaten any. But Dee had told me that that was okay because Paddy was coming over for a working dinner and he'd eat them. Assuming that Dee hadn't cancelled on him and assuming that Elena hadn't been moved on before he arrived, Paddy was in Dee's house at the same time as Elena. If Paddy had known about Elena, what else might he know? I reached for my phone. Dee, remember the day I interviewed you? Paddy de Courcy was coming for dinner that evening. Paddy could have seen Elena. He could have done what I did. You know, opened the bedroom door and seen her. So did he? Why? Will you just tell me? After a long silence, she said, Maybe. I'm not exactly sure, but maybe. The tips of my fingers tingled. Dee, you know your painting and decorating scandal? She sighed her assent. Let me just check some facts. I knew all the facts. I was just spelling them out for her. You got your house painted. The company never sent you a bill. And when, off your own bat, you eventually sent a check, it wasn't cashed. So basically, you'd had your house painted for free. So whoever wanted to shaft you must have got to the decorating firm after you decided to use them. Or someone was already in cahoots with them and persuaded you to use them. You told me that the painting and decorating firm came recommended. Yes? Well, who recommended them? Another long silence. Was it Paddy? Paddy de Courcy? A sigh. Yes. It's him, D. It's not him, D said. Don't be an idiot. When I'm damaged, the party is damaged, and when the party is damaged, so is he. Look, I'm not saying it's a perfect plan. I noticed that in my excitement I was talking too loud, and half of Kenny's were listening in. 
It would have been better to have had this discussion somewhere private. But I didn't want to go to Dee's house, in case the hidden photographers mistook me for a Moldovan woman. And I didn't want Dee to come to mine, in case it would draw attention to Damien. Precision bombing, I whispered. To take you out, but to keep the integrity of the party intact. That's what he's trying. Precision bombing, she repeated, and shook her head with some derision. I realised how melodramatic I sounded. I'm sorry, this isn't Black Hawk Down, but I don't know what other way to say it. It's too risky for him, she said. He's a risk taker. How do you know? I shook my head. That's a story for another day. I took a deep breath. D, I'm sorry, but Paddy de Courcy is not the lovely man you think he is. She looked at me in amazement, and I regretted having to destroy her illusions, but it was necessary if, as I was kind of convinced, he was the person who was shafting her. I never thought Paddy de Courcy was a lovely man, she said. Is that right? Well, good, because Paddy de Courcy is a ruthless, treacherous, greedy, graspingly ambitious, profoundly unpleasant man. He'd sell his own granny at a car boot sale if he thought it might buy him a couple of votes. And by hook or by crook, he'll be Ireland's leader one day. I was stunned into silence. Stunned. Her opinion of him was almost worse than mine. And she had never said, had never given any indication. Politicians, I tell you. So why do you work with them? We all work with people we don't like. It's handy for the party. People who distrust me because I'm a mouthy feminist are reassured by my having a good-looking, charismatic man as my deputy. You admit he wants to be Taoiseach? God, yes. He's always had his eye on the prize. But I've never thought he planned to do it via leadership of New Ireland. He's using us because we're small, but we punch above our weight. He's a big fish in New Ireland, and it's got him noticed. But we're only a stepping stone. His next big move will be to defect to the nappies, and he'll take it from there. Say it again, Dee. A ruthless, treacherous... A ruthless, treacherous, greedy, graspingly ambitious, profoundly unpleasant man. And say the part about selling his granny. He'd sell his own granny at a car boot sale if he thought, it might buy him a couple of votes, I prompted. It might buy him a couple of votes, she repeated. Once again, astonishment washed over me. I thought you were thick as thieves with them. Now you know. And I think you're wrong. I think he does want to be leader of New Ireland. At the very least, it would get him a ministerial post. What's Paddy done to you? She asked suddenly. Um, something, right? Something bad. But Grace, don't try to make the facts fit just to find him guilty. Was I doing that? Was my personal stuff getting in the way of reality? Was I trying to blame Paddy de Courcy for everything? Global warming? The destruction of the rainforests? The attacks on D. Rossini? Maybe. I was prepared to admit it was a slight, tiny possibility. But as soon as I tried to let go of him and slot another person, Christopher Holland, for example, into the box marked guilty, my brain refused to cooperate. I just needed one more event to link Paddy to the persecution of Dee, and we were in business. Who could I ask? There wasn't any point ringing Angus Sprott at the press and asking him if de Courcy was a source. For one thing, he'd never tell me. And for another, I'd be fingering Damien. And for yet another, there was no way it would be Paddy in person. He'd have gotten Spanish John to pay someone else to pay someone else to do it a long enough chain of command that it would never come back to him. Your daughter's wedding, when so many things went wrong, do you think someone in the hotel could have been paid to cock it all up, to lose the wedding cake, 
to cause chaos in the kitchen so that there wasn't enough meals. It's a theory, but there's no way of proving it. It mightn't be that hard. I'd need to talk to everyone who worked in the hotel on the day of the wedding. Mind you, it was five months ago. Staff turnover in hotels was notoriously high. But worth considering. It's not Paddy, Dee said. But it could be Christopher. Really, it could be. Okay. I decided to go with this different tack. In the Val McDermott novels, the detectives say you must stay open-minded. Why did he sell his story about his relationship with you? The Globe paid him lots of money, I presume. You presume? Haven't you asked him? She looked at me like I was insane. I haven't spoken to him since the story came out. Two days previously, actually. Nothing at all? You never got the urge to ring him and shout abuse? No. Or to get answers to some questions? No. Not even some night when you were drunk? I don't get drunk. Don't you? Well, all right then, I do. But why would I bother wasting my good drunkenness on him? He let me down. I knew he would. Men always do. So why did you bother with him at all? Because he had a big dick and could do it three times a night. Uh, really? Yes, sometimes four. Christ alive, but she was fabulous. No one, almost no one, knew that you had a boyfriend. How did the Globe know that there was even a person to approach and offer money to? Somebody had to have told them. Did Paddy know about Christopher? She hesitated. Perhaps. There was one time Christopher showed up at my office. I got rid of him sharpish, but Paddy asked about him. I said he was a friend of Toria's. I've never been sure he believed me, she admitted. Paddy misses nothing. But I thought we'd moved on from Paddy. So did I. There was something that naked curiosity compelled me to ask. Casey Kaplan said he knew Christopher. Is that true? Or is he entirely full of shit? It's true. She laughed at my sour face. Christopher and Casey are very close friends. They were at school together. He really does know everybody. He's just one of those people. It could have been Casey Kaplan. It wasn't him. Dee was scornful. He wouldn't have given the story to Scott Holmes. He'd have done it himself. Anyway, it wasn't him because he's a sweetheart. Surely you mean a gobshite. Okay, those ridiculous clothes, the swagger, the rock star jargon. But he's a pet. It's the main reason he's so connected. Everyone likes him. I don't. Except you, then. I'm ringing Scott Holmes, I said. He might tell me something. He won't, Dee said. Let's see, I said, locating my phone and hoping I still had Scott's number. Scott? Grace Gildee here. Gracie! I endured the house tricks conversation for as long as I could. Then I said, Scott, I need your help. Good thing to say. Act helpless. Gets results quicker. A truly depressing indictment of the state of male-female relations, but I'm only telling it like it is. Ah, oh, Gracie, you only call me when you want something. Back in November, you did a big piece with Christopher Holland, D. Rossini's boyfriend, remember? Course. The initial contact, was it Christopher Holland himself, or was it agented? Aw, oh, come on, Grace, that's confidential. Scott, we're not discussing the Good Friday Agreement. Was it Paddy de Courcy? What? Are you crazy? John Crown? De Courcy's driver? No. Silence hissed on the line. Grace, I'll tell you this much. It was agented, but I never got the name. I never even met them. Shite. So how were you contacted? Did someone appear to you in a dream? He laughed. Mobile. 
Any chance you've still got the number? It's probably been disconnected by now. Usually the account is open just long enough to set up the deal, then shut down again. Thank you, Scott. I too am a journalist. I understand your nefarious ways, but give it to me anyway. The usual caveats. You didn't get it from me, etc., etc. Let me find it. After a few moments of clicking and rustling, he called out a string of digits. Thank you, Scott. You're a decent man. Let's get together some evening, he said. Let's, I said, and quickly disconnected. It wasn't that I didn't like him, but he was into all that hearty New Zealand stuff. The main reason I'd broken it off with him, apart from being in love with Damien, was that he was always making me trek up the side of a mountain in the snow. Have you any change? I asked Dee. I need to make a phone call. She held her mobile towards me. No, I need to use a public phone. We can't leave an electronic trail. The born identity now, is it? She produced a fifty-cent piece, and I made my way to the grim alcove that housed Kenny's phone. I punched in the number Scott had given me and held my breath as I waited. I'd expected all kinds of noises, but not a ringing tone. It rang. It rang three times. Then it was answered. A man's voice said, Ted Sheridan's phone? I disconnected immediately. My hands were shaking. Ted Sheridan. Sheridan. All the proof I needed. I returned to Dee. Was it Paddy? She asked. No. Told you. Come on, we're going for a drive. The Godfather, good fellas. While I drove, I called Ma. I need you to find a photo. From long ago, when Marnie was going out with Paddy de Courcy. D, sitting next to me in the passenger seat, gave me a sharp look. Not of the two of them, I told Ma. I need one of Sheridan. I know there's one knocking around. It wouldn't take Ma long to locate it. They thought it pitifully bourgeois to record every family occasion with a fat pile of photos. They didn't even own a camera. And the few photos they had of Marnie and me as teenagers had been taken and donated by Leachy. What are we doing? Dee asked. Picking up a photo of de Courcy's old friend, Ted Sheridan. Then we're going to show it to Christopher Holland and ask him if this is the man who persuaded him to do the kiss and tell on you. I'm not... There's no way I'm talking to Chris. You don't have to talk to him, but you do have to be there. How else will you have proof that de Courcy is behind all this? Because it was late, the roads were empty, and we reached Yeoman Road in ten minutes. I ran into the house, and Bingo threw back his head and howled with joy to see me. Ma had found the photo. It was of Marnie, Paddy, Leachy, Sheridan and me, clustered together and laughing. Thanks, Ma, you're a superstar, but I can't stay. I tried to shake Bingo off my leg. Get off me, for the love of God. Come on, Bingo, Ma cajoled. Finally, I broke free of Bingo's passionate hold. Back in the car, I handed the photo to Dee. Hold this. Now, where does Christopher Holland live? She looked like she was going to refuse to tell me, then caved. In Shakur. She was transfixed by the photograph. Paddy looks so young. Better now than he did then. And look at you. You're exactly the same. Who are the other people? She was studying Leachy. Is that? Surely it's not. Who? Show. Oh, yeah. I didn't know you knew her. I don't any more. Listen, ring Christopher Holland. Make sure he's at home. Tell him you want to see him. I don't want to see him. Well, pretend. We're trying to save your career here, in case you hadn't noticed. What if he won't see me? Say, you owe me that at least. Shame him into it. She produced her phone from her bag, but sat with it resting in her hand, her head bowed. Ring him. 
With a marked lack of enthusiasm, she made the call. He must have answered because she said, It's D. Then a few more sentences. I need to see you. Now. Ten minutes. Then she hung up and shuddered. Come on, I coaxed. You'll be in his flat. You can break something belonging to him. Something precious. Christopher Harlan's door opened immediately, and he was already knee-deep into his apology. D, I'm sorry, I... Then he noticed me, and he stepped back, suddenly wary. He was immensely sexy. And knowing what I knew about his large member and his stamina, I so would. Only in theory, and if I wasn't with Damien, etc., etc. Grace Kildee? Christopher Holland. Dee's introductions were terse. We stepped into the hall, and I followed Dee into a living room. Dee, I shouldn't have done it. Christopher's prostration was back on track. With a wave of her hand, Dee dismissed him. I'm not here for an apology. I just need to know if you shafted me off your own bat, or if someone persuaded you. Persuasion? he said, sounding eager to absolve himself of blame. As if I'd come up with something like that by myself. D, the money was so big. I said no, they came back with more. I said no again, they hiked it again. It was the toughest call of my life. You're breaking my heart, D said. Grace, show him the photo. I thrust it at him. It's old, I know, but do you see your, I coughed sarcastically, persuader? It was donkey's year since I'd seen Sheridan. I had to hope he hadn't aged dramatically or had transformative plastic surgery. Christopher stared. Is that Paddy de Courcy? He laughed. No way, man. The state of him. He had a mullet. Never mind him. And is that you? He looked me up and down. You haven't changed much. Would you? I redirected him to the job. He gazed at the photo sitting in the palm of his hand for so long that I began to sweat. Yes? I encouraged. No. He shook his head. Sorry. He looked genuinely regretful. I know it's old, but try to imagine 17 years on. I was beginning to sound desperate. Think different hair. Maybe less of it now. More jowly, perhaps? He pulled the photo closer to his face and tried it with one eye shut, then the other. Wow. Yeah, right, I see it now. You've got to admit she looks totally different now, much classier. She? She? Who? Her? He pointed at Leachy. Alicia Thornton, Paddy's lady. When she showed up here, she had a mad scarf on, trying to change her look. But I knew who she was. Like, from the papers. Isn't that who you're talking about? I turned to Dee. The shock on my face was mirrored on hers. You mean... Dee hissed in a most terrifying way at Christopher Holland. Not only did you tell the entire nation every detail of our sex life, but you neglected to let me know that my closest colleague is out to get me. I please don't tell me you thought Alicia Thornton was doing this off her own bat. Please don't let me discover that you're that stupid. I kind of felt, Christopher stammered. I'd hurt you so much with the story. I didn't think anything could hurt you more. I see. Stupid, treacherous, and arrogant. FYI, Christopher. My career means far more to me than you ever did. Come on, Grace. She swept out. I whipped the photo out of Christopher's hand 
then hurried after D back to the car. We got in, but I didn't switch the engine on. I was so overwhelmed I couldn't trust myself to drive safely. It's Patty, D said. I nodded. It's definitely Patty, she repeated. She twisted her neck to look at me. Isn't it, Grace? Looks like it. Are you okay, Grace? Mmm. Yeah. But I wasn't. Abruptly, I found I was having a major rethink on the wisdom of this entire enterprise. Up until now, it had been almost like a game, playing girl investigator during a slow week at work. Because of what Paddy had done to me, it had been gratifying to pursue further evidence of his badness. But now I had the proof. He was involved in high-risk political games. He really was. And all of a sudden I'd come to my senses. What had I been thinking with my idiotic bravado? I should have stayed well clear. This was real life. And I knew what Paddy was capable of. Sitting in the stationary car, I made a decision. This was where I bowed out. D could take it from here. She was the politician. She'd be good at all that Machiavellian stuff. I was just an ordinary Joe Soap. A scared one. I'll have to call him on it. Dee's eyes were narrowed as she visualised the scenario. But I need something to bargain with. What have you got on him, Grace? What skeletons are rattling in his cupboard? None. Nothing. What? She turned in surprise. But I thought... Oh no, Grace. You can't. D, I'm not that type of person. A journalist, whatever. I thought I was, but it turns out I'm not. Sorry, I added. You mean you're scared of Paddy? I suppose. But that's good. It means you know something about him. Something that can help me. Yes, but whatever he's done to you, don't you want to have your say? No. That's not the grace I know. It's not the grace I know either, I said gloomily. It just goes to show. Grace, you're my only hope. My political career depends on you. Without you, I'm sunk. I laid my forehead on the steering wheel. Don't. And if I'm sunk, Dee said gently, so are thousands of Irish women. Women who live in fear. Women who have no one to speak up for them. Women who have no one to give them a voice. No one to articulate the deepest hopes of their hearts. Marnie Sky News was still her only friend, even if it did have a tendency to repeat itself every fifteen minutes or so. Today it was telling her that it was Wednesday the 21st of January. Also some tedium about football transfers, which she tuned out. When the phone rang, Marnie regarded it fearfully. Just out of habit. Somewhere along the line, the phone had become a bringer of only bad news, and she'd stopped answering it. The machine kicked in. Then she heard Grace. Marnie? It's me, Grace. Are you there? Marnie picked up. I'm here. Are you sober? Yes. But only because she was waiting for the off-license to open. There wasn't a single drop of vodka left in the house. She didn't know how she'd let that happen. Are you really? Grace sounded anxious. This is important. Honestly, I am. Marnie's heart twisted with sorrow. She couldn't blame Grace for being suspicious. Okay. Right. I've got a favour to ask. Blast from the past. Grace yourself. Paddy de Courcy. Marnie flinched. She just had to hear his name. Even now. Grace continued. 
don't feel any pressure to do this. Don't do anything you don't want. I'm only doing this to help someone else, so you won't be letting me down. Marnie was confused. You want me to help Paddy? Christ, no, the total opposite. Okay. So Paddy didn't want her to help him. She felt oddly disappointed. He's up to all kinds of political dirty tricks, Grace said. I said I'd try to help the person he's shafting. Marnie was startled. This was all very dramatic. Alarmingly so. You were what I came up with, Grace said. Me? The way he used to hit you and stuff. I think he might have done it to other women too. If I can find some, would you be interested in coming with them? To put pressure on him? Pressure? Marnie heard herself ask. How very, very strange this was. Paddy de Courcy, after all this time. Putting pressure on him? If he doesn't back off, you and the others will go to the papers with your stories. The papers? It probably won't come to that. The threat will be enough. Oh. Okay. She couldn't have her story in the press. But Grace, what on earth makes you think there are others? One or two things. Not fully checked out yet. I wanted to see if you'd do it before I did anything else. After a pause, Grace said, You don't have to do this, Marnie. I'm only asking because I promised this person, Dee, that I would. But life hasn't been easy for you lately, and maybe this is the last thing. Don't you want me to come? In a way, no, to be quite honest. I'm only asking because I said I would. So you keep saying. Marnie almost laughed. But I'll come. She was quite definite. The draw to Paddy was still there. Even after all these years. God, she was pathetic. But she already knew that. You don't think it'll make, Grace hesitated, things worse for you? She meant the drinking, Marnie understood. You know what, Grace? It might actually help. It might, Grace agreed, sounding doubtful. Putting the past to rest. Hmm, it might. Then Grace's tone changed. Delicately, she said, The thing is, Marnie, if this happens, you'd have to come to Dublin. You'd have to get a plane. Marnie understood the implication. Marnie mightn't be sober enough to manage the journey. Who could blame her for thinking such a thing? Marnie acknowledged sorrowfully. It's okay, Grace. I'll be fine, I promise. So, when do you want me? If it happens, it'll be soon. The next day or so. And you're sure you want to come? Yes. Paddy de Courcy. She hadn't thought about him in a long time. Occasionally, every year or two, his name was mentioned by Ma or Dad or even Bid, but she never indulged herself in bittersweet memories. She only had to hear his name for a barrier to come slicing down like a guillotine, cutting off all thoughts of the past. But this morning there was no defence against unwanted memories. They were there, sharp and fresh, and she was plunged back into remembering the dizzying relief she'd felt when she first met Paddy that she'd finally found the lost part of herself. Up to that point, she'd lived her life incomplete and skewed, and it was a joyous revelation to discover that he was as hungry and empty as she was. His beloved mother had died, and his father was too strange to provide him with love. Paddy was alone and lonely, and the tenderness Marnie felt for him was so exquisite she could hardly endure it. It was as if they existed on a frequency which only the two of them could hear. 
terrible fears and unbearable griefs had always controlled her. She couldn't remember a time when she wasn't at the mercy of powerful tides of emotion. No one else, certainly not Grace with whom she was inevitably compared, endured life with the painful intensity that she did. Even Ma and Dad at times watched her with confusion, as if they didn't know where they'd got her. It shamed her, her difference. Other people, the lucky ones, seemed to have an internal stop button, a buffer, beyond which their feelings didn't extend. But Paddy was like her. He experienced life with the same transcendent loves and bottomless despairs. She was no longer a one-off freak. Their connection was instant and intense, and time apart was unendurable. Even if they had spent the entire day together, the first thing they did when they got home was ring each other. I just want to crawl inside your skin, he said. I want to pull you into mine and zip us up. The first time he took her to his home, it was so cold and loveless it broke our heart. It felt like the Marie Celeste. A place abandoned. There was nothing to eat, and the heat wasn't on. The kitchen was chilly, the tabletop sticky, the bins unemptied. It was clearly a place where meals were never cooked, where milk was drunk straight from the carton, and jam sandwiches were assembled without plates, and eaten standing up leaning over the sink. This absence of a loving heart to his home visited Marnie with a terrifying insight. And her insights, particularly the painful ones, were always spot on. That if his mother hadn't died, Paddy would not have fallen in love with her. He'd been different before the death of his mother. He had told her this. And she knew, even if he didn't, that it had changed him into a person vulnerable enough to need her. It made her suspect not only that she was taking advantage of him, but that she wasn't good enough to have a relationship with a healthy man. Only a broken one would be interested in her, because she was broken also. And, most paralyzing terror of all, Paddy's brokenness might heal, whereas hers was permanent. She tried to tell Grace, who rolled her eyes and exclaimed, you couldn't be happy if your life depended on it, could you? Who cares why he loves you? He just does, okay? Can't you see how lucky you are? Humbled, Marnie worked hard to achieve glimpses of her good fortune. Grace was right. The connection Marnie and Paddy had was rare. They lay in fields and painted the clouds, or looked at the stars and planned their future. We'll always be together. Paddy promised. Nothing else matters. The dark flip side of his love was his jealousy. Even though she swore that she would never stop loving him, he treated every other man in the world as a threat. Not a week went by without him accusing her of flirting with Sheridan, or looking at some other man at a party, or not spending enough time with him. One time, when she made the mistake of saying she thought Nick Cave was sexy, he went mildly berserk, ripping to shreds the magazine pictures that had triggered her remark. For months afterwards, he would get up and stalk from the room if the bad seeds were playing. His paranoia infected her, and, almost to please him, she became as suspicious as he was. Passionate disagreements were routine, practically mandatory. It was like a game, this ritual of dramatic accusations, followed by tearful reunions their way of demonstrating how much they loved each other. There were times when she accused him of wanting grace, even at times Leechy. Leechy wasn't exactly a looker. There was more than a hint of the equine about her features. Indeed, her own father used to say to her, Why the long face? Which Marnie and Grace were horrified by. They used to ask each other, Can you believe he said that? Her own dad! But Leechy was sweet and kind, one of life's carers, and began to show up in the aftermath of Paddy's and Marnie's frequent wrangles to counsel and comfort Paddy. Marnie was actually surprised by Leechy's boldness, but when she objected, Leechy urged compassion. 
he was upset. He loves you so much, and he has no one else to talk to. He has Sheridan. Leechy made a dismissive face. Sheridan's a boy. From time to time, the emotional game-playing spilled over into the physical. A shove here, a slap there. On one overwrought night, a punch in her face. When Grace expressed her urgent alarm, Marnie said, It's not as bad as it looks. His feelings are so overwhelming that sometimes that's the only way he can express them. Even the cigarette burn on her hand was explicable. He's putting a permanent mark on me, like a tattoo. But don't tell Ma, she added. He outgrew her. It was that simple. This became obvious only with the benefit of long hindsight. The rot in their three-year relationship could be narrowed down to the last five months, which coincided with his final five months in college, January to May. Viewed objectively, it made sense. Real life was looming for him. He was no longer the bereaved half-feral boy, but a man with his eye on a career as a barrister. Time to put away his childish things, as Dad might have said. During that spring, perhaps they had more fights than their already very high average. Perhaps, as Marnie subconsciously felt him slipping away, she became more clingy. And as he desired to be free, his disdain became more overt. He told her he no longer loved her. But every time they'd had a minor dispute, he'd told her he'd hated her. This time I mean it, he said. But he'd always said that, too. During his finals in May, she clamped her paranoia down. She couldn't jeopardize his degree. Even though she'd discovered from Sheridan that Leachy had been visiting Paddy at his home, she kept her mouth shut. But the night after he sat his last exam, she allowed herself to let the pent-up accusations fly. What have you and Leachy been doing during her home visits? Having sex? It was simply a tried and tested method to extract a declaration of love, one he had introduced her to. And at her core, she knew there was no truth to it. That's right, he said. <laughs> no, really. What have you been doing? I just told you. She thought he was joking. Any other interpretation was unimaginable. It's real, Marnie. I've fucked her every day since I started my exams. It's over, you and me. When will you listen? When she understood that it was true, she doubled over and howled like an animal. But still, she didn't understand that this was the end. Years later, when she was able to get some sort of perspective, she realized that that wasn't her fault. His sleeping with Leechy was agonizing, but it was part of their pattern to hurt each other because they loved each other so much. You said you'd love me forever. She was wild-eyed. I lied. Look, we were just a college thing. No, they weren't. He was the love of her life the type of love you could wait a hundred lifetimes for. Thrashing around like an animal caught in a trap, she wondered what she had to do. She was so distraught, she thought that sleeping with Paddy's best friend was the next logical step. Persuading Sheridan wasn't as difficult as she'd expected. But when it was over, he was stricken with instant remorse. Don't tell Paddy, he said. She looked at him almost with pity. Don't tell Paddy. Why did he think she had slept with him? Paddy, ask me where I was last night. I couldn't give a shit. Just ask me. Okay, Marnie. In a monotone. Where were you last night? In bed. With Sheridan. She was confident that his jealousy would send him hurtling back to her, more devoted than ever. Sheridan? he asked sharply. Yes. 
I've slept with another man. But it transpired that he didn't care that she had slept with someone else. He cared that it was with Sheridan. Sheridan! Paddy's face was contorted with wild emotion. He's the only person in the world I trust. And you've corrupted him! She wasn't surprised when he hit her. She stumbled against the wall, and he punched her again, this time sending her staggering to the floor. But when he kicked her in the stomach, she knew she'd gone too far. In a frenzy, he kicked her in the ribs, in the chest, in the face. She tried to protect her head with her arms, but he peeled them off and stamped on her right hand. You're a stupid, useless bitch, and this is your own fucking fault. He was panting from exertion as he stood over her, curled in a ball beneath him. Say it. You're a stupid, useless bitch, and this is your own fucking fault. He was pulling his leg back for another kick. No. She didn't think she could take another one and still live. The toe of his boot slammed her stomach against her spine. She wretched, 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 wretched. Nothing but bile left. Say it. I'm a stupid, useless bitch, she whispered, tears streaming down her face. And this is my own fault. Own fucking fault. Can't you get anything right? When she came round in hospital, wired up to instruments, she'd expected Paddy to be sitting by her bed. His head bowed in penance. But only Grace was present. Where's Paddy? she rasped. I don't know. Marnie assumed he'd just popped out for a cigarette or to get a drink. Foreboding lay heavy upon her. It was going to be hard for them to come back from this. He'd have to do something. Go for counselling, get professional help, to ensure nothing like this happened ever again. Then she discovered that Paddy hadn't just popped out for a cigarette. He wasn't at the hospital. He hadn't been there at all. D Does he know I'm here? She asked Grace. I'm sure he knows you're in hospital, Grace said. That's the only place you could be, assuming you were still alive. Marnie didn't understand. Hasn't he phoned? No. No? He was too ashamed of what he'd done, Marnie realised. She'd have to go to him. But she was physically incapable. The list of her injuries went on for two pages. Grace insisted she read it. A cracked knuckle from when he'd stamped on her hand. Contusions to the liver. Bleeding from the spleen. Severe bruising to the ribs and clavicle. A terrible thought occurred to her. Grace, do Ma and Dad know? No, I couldn't get hold of them. Thank you, God. Ma and Dad were on holiday in France with Bid. Grace, please don't tell them. Are you mad? Of course I'm going to tell them. You can't. You can't. They tried to stop me being with them. An even more frightening scenario unfurled. You haven't... You haven't told the police. No, but Grace, no, 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 you can't. Tears of panic and frustration rushed from her eyes. Please, that would be the worst thing ever. But the nurse says he might do it again. He won't do it again. Grace, you don't understand. That's just him and me, how we are with each other. But look at you. You're in hospital. He did this. Grace, you couldn't. It would be like turning in a member of the family. Paddy's one of the family. But look at what he's done to you. Grace, I'm begging you. Swear to me that you won't tell them. Or man, Dad. 
It'll be okay. It'll be okay. It'll never happen again, I swear to you. Eventually, she extracted a reluctant commitment. But Grace drew the line at helping Marnie from her bed and down the corridor to the phones. You have internal bleeding, she said. You're not well enough to stand. Marnie waited until Grace had left, and, wheeling her drip along the lino, inched painfully to the public phones. But when she got no reply from Paddy's number, she was overtaken by a kind of vertigo, like she was about to topple off a high building, and just tumble, 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 feet, then head, then feet, then head, air whistling past her. The following day she said, Grace, he's not answering the phone. Please, will you go to his house? No. Please, Grace, I have to see him. No. I won't tell Ma what he's done, but I'm not going to his house. Marnie lasted another twenty-nine hours before the compulsion became irresistible. She pulled the drip from her arm and left the hospital without telling anyone and caught a taxi to Paddy's house. The peculiar father answered the door, seemed shocked by Marnie's bruises and bandages, and said in answer to her desperate questions, He's gone. Since last Wednesday. Last Wednesday? Four days. Packed a bag, and off he went. Packed a bag? You saw him? Why didn't you stop him? He's a grown man. Well, where did he go? I haven't an iota. But you must know. He tells me nothing. I need to look in his room. She limped up the stairs. It still smelt of him, but his clothes and books were gone. Grace, should we go to the police? Good idea. He should be arrested. No, I meant a missing persons thing. He's not a missing person. He left. His dad saw him. But where is he? Wherever it is, it can't be far away enough. He could be in London. Already she was thinking of going there. No, Grace said. You can't go after him. He could have killed you. He hasn't even bothered to find out that you're still alive. Because he's scared. That's why he left. No, because he doesn't care. I have to see Sheridan. He'll know. But Sheridan either didn't know or wouldn't tell. Marnie was never sure. Inconceivable though it was that Leechy would know and she wouldn't, she swallowed her pride enough to ask, but Leechy didn't know either. In fact, Leechy had the cheek to look almost as wretched and nervy as Marnie. Paddy didn't reappear. Days, then weeks passed. All through the summer months, Marnie remained on high alert, every cell trembling with tension, desperate for his return. October was her focus. He'd have to come back then to start his training at the bar. Until then, the agony of summer had to be endured. The sunny weather and long evenings of July and August took an eternity to elapse. Every morning she woke to dazzling, mocking brightness. It laid her bare and raw. But she knew that the chill of autumn would eventually arrive. The air would change, the seasons would slip down a gear, and Paddy would come back. He tried to blank her in the street. Don't come near me. You disgust me. He kept striding while she did her best to keep up with him. Paddy, it's okay. I forgive you. For what? For beating me up. That? He was incredulous. That was your fault. Was it? But she didn't have time to decide, because he was moving so fast and she was so hungry for information. Where have you been all summer? New York. Doing what? Having fun. 
the way he said it let her know that the fun he'd had had been of a sexual nature. Why didn't you tell me where you'd gone? He stopped and looked down on her from his great height. Because I didn't and don't ever want to see you again. She had that toppling sensation again, like she'd fallen and was tumbling over and over. You'll have to get over him, Grace said, as if it was as simple as just deciding to change the sheets on a bed. If I could, I would. She'd have happily cut off her arm if she thought it might stop the pain. But she was tiny and powerless against its terrible might. During the summer months, she'd had the expectation that her suffering was finite. Now she understood that her agony could last for all of eternity, and nothing would happen to interrupt it. Have some self-respect, Grace urged. I'd love some, she said quietly. If I knew where to get it, I'd be there like a shot. You just need to decide you have it. She shook her head. Grace, there is nothing so frightening or humiliating as loving a man who no longer loves you. It happens to everyone. Grace was defiantly practical. I'm not everyone. I'm not normal. She was an emotional hemophiliac. She couldn't heal. Every bad thing that had ever been done to her, going right back to her first day at school when she'd been separated from Grace, she carried, each wound as fresh and painful as if it had happened yesterday. She never got over anything. And let's face it, Grace, even if I wasn't a fuck-up, she actually managed to laugh. Even if I was the most well-balanced, sunny-natured person alive, Paddy de Courcy would take some getting over. She passed through the following nine months, her final year in college, like a ghost. She graduated and barely noticed. Time passed. A year, two years, three years on, and the torment of his absence remained the most important fact of her life. It was as if she was paused, waiting for his return to click her life back on and for forward propulsion to begin again. Years later, when she looked back at that time, she wondered why she hadn't simply killed herself. But she had been too stunned with pain to have had even that volition. News reached her that Paddy and Sheridan were sharing a house, and it was like a knife in her gut. Why had he forgiven Sheridan, but not her? Only one thing mitigated her pain in the smallest way. Paddy wasn't with Leechy. Through the worst of the post-Patty times, Ma and Dad had been quietly, sensitively supportive. They never pressed for details on the end of the romance. They never asked why Leechy no longer called around. It was Dad who suggested she tried out living in a different city for a while, and Marnie was surprised by how the idea infused her with fresh energy. Her life was so wretched in Dublin that starting again in some other place might clean it up, render it usable. She considered San Francisco, then Melbourne, then, beaten back by visa requirements, ran out of steam, and thought herself lucky to have got as far as London. Where she also surprised herself by getting a half-decent job as a mortgage broker. But, still reeling from the loss of Paddy, she embarked on one doomed romance after another, lurching from man to man, trying to right herself. She read self-help books and saw counsellors and listened to subliminal tapes and, trying not to cringe, repeated validations in front of the mirror, in a ragged quest for healing and self-respect. Her wounds were impediments she tried to ignore, but despite her valiant efforts, they thwarted her by revealing themselves to the very people, usually men, she was trying to conceal them from. After a time, Ma and Da began dropping an occasional mention of Paddy, relating, almost with pride, his political ascent. Clearly, they had no idea of the agony it caused her to even hear Paddy's name. They would never have done so if they'd known. They thought, 
perfectly reasonably, that her relationship with Paddy had happened so long ago that surely she must be over it by now. At some stage, she accepted that she'd be spending her life without Paddy. But she caught a glimpse of it from time to time. A small, despicable part of her continued to wait. She visualised it as a room which had been shut up and preserved exactly as it was when he went away, and was waiting for the right circumstances for the door to be flung open, the dust sheets to be snapped off the furniture, and the light to flood in. Grace I rang Damien. Marnie says she'll do it if there are other women. I must have sounded as dismal as I felt, because he said very gently, Grace, you don't have to do this. I gave Dee my word. She'd guilted me into saying I'd tried to put something together. And when I said I'd do something, I did it, even when I didn't want to. I shouldn't have told you about the story. Damien was grim. I thought you could just tell Dee. I'd no idea you'd get embroiled in all this, this de Courcy business. Maybe I won't be able to find Lola Daly. Maybe you won't. Then I could walk away with a clear conscience. Keep me posted, he said. I will. I hung up, then got to my feet and with great reluctance approached Casey Kaplan's desk. Casey... You know how you told me who John Crown was, and I was so grateful to you? You weren't that grateful. You stole my Madonna story. I was as grateful as I could be. Can you help me again? Try me. I need to find someone. Her name is Lola Daly. She's a stylist. Yep. Know her. You know where she is? No. Fool. Last sighted in Dublin in September, I said, but she's fallen off the edge of the earth. She doesn't answer her mobile, but the number hasn't been disconnected. That's all I have. I know it's not much, but could you put the word out among, you know, models and those types, socialites, it girls, see if anyone has been using her? Only his eyes moved. He was scanning them over my face in a searching way that I was meant to find disconcertingly sexy. He nodded slowly. Okay. For real. Could he actually find her? Or was he full of shit? I was depending on the full of shit option. Might take time. He lounged back into his chair. The difficult we can manage. The impossible could take a bit longer. I returned to my desk and picked up the phone, then put it down again when I saw Casey approaching. What? I said impatiently. I can't give you any more information. I've told you everything I know. He dropped a piece of paper on my desk. She's in County Clare, a backwater called Knockavoy. Ten full horror-struck seconds elapsed before I could speak. You know already? Got it in one. First call I made. Some days you get lucky, he added modestly. I met Sarah Jane Hutchinson last night. She was looking hot. Mentioned she was being styled from County Clare these days. Seemed sort of likely it was by our girl. I couldn't speak. Happy? Kaplan prompted. Thrilled, I said faintly. I'd thought Lola Daly would be impossible to locate. In my worst imaginings, I hadn't thought that she'd be found with just one phone call. I was seized with desperate frustration. Bloody Casey knows everybody Kaplan. Why had Big Daddy decided we needed to be sexed up? Why had he hired Casey Kaplan? Why had my path ever crossed his? Look at the disaster he had wrought on me. I'd have to drive to County Clare. And Christ alone knew what other terrible shite was poised to rain down on me. I laid my forehead on my desk for a brief soothing moment, then, pushing against my palms as leverage, lifted it again. 
My skull was very heavy. What's up? Kaplan asked. How long? My voice was faint and croaky, so I started again. How long would it take me to drive to... What's the name of the place? Knockavoy? Dunno, Kaplan said. Only time I went to Clare was by helicopter. I mentioned a vague memory of driving there some bank holiday weekend. It had taken seven hours. Oh, God, no, Lorraine piped up. It won't take anything like that. Not since they've opened the Kildare Bypass. The Kildare Bypass is great, Tara said. A godsend, Claire agreed. I don't know if it makes that much difference, Joanne remarked. TC? I asked. It was odd that TC, i.e. a man, hadn't weighed in with his opinion of how long a journey would take, boring us all to death with detailed discussions of possible routes, roads, etc. He wasn't listening. He was humming to himself as he aligned handfuls of printouts, knocking them against his desk and punching them with neat holes. He was full of industry, focused on some task that was absorbing all his focus. Leave him, Lorraine said. He's getting ready for his big profile on Friday. You'll get no sense out of him. Nothing new there, I said, but he didn't rise to even that. TC began putting his pages into a beautiful red binder. Where'd you get that lovely folder? I asked, seizing on the diversion. I've never seen one like that in the stationery press. Correct, he said brightly. You wouldn't have. Bought it myself, with my own money. He smoothed his hand lovingly over the soft red cover, and I asked him, Who are you interviewing? That you're going to all this trouble for? The most beautiful girl in the world. He smiled dreamily. And she is? Zara Kaletsky. He continued to hum and stroke his red folder. Lorraine was right. I get no sense out of him today. I stared in his direction for a few more seconds, unwilling to accept that I hadn't been able to annoy him. But he was impermeable. Deflated, I turned away from him and was plunged back into torment. I stared blindly at my screen. I had a full day's work to do. Even if I could summon the requisite will, how was I going to find time to go to the west of Ireland? I could leave after work, but despite this much-praised Kildare bypass, the journey would take four hours. An eight-hour round trip. And once I got there, God alone knew how long it would take to persuade Lola Daly to spill the beans. Assuming there were beans to be spilled. Assuming she was even there. I needed biscuits. Something to fortify me against the forthcoming ordeal. I made my way to the tiny office kitchen, but there was nothing to be had in the whole bloody place. Vultures, I muttered to myself. Pigs. Gluttons. I pulled open a drawer and spoons rattled indignantly, like I'd woken them from a sleep. Another drawer contained nothing but digestive dust, proof that biscuits had once lived there but were long gone. In the entire kitchen there wasn't even one meek little Marietta. I'd have to go to the shop. I turned and Casey was behind me. I don't mean to brag, he said. So it's more like a twitch then, is it? Or Tourette's? What? You've no control over it. He closed his eyes, took a broken breath and said, staring at the wall behind me, I don't know why I fucking bother. Fucking bother what? I was going to say, I have a friend with a chopper. Says I can use it whenever I want. A chopper? For a moment I thought he meant a bike. The ones with the handlebars. Do you mean a helicopter? Yeah. Yes, I said. Yes, that would be a big help. Then I remembered to add, thank you. Lola Wednesday, 21st January, 12.15. Getting organised. 
everything coming together. Final Inkechi shakedown had left me with 13 clients. Not many, but they were good ones. Even though needed many more ladies, had actually jettisoned some of the more unpleasant and insane ones, sending them in Ketchy's way. Just didn't have the patience any more. Would be returning to simpler, cleaner life in Dublin than one had left behind. Yes, would also be poorer, but would eventually get more work. Biggest worry about returning to Dublin was reason had left in first place. Paddy de Courcy. How would I behave when ran into him? And was bound to, Dublin being Dublin. Would there be repeat of the almost public puking incident? Would I accidentally destroy clothing on shoots? No way of knowing. 1233. Helicopter whack whack whacked past window on its way to golf course. No big deal. Choppers always landing on golf course, delivering fat, visor-wearing, raw, raw, raw men for their 18 holes. Like Vietnam round here. But seven to ten minutes later, sudden fearful instinct, cannot describe it as anything other than that, made me leap up, rush to front door, wrench it open and glance out. Horrors. Striding up road, unmistakable figure of Grace Gildee. Purposeful, on unbroken trajectory for Uncle Tom's cabin. She had me in her sights. Why she arriving at Nokovoy in a helicopter? The day darkened, like sky had filled up with purple-grey thunderclouds. All light was snuffed out, and I was filled with dread. Then she saw me, frozen with sick anxiety in the doorway, and gave me big, cheery wave, as if we were best of friends. Not loving her look. Careless hair. Nice honey colour, but messy. Could have been from rotors of chopper, but suspected not. Suspected it always that way. Wearing jeans, flat boots, satchel and khaki anorak, perhaps in keeping with Vietnam theme. I could do a lot with her. Now she was striding up the boreen, great big smile across her fizzog. Lola, she said, extending hand. Grace Gildee, pleasure to see you again. What you want? Words emerged hoarse and broken. To talk. About Paddy? Can I come in? Powerless, I let her. 1247 I know you're afraid of Paddy. Not? Just because don't want to do a kiss and tell? Pitiful attempt at defiance. How often did he hit you? Hit me? I know he hit you because he hits all his girlfriends. Please go away. He beat my sister Marnie to a pulp. Please go away. Alicia Thornton is no doubt black and blue under those Armani suits. Louise Kennedy, please go away. You think you're special because he hit you, that he cared so much about you, but you're wrong. She was wrong. Didn't think was special. Not any more. Maybe once upon a time had been stupid enough to think that because he hurt me, it indicated strong passion for me. Did he do the cigarette thing to you? She asked. Stub one out on your hand. Couldn't I, Chuck? Was, well, amazed that she knew. Opened mouth to deny it, but could only manage, uh... She grabbed my right hand. There it was, right in the middle of my palm. A small pink circle, skin shiny and peculiar. She gazed at it, her face so radiant and amazed that I wondered about her earlier confidence when she informed me with such conviction that she knew Paddy hit me. Suspected she'd only been guessing. But it had paid off. Audacious. Seems to be his trademark, she said a form of branding. You're lying. 
stupid thing to say when so obviously wasn't true, but was desperate for none of this to be real. Not lying. How would I know about it? Was silent for a long time, head a whirl. Had thought I was the only one. In the whole world. You swear it's happened to others? Swear. Not committing to anything, Grace Gildy, but what do you want from me? Come with some of the other women and have it out with him. Why? Because he's stitching up D. Rossini and he needs to be stopped. D. Rossini, leader of New Ireland. Know who she is? Irritable. She take me for a total know-nothing. Will threaten to take story to press if he doesn't back off. But what's D. Rossini to me? Nothing, I guess. Except good, decent woman who wants best for people. But might make you feel better to have it out with Paddy. How many women are there? Three, at least. Thought about coming face to face with him. Actual, real, live Paddy de Courcy and was gripped by fear so dark and paralysing made me want to whimper. Once read about a man who'd been locked in a van with three hungry pit bulls. Possibility of being in a room with Paddy filled me with the same kind of terror. Ashamed to admit it. I'm scared of him. All the more reason to have it out with him. Easy for her to say. She didn't even wear lip gloss. She was obviously fearless. No, you don't understand, I whispered. I'm so, so scared of him. It makes me want to, to... I'm shaking even thinking about it. Good luck with it, but you must go now. Needed to get her out of my house before I imploded. In order for evil to succeed, she said, all that is necessary is for good people to do nothing. Yes, of course, quite so. Good luck. Standing up, moving to door, hoping she'd follow. She stared into my eyes. There is nothing to fear but fear itself. I stared back into hers. But fear, very frightening. Goodbye. Trip down memory lane. Night of appalling, interminable dinner party at Trees and Vincent's was first time. After we finally managed to make our escape, we drove away from house in tense silence. Spanish John on night off, and often wondered if it would have happened if he'd been there. Conclusion, maybe it would have. He had to know what Paddy was like. Quiet road. Paddy pulled the car over. I, idiotically, thought he was stopping for snog. He turned to me, held my shoulder with one hand, then punched me in the face with the other. Quick and efficient. Don't ever do that to me again, he said. Pain was bad. Shock was worse. Almost vomited. But in way, didn't blame him. Was horrible night, horrible wouldn't have subjected worst enemy to it. Then, almost straight away, he was lovely. Let's get you home and cleaned up. Gave me hanky to soak up stream of blood from nose. In his flat, he located well-stocked first aid box. Tenderly wiped away my blood. Applied antiseptic to burst lip. This is going to hurt. You should have said that before you punched me, I said. He was stricken. I'm sorry, Lola. I'm so sorry. Don't know what came over me. Just stress. Such a stressy job. Night out, wanted to relax. That wanker Vincent goading me, I just snapped. Put palms of his hands on his cheeks and pulled face downwards. Groaned. God almighty. I can't believe I hit you. My lovely Lola, my little flower. God, how could I? I'm an animal, a fucking animal.
getting progressively more worked up, looked at me with desperate eyes. Please forgive me, Lola, I'm begging you. I swear to you it'll never happen again. On my mother's memory, it'll never happen again. Can you forgive me? Of course I forgave him. Everyone entitled to make one mistake. He was so distraught, I thought, God, he really loves me. No kinky sex that night. Fell asleep in each other's arms. Well, he fell asleep. I was awake most of night because every snuffly breath I took through my punched nose felt like inhaling razors. Next day, he sent two hundred white roses to my flat. Didn't have enough vases to house them all. Had to use saucepans, waste paper bin, empty wine bottles. Like the evacuation of Dunkirk. The next time was different. He opened his front door to let me into his flat, and suddenly I was tumbling against the walls, crashing into the cupboard in the hall, and cracking my skull against the hardwood floor. Actually saw stars, a big burst inside my head like fireworks. Lay on floor for a time, stunned and incapable. Paddy standing above me, breathing like a bull. The cupboard had toppled over, and everything, books, keys, all kinds of stuff, had spilled out of it. Paddy helped me up. My head was ringing like church bells on a wedding day, and led me through cupboard debris into living room. Began shouting, Lola, don't fucking interfere with my Sky Plus settings. What? Hardly knew where I was. Didn't. You did. Had it set to record me on prime time, and you cancelled it. Paddy didn't touch it. Something was dripping down the side of my face. Blood. Must have cut myself. Why would I? Jealousy. You resent time I have to devote to work. Was true, as it happened, but hadn't touched his sky plus. Held my sleeve against my cheek to soak up blood. Bones hurting, especially shoulder. Maybe you forgot to set it, Paddy. Forgot? Is important. How would I forget? Very, very angry. You pushed me, I said, sort of just realising what had happened. I what? You fell. Christ, this is all I need. You fuck up my recording, then start accusing me of stuff. You fell, okay? You fell. Unexpectedly, the downstairs doorbell rang. Who the fuck's that? Paddy demanded. Out into the hall, quick conversation on the intercom. Then he was back in the room, more enraged than I had ever before seen him. It's the police. The police? You fucking stay in here, he hissed. Next thing, he was out in the hall, opening the door. Hello, officers. What can I do for you? Nice as pie. Deep, pompous bogger voice said, Neighbours reported a disturbance. What neighbours? Anonymous call. May we come in? Thought Paddy would get rid of them. Charming, persuasive, good at that sort of thing. So couldn't believe it when two peelers sidled into the room. A man and a woman. Uniforms, fluorescence, terrible, terrible shoes. They looked at me. You like to tell us what's going on? The woman was kindly. What's your name? Lola? What happened to your face, Lola? Paddy loomed behind them and said, Officers, can my friend and I have a moment alone? The two peelers gave each other a look. Please, Paddy said, with air of great authority. The two peelers gave each other another look. Female peeler shook her head softly, but male peeler said, OK, one minute only. Female peeler glared at male peeler. Then she sighed, and they backed out from room. Through rigid jaw 
and with eyes alight with fury, Patty said, Now look at what you've done. I didn't do anything. You have any idea how serious this is? You say a single word to either of them and I'll be arrested. Arrested? I'll be up in court. It'll be all over the papers. I'll be sent to prison. Prison? Prison? I couldn't send him to prison. This was the man I loved. But he had pushed me. If it hadn't happened to me, if it had happened to some woman and I'd heard her on the radio or whatever, I would have thought, why didn't she tell the peelers? Why did she just let her boyfriend hit her a clatter whenever he felt like it? But when you're in the middle of it, there's a world of difference. I loved Paddy. Sometimes, often, yes, often, in fact nearly always, he was lovely to me. And the idea of me getting him arrested was actually inconceivable. Like him being abducted by aliens. People like me did not get our boyfriends arrested. It was so far outside what was normal in my life that I simply couldn't imagine it. Up to me to convince him to stop. Not to involve the police. Paddy stepped forward, picked up my hand and kissed it. Laid his forehead on it and whispered, I'm so sorry. I won't say anything, I said. But you must promise you will never do this to me again. Kissed my hand again. I promise, he said hoarsely. I promise, I promise, I'm so, so sorry. This job's so stressful. Little Lola, you don't deserve this. We'll never, ever do it again. I swear on all I hold dear if you'll only forgive me. I couldn't bear to lose you. On your last chance, Paddy, I said. Touch me again and I'm gone. The peelers were permitted to re-enter the room, and Paddy gave them a smooth story about me up in a chair, trying to reach something on top shelf of hall cupboard when I slipped, fell off, and landed on my face, bringing cupboard down with me. They knew we were lying. Male peeler, cheery enough. We leave yous to it so. But woman peeler, concerned. Kindly eyes. Reluctant to go. Next day, several hundred more flowers arrived at my flat. Neighbours complaining of smell. Was adamant in my own head that would break it off with Paddy if he did another violent thing to me. But next time was when was sick with flu, and he'd insisted on having sex because I was always game for kinkiness, decided wasn't his fault for thinking not even a bout of flu would put me off. The time after that, the cigarette incident, was even more confusing. Of all the things that happened while I was with Paddy, that was the one that made me most doubt my sanity. How could anyone mistake a human hand for an ashtray? How likely was it? but he was so insistent that it was an accident that I half believed him. Next time, however, there was no doubt. I was waiting in his apartment for him to finish session in Doyle. When heard his key in door, I just knew I was for it. Where are you? he shouted, striding through flat. Found me in the bedroom, pulled me out of bed and threw me against the wall. I slid to the ground and he kicked me in my stomach. I vomited from force of it. Discovered later that a bill proposed by New Ireland had been defeated in Dole. Hadn't been aware that they were putting it forward. Should have known. My duty to know. This time, no flowers. Next time, no flowers either. Worried and worried and worried about situation. Contemplated talking to someone, Bridie, perhaps. But, mad, I know, felt disloyal telling someone else about Paddy. Needed to protect him. 
He was a complex man with abnormally stressful job. Bridie would insist I broke up with him, and I wasn't ready for that. Everything's simple in Bridie world. Man hits you, you walk. But situation was complicated. I loved him, and he loved me. Surely we could address the issues, try to fix them. I had to take some responsibility for what was happening. Takes two to tango. Needed to be more supportive of his work. Yes, it bored me, but was my duty to help him. Also, was ashamed, so deeply ashamed of being hit and of staying with him, that the words wouldn't let themselves be said. Then everything was lovely again. Relief, relief, oh, merciful relief. Paddy adoring, tender, smiling. Sex, dinners, presents, weekend in Cannes. Shopping, more presents, all of them kinky, champagne, sex, with Russian prostitute, admittedly, threesome. Back home to Ireland, all well. New Ireland lost by-election. No one got hit. Everything back on track. We'd lost our way briefly, but was all in the past. Moving on. No need to tell anyone anything. Was elated. One night we were having sex. Paddy was groaning, moving me up and down on him. Suddenly he stopped. He was looking at the point of contact. You have your period. Hadn't known. It had come early. And so what? Dirty bitch. He punched me in my throat. Couldn't breathe for so long, I blacked out and it hurt to swallow for a full two weeks afterwards. He was right, though. It was gross. That incident was first in new phase when he began hurting me again, more frequently than in past. No longer considered leaving him, or confiding in Bridie or Trees. I had changed. My indignation had died and the time when I was strong enough to leave him had passed. Was desperate to return to early days when he was besotted with me, when I could do no wrong. The occasions when he'd been loving and tender had greatly outnumbered the bad ones, but I couldn't find the way back. Worked harder to be sexier, to anticipate his moods, his needs, to be more informed about politics, to be constantly available for him day or night was so anxious about keeping him happy that had no emotion left over to love anyone else. I forgot about Bridie, Trees and Jem. They were just drains on my time. Tried to control everything in the whole world so that nothing would annoy him. But anything could spark his fury. A red traffic light, a fishbone in his dinner. Me forgetting to remind him to do something that I'd known nothing about. Then it all came to an abrupt end. The news broke that Paddy was getting married to another woman and would have no further use for me. Should have been happy to be free of him. But wasn't. With him, I felt worthless. But without him, I felt so shamed, thought would never recover. 1811 Text from Considine. You come for dinner before law and order? My place? 8.30? 2039. Considine's kitchen, eating wholesome style stew. Final Considine mystery laid to rest. The goggles and shower cap? For when he is cooking. Goggles to protect eyes from tearing up when he is chopping onions. Shower cap to stop strong cooking smells pervading his hair. Thought, but didn't say, If you are so concerned about your hair, Constantine, why you not comb it once in a while? But, like said, didn't articulate it, as he had done kindly act of cooking me dinner. Delicious stew, Constantine. Good. Man of few words. I had visitor today. I said. He looked up. 
I realised something in my delivery had sounded like coy way of saying had got my period. Very quickly said, a journalist came to see me. About what? She wanted... She said... You know the boyfriend I told you... I mean, Chloe about? Well, she says, I was not only one he... You know, hurt. She wanted me to go to Dublin with other women to... Talk to him. That is excellent. No, that is terrible. Why? Because I'm afraid of him. But you won't be alone with him, will you? There will be other women there. Long pause. You think I should go? Think you should definitely go. But what if it's awful? What is worst thing that could happen? Sifted through feelings. Very worst thing? That he would hit me? No. That he would make me love him again? No. That he would leave me convulsed with longing? No. That he would mock me? Is that so bad? Yes. Really was. He made me feel so worthless. I was nothing. Useless, without any importance. I don't feel like that now. Not saying I'm swaggering around thinking I'm fantastic, but don't want to revert to clueless, helpless, worthless person I was when going out with him and when he dumped me. Would it help if you had company? If I drove you? Kindly, kindly offer. Who would have thought it of cranky arse Considine? You know what I wish? I said. Wish Chloe could come with me. Thoughtful silence. Then he said, If that is what it takes to make you go, Chloe will come with you. No, I said. I'm being silly. Forget I said it. But will you tell me why Chloe is out of commission at moment? Had thought Gillian had put her foot down. But not that, is it? No. Nothing to do with Gillian. Just doesn't feel right. Has happened in past. At times, very comfortable with Chloe. Other times, can't believe I'm grown man dressing up in ladies' clothing. Fair enough sentiment, no? Nothing wrong with grown man dressing up in ladies' clothing. Stout defence. But think I understand. Your offer very kindly. Because think you should go to Dublin. Is good opportunity. Other women there. Nothing to be scared of. If you don't take this chance, you will be creeping around afraid of bumping into him. Not good to be always looking over your shoulder. Better to just deal with stuff. Men, so practical. Found I was reconsidering bald refusal to go to Dublin. Considine's generosity had surprised me into reopening negotiations in head. If he was prepared to dress up in ladies' clothing, even though had knocked it off, then he must really believe I needed to see Patty. Okay, I said slowly. Hear what you're saying. No offence, but I need second opinion. Who could I ask? Bridey? Trees? Jem? No. None of them knew how bad things had got with Paddy. Would involve too much explaining. Would take too long. Would have to spend too much time agreeing that Paddy de Courcy was mad bastard. Would lose sight of objective. My mum, I said. She is dead. Even after all these years, it choked me to say it. Would normally go to graveyard to ask her opinion, but would take too much time. I see. Considine handling news of consultation with dead mother with aplomb. So you need to get a sign from her, yes? Yes. Impressive deductive powers, Considine. 
How about, let's see. Toss a coin, he suggested. He produced euro from his pocket. Heads, your mum says yes. Tails, your mum says no. Marvellous idea. But give me a moment. I walked towards darkened window at back of house, stared out towards foamy sea and asked, Mum, tell me what I should do. I turned around to face the room. Considine had moved away, close to the front door, giving impression of maintaining respectful distance. Go, I said. Go? Yes, do it. He flicked Euro coin upwards, where it winked and twinkled in the air, then came back down again, to land on back of Considine's hand. He slapped his palm over it. I was holding my breath. Well, I asked. He removed hand. Heads, he said. Heads. I exhaled. Okay. Looks like I'm going to Dublin. Thanks for your offer, but we'll go alone. Must leave right now, though, before courage deserts. No law and order for me tonight. 2059. Considine walked me to my car, wishing me Godspeed. He had made me coffee in non tartan flask. Kindly. Also tasteful. Good luck, he said. Kick your man's arse. He deserves it. Drive carefully. I stood by car, the door open but not getting in. Our goodbye felt incomplete. Text me, he said. Okay. Bye, Considine. Go home, it's freezing. He walked away, then stopped and turned back. Hold on a minute. He approached like he had spotted something about me. Lint on my collar, perhaps, or ball of fluff in my eyebrow, and wanted to help remove it. I waited, and he stepped into my space. He put his hand on my neck. Is it piece of thread? I asked. What? He frowned, his forehead very close, so could see it all, where skin stopped and dark hairline abruptly began. Dead leaf in hair? What? No. Perhaps further frowning, but couldn't bloody see because he was so close at double vision. Want to show you something. Without further ado, really in quite brisk business-like manner, he bent his head and put his mouth on mine. So warm in the cold night. So that's what had been waiting for. Revelation. Rasa Considine, exceptional kisser. Slow and sweet and sexy. Kissing with whole mouth. Not just doing hard tongue darty swordplay that many people think is good kissing. I felt quite swoony in my head, and knees went weak, and wait a minute. Deja vu. Had been kissed like this before. Only the last time it had stopped, just as had really been getting going. And this time it went on and on, becoming more gorgeous, more beautiful, my body tingling and alive and... Finally broke apart, Considine almost staggering. Go, he said in thick, growly voice. Sexy. For Christ's sake, go. You kiss just like Chloe. He laughed, backed across the grass towards his house, showing exceptional balance on uneven ground. Hurry back, Lola, but drive carefully. 2212. Just past Matt the Thrashers. Rang Grace Gildee from Carr. Yes, no, it's illegal. Is Lola Daly here? We'll go with you to Paddy on one condition. Which is? You let me style you. Style me? Not for always. Just once. What she think I am? Charity worker? 
You mean gussy me up in heels and stuff? Correct. And frock? And frock. But why? Because it was a shocking waste. Potentially attractive woman like her. Hope you don't mind me saying, I said, but you don't make most of yourself. She gave a little laugh. Couldn't care less that you didn't make most of self. Simply couldn't care less. Takes all sorts, as Mum used to say. Okay. When you come to Dublin. I'm on my way. Grace. Is that her? Marnie had spotted the woman waiting on the pavement. That's her. I pulled the car over to the curb. Lola? It's me, Grace. Hop in. Lola climbed into the back seat. Nervously, she said, You said there would be at least three women. There will be, I said. Marnie, Lola? Lola, Marnie. Hi, Lola said quietly. Hi. Marnie twisted right round to face Lola, and suddenly I started to worry. Well, I say that. As it happened, all day I'd been climbing the walls with a variety of worries, not least the fear that Marnie would turn up scuttered. However, she was sober. But was it my imagination, or was she just a little too interested in Lola? Jesus, what Pandora's box might I have opened? I said, We've just got to swing by and pick up D. Did he hit D too? Lola sounded horrified. No, no, she's coming along to get us into his apartment. But she won't be coming in with us. D and I had had an exhaustive discussion about which would be the best tactic. And, reluctantly, she'd agreed that it would be better if she stayed out. Things had the potential to get messy. And if she was there, it could exacerbate the situation. Grace, Lola's little voice came from the back. There will be at least three women, yes? Because I don't want to do it if it's just me and Marnie. I'm too scared. Lola, I need you to trust me. I made my voice sound reassuring, even slightly amused. I couldn't have her losing her bloody nerve now. I drew up outside Dee's office and texted her letting her know that we were waiting. A few moments later she appeared and climbed into the back seat beside Lola. She was nothing like her usual breezy, positive self. She had been devastated when, sitting in my car outside Christopher Holland's house, I'd told her what I'd known about Paddy. She'd been so appalled that she hadn't been able to catch her breath. Oh, my God, she'd gasped, rocking backwards and forwards. It had been as if she was crying, but without tears. Oh, my God. I knew Paddy was a... a like, I knew he had no loyalty to anyone but himself, and I knew he was off his head with ambition. But I thought I could just about stomach it because he's so popular with the voters. She'd heaved in a ragged breath. The price you have to pay. But, I mean, Grace, I was a battered wife and I had no clue about Paddy. She'd bowed her head again and heaved air through her hands. My deputy leader is a woman batterer. Me and all I stand for. How on earth did I end up in bed with one of them? She'd looked up at me, her face red, her eyes bulging. I have no time for pop psychology, she'd said fiercely. No time at all. Me either. But they say we replicate patterns. Am I replicating a pattern? Am I drawn to violent men? Do I recognise something in them? Christ, Dee, I wouldn't have a clue. She'd fallen silent. Eventually she'd said, What am I going to do? There's a saying that a tragedy isn't a choice between right and wrong. It's a choice between two rights. Yes, I knew it. 
Ma produced it fairly regularly, usually when she was trying to decide what to make for dinner. But, Dee had gone on, this is a choice between two wrongs. How so? If I do nothing, Angus Sprott will publish a story. My career will be over. Then I can't help anyone. But if I shop Paddy to the press, I'll be taken down with him. Then I can't help anyone. But if I sack him without making the reasons public, the voters will lose confidence and won't vote for us in the general election. Then I can't help anyone. Or if I can persuade him to stop sabotaging me and we carry on working together, it means I'm knowingly sharing power with a woman batterer. That's four wrongs, actually, I'd pointed out. Well, there you are. That's how big a tragedy it is. She'd leant back against her headrest and closed her eyes. I could nearly hear her brain clicking as she did various calibrations weighing up one unpalatable scenario against another. Politics is a filthy business, she'd murmured. I only ever wanted to help people. But even if you think you're incorruptible, even if you think your motives are entirely pure, you end up sullied. She'd opened her eyes and sat up straight, seemingly infused with new energy. I'm not a do-nothing sort of person, Grace. I had begun to feel uneasy. I was going to come out of this badly, I just knew. What is the least bad choice here? She looked at me. I'd look back at her. There had been fresh purpose in her eyes. She had started to scare me then. The least bad choice is that I put my personal qualms to one side and do a deal with Paddy. And that deal is, if he lays off the smear campaign, the women won't go public with their stories. But you'll have to persuade the women to be in on this. She looked at me surprised. Not me. You. You'll persuade them. Bollocks. Oh, bollocks, bollocks. But you know them, Grace. Your sister, that stylist. I'll try, but I can't promise, Dee. But you'll try your very best. You swear to me. Oh, for fuck's sake. Yes. Once she'd extracted a solemn vow from me, she'd sunk back into her torpor. God, but I'm depressed. She hadn't been the only feckin' one. Funnily enough, three of the four of us knew the code to Paddy's gate. Dee from working with him, Lola from when she was riding him, and me from the time I had interviewed Alicia. Once we were in, I parked three buildings away from Paddy's, on the opposite side of the road. Paddy and Alicia were out at some function. Dee, who knew their schedule, predicted they'd arrive home at around 10.45pm. It was now 10.38. I think we're too near his flat, Lola said anxiously. He might see us. I drove forward ten yards. Is that okay? No, Marnie said. Now we can't see. I forced back a sigh and reversed to my original spot. Here's someone, Marnie declared. A car had parked outside Paddy's block and the silhouette of a man emerged from the driver's side. Is it him? Lola's voice was shaking. Is it Paddy? No, Dee said. That's Sidney Brawley, dropping off tomorrow's papers. We watched as the silhouette dumped a bundle of stuff by the front door and hightailed it back to his car, did a screechy U-turn, and drove back the way he'd come. We all looked at the pile of papers. Is it safe to just leave them there? Lola asked. She's right, Marnie said. Anyone could come along and steal them. Would you steal Paddy de Courcy's newspapers? Dee asked. No. Well, there you are. Jesus, 
Here they are. It was 10.47. Instinctively, we all slid down in our seats like in a 70s cop show and watched as Paddy's Thab, driven by Spanish John, glided to a stop. We listened, sweaty with tension. At least I was. I suppose I can't speak for the others. As car doors opened and clapped shut and good nights were called to Spanish John, who drove towards us and passed us without displaying any interest. Covertly, we peeped at Paddy and Alicia disappearing into the building. We'll wait ten minutes, I said. Then we'll go in. Ten is too obvious, Marnie said. I say nine. Or eleven, Dee suggested. Okay, eleven, Marnie said. Lola said nothing. I was worried that she might puke. She kept swallowing and taking deep breaths. Every time I looked at her, I was seized with guilt for making her do this. Why does he do it? Lola suddenly asked. Why is he so cruel? His mother died when he was fifteen. Maybe he needs to punish all women for his mother's desertion, Marnie said to Lola. I've done lots of therapy, she added. Lots of people's mothers die when they're teenagers, Dee scoffed and they don't turn into power-mad women-beaters. Mine died when I was fifteen, Lola said, and I've never beaten anyone. God love her, she didn't look like she could beat an egg. And his father was emotionally repressed, Marnie said. Maybe he inherited that. Like I said. Lots of therapy, Dee asked. Yes. When the democratically elected eleven minutes had elapsed, I said, OK, let's go. We all climbed out and crossed the road. Dee shoved her face into the intercom camera and rang Paddy's bell. Paddy, it's Dee. I was just passing and wondered if I could have a quick word about tomorrow. Some bill or other was taking place the following day in the doll. Sure, come on up. The communal door clicked open, the four of us filed in, Dee wished us luck, and Marnie, Lola and I ascended the stairs to Paddy's flat. We arrayed ourselves before Paddy's door, me front and centre, Marnie slightly behind me and to my left, and Lola slightly behind me and to my right. Like Charlie's angels, Lola whispered, but Charlie's aegis would be closer to the truth. I wasn't scared, I was worse than scared. I'd entirely lost faith in the Enterprise. The three of us, Lola, Marnie and I, wouldn't alarm a mangy dog. Paddy mightn't let us in when he sees who we are, I said, although I suspected that was unlikely. Then the door opened and there was Paddy. There was a moment, just a moment, when his eyes went funny. They flickered over us, recognising all three of us at once and his pupils did something, went either big or small, depending on what's meant to happen when human beings discern danger. Then the next thing he was doing his Paddy on Parade smile. Grace Gildee, he said, as I live and breathe. He took my hand and leant forward to kiss me, pulling me into the warmth of his home. And you brought Marnie. Marnie, it's been years and years. Too long. A kiss on the cheek for Marnie, a kiss on the cheek for Lola, and he was welcoming us in. He looked, actually, genuinely delighted. It would have been better if he'd tried to slam the door shut on us, and we'd had to run at it and shoulder our way in. At least then we'd have had a bit of adrenaline behind us. Come in and sit down, he said. Let me call Alicia before she takes her makeup off. She'd be cross with me if she missed you. He disappeared down a corridor, and the three of us waited in the living room, Marnie in an armchair, and Lola and I on the edge of the couch. He's trying to unsettle us by being nice, I reminded them. Remember what he's done to you. Don't lose sight of it. Lola's knees were knocking. I took her hand. 
You're doing great. Sorry, she whispered. I should have worn jeans. I didn't know I'd be so scared. And remember, leave the talking to me. I'd practiced my speech with Dee. Practiced and practiced. She'd acted the part of me, and I'd played Paddy. Then she'd played Paddy, and I'd been me. And I was afraid that Lola was so overwrought that she might hijack the carefully scripted situation by flinging herself at Paddy's feet and begging him to take her back. Alicia will be here in a minute. Paddy had reappeared. Now, what can I get you to drink? Nothing, thanks, Paddy, I said, trying to make my voice sound deeper than it was. It's late. We don't want to take up too much of your time. I guess you're wondering what the three of us are doing here. Always delighted to have three beautiful women in my home, he said easily. Slowly and deliberately, and with a tiny hint of menace, I said, Paddy, the story you've planted with the press about D. Rossini harboring illegals. We want you to drop it. In an ideal world, he would say, Why would I drop it? Which would be my cue to say, If you drop your story, we'll drop ours. But he laughed and said, I haven't a clue what you're talking about. Drop it, Paddy. I said, trying to get the script back on track. And we'll drop ours. He was meant to ask what our story was, but he simply stretched one leg out and settled back in his armchair and smiled at me from under his eyelids. Smiled and ran a lazy gaze over my body, lingering on my nipples, wandering down to my crotch. Silence endured. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see Lola's knees chattering against each other with renewed energy. The door pushed open and Alicia walked into the silent room and her gracious smile froze. Anxiously, she asked, What's going on? I was just explaining to Paddy that if he drops the story implicating Dee Rossini in harbouring illegals, we'll drop our story about Paddy. What story is that? Alicia asked. Thanks be to Christ that someone around here knew their lines. Paddy hurts women. He punches them, kicks them and burns them. But you don't need me to tell you that, Alicia. She blanched. She thought she was the only one. And I knew then that this was going to work. What women? Alicia asked quickly. I indicated Lola and Marnie. Paddy gave a little chuckle. Who's going to believe that fashion flake with the purple hair? Shocked, Lola sucked in her breath. Why are you so cruel? Her voice was shaking. Lola, you couldn't seriously... I'm a politician. Almost kindly, he said. We had fun, didn't we? Fun? I'm a human being, Paddy, not a toy. So why behave like a toy? I'd lost Lola, right on target and shut down in flames. Paddy turned his attention to Marnie. Marnie Gildee. Still crazy after all these years. I... You hit Marnie, I said. He sighed. Anyone would hit Marnie. No, she had me driven mad. The crying, the fighting, calling round to my house day and night. But you made her like that. And you did it too. Then she slept with my best friend. He was like a brother to me. No long-term damage, though. Seeing as he's brokering dirty deals with the Globe on your behalf. I was saying that at the same time that Marnie was exclaiming at Paddy. But you slept with Leechy. You did it first. Paddy rolled his eyes at her and turned to me, as if we were the only two responsible adults in the room. It was all a long, long time ago, Grace. We were kids. Messed up kids. It's not going to fly. 
Is that the best you can do? This pair? No, actually, not just this pair, I said. It was time for my secret weapon. Everyone, even Paddy, I have to say, which was gratifying, looked startled. I leapt from my seat and grabbed Alicia's hands. I opened them both palm upwards, rock solid certain that one of them would have a small circular scar. But there was nothing there. Both her palms were unmarked. I shoved up her sleeves. No bruises. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Immediately, I moved away from Alicia, trying to pretend that I hadn't approached her at all, that the exercise of gazing at her palms had been a spontaneous but quickly abandoned attempt to tell her future. Center floor, all eyes on me, my heart was pounding so hard my ribs, my actual ribs, hurt. I'd been sure about Alicia. Now all my lifelines were gone. I had nothing, and my vision was misty from fear. It was like being in a nightmare where you're in the shop buying a scratch card and you suddenly look down and find that you're naked. I twisted about, seeking salvation. The only secret I had left would do as much harm as good if I revealed it. The ensuing fallout would be devastating. I couldn't do it. Who was D to me, anyway? Much as I admired her, she wasn't worth blowing my life up in my face for. Everyone was still looking at me expectantly, like this was a whodunit. Gripped by another wave of panic, I considered grabbing Lola and Marnie and hustling them out of the door and back down the stairs and across the road to the car. They'd be angry and confused, of course, but I'd take them for a pizza. Over the years, I'd noticed that pizza seemed to take the sting out of things for most people. Wine, too. They're a good double act. Then I'd explain everything. Well... Not everything, but part of everything, without giving anything away. And if they began to complain again, and they'd finished their pizza, I'd get them tiramisu, and more wine, and perhaps a Bailey's coffee. But the right thing needed to be done. And even if it didn't, pride wouldn't let me give in. I sighed. At the sound, everyone seemed to perk up with renewed keenness and resigned myself to whatever was going to happen. There's someone else, I said, the words like stones on my tongue. A third woman, who's prepared to tell her story. Who? Marnie asked. Yes, who? Lola asked. Poor Lola and Marnie. They were expecting me to pull something truly magical out of the hat. Some woman to walk through the door and declare silkily, Surely you haven't forgotten about the time you beat the shit out of me, Paddy. Yes. Who? Alicia asked. Paddy said nothing. He watched, a small smile on his mouth. Me, I said. You? Why would he hit you? Marnie asked. Because, there was no way out, I had to say it, I wouldn't sleep with him. My words fell into stunned silence. Paddy closed his eyes and smiled to himself. Did Paddy want to sleep with you? Marnie asked slowly, as if she was listening to herself speak. Paddy opened his eyes and said lasciviously, Oh, yeah. Marnie went the colour of death. Did you always fancy her? She whispered. Even when you were going out with me? Yeah. Paddy stretched lazily. Always. When I was fucking you, I was thinking of her. No, he wasn't. Don't mind him. He's just trying to turn us against each other. For God's sake, it was nearly 15 years since Marnie had gone out with Paddy. When was she going to stop behaving like it had just finished? Paddy and I were working together on his biography, and he put the moves on me because he does it to everyone. And when I didn't go for it, 
he gave me a slap, put a cigarette out on my hand, and told Spanish John to burn out my car. You were working on his biography, Marnie said faintly. Come on now, Grace, Paddy said. You were hardly fighting me off. When was this? Marnie asked, her voice thick. Last summer. Until September. September? Lola spoke up. But he got engaged to Alicia in August. Marnie rounded on Alicia. How do you feel about that, Leechy? Fine, Alicia said, because none of it is true. And don't call me Leechy. I always hated it. But he's just told you he wanted to sleep with Grace, Lola exclaimed. At the same time as Marnie said to Alicia, Well, I didn't name you Leechy. Someone who wasn't, some baby couldn't pronounce Alicia. My sister. So don't act like we decided to change your name. Everyone called you Leechy, for as long as we knew you. I'm Alicia now. Actually, Marnie said with uncharacteristic spite, Leechy suits you better. Because you were a leech, leeching around after Paddy. We were in danger of losing sight of our common purpose here. Marnie, I said, please. You were never my friends, Leechy said. I was always left out. It was always you and Grace, then me tacked onto the edge. You know, that really wasn't true. But before I got sucked into it, Paddy got to his feet. I'm off to bed. Wait, Paddy. I intercepted him at the door. We're not finished here yet. I tried to locate my slightly menacing voice once more. Like I said, you drop your story and we'll drop ours. He laughed softly and shook his head. Not in refusal, but at what a shambles the situation had descended into. I couldn't blame him. We'd failed. Quite spectacularly. In disarray, we departed the flat and thumped down the stairs, none of us speaking to each other, to break the bad news to Dee. Marnie wouldn't get in the car. Her face was closed and tight with humiliation. Dee and Lola, acknowledging the fracture between Marnie and me, had peeled away with talk of taxis and left us to it. Please get in the car, Marnie, I said. It was such an important relationship to me, she said. Can you imagine how I feel finding out he wanted to be with you? He didn't want to be with me when he was with you. He loved you. Slowly I drove alongside her. Please, Marnie, please get in, it's late. You can't just walk around. I won't stay in your house. Then let me drop you out to Maz. Please, Marnie, it's not safe. Eventually she got in and sat in rigid-backed silence. After ten minutes she asked coldly, Does Damien know about you and Paddy? I didn't sleep with him, I said. There's nothing for Damien to know. But something went on. Yes, something had gone on. You wanted to sleep with him. You considered it. You were emotionally involved. I said nothing, and she had her answer. I bet Damien doesn't know about that, she said. Please don't tell him. My voice was choked. She didn't reply, and I knew then that she might. I wouldn't have believed that this situation was possible. Marnie and I, our loyalty had always been to each other before everyone, anyone else. But everything was fucked up. Marnie was wounded and, with the drink and everything, she was a loose cannon. And Paddy de Courcy was in the mix, and he twisted and destroyed everything he came into contact with. When we reached Yeoman Road, Marnie got out of the car and ran up the steps without saying goodbye to me. Where's Marnie? Damien, tense and expectant, was waiting up for me. What happened with de Courcy? Oh, God, Damien. I didn't know where to start because I didn't know where I could end. 
I couldn't tell him everything, so I was afraid to tell him anything. I pressed myself against him and wound my arms around his neck. The terror of losing him was so huge that I had to physically cling to him. He pulled me into a tight hold and rested his head on mine. Tighter, I said. Obediently, his arms formed a harder band around my back. Was it a disaster? he asked into my hair. I nodded against his shoulder. A disaster. But I don't know if he'll link the leak to you. I think it might be okay. I genuinely thought it would be. Can we go to bed? I asked. Come on. He helped me up the stairs like I was someone recovering from pneumonia. In the bedroom, I stepped out of my clothes, leaving them where they'd landed on the floor, and climbed between the sheets. Then Damien got in, and I curled myself around him, against his hard, warm body, like it might be the last chance I'd ever get. I closed my eyes and became very still, wishing I could stay in that moment forever. Then Damien shifted and pulled back far enough to look into my face. So, are you going to tell me what happened? Would you mind? Could we leave it for tonight? I'm just so... He looked disappointed. Hurt. Something. Sorry, I backtracked. I couldn't not tell him. Not after all he'd done to help. What am I thinking? Of course I'll tell you. But I couldn't tell him everything, and that made me so unbearably sad. Then unbearably frightened. No, leave it, he said. You're wrecked. Go to sleep. Tell me in the morning. The funny thing is, there's nothing really to tell. He totally belittled Marnie and Lola. They just fell apart. They'd be no good in any interview. And he obviously hasn't laid a hand on Alicia. It was a fiasco. He's unscarable. De Corsi. Damien turned out the light and sighed into the darkness. It's a mistake to tangle with him. Yes. I knew. When I picture it in my head, and I don't do it often, there is a soundtrack. An orchestra of lush strings swelling, building to a climax which bursts into the fullness of its rich beauty as I turn and see Paddy for the first time. I was almost 17 years old, and Mick the manager was introducing me to the barman the night I started work at the boatman. That's John Zer, Mick said. John Zer, say hello to Grace. Jonzer stared like I was the first human being he'd ever seen. His arms hung loosely by his sides, but his fists were clenched, and one malevolent eye was set lower in his face than the other. Deliverance banjos plucked a few chords in my head. And that's Wacker, Mick said. Wacker, Grace, new bar girl, lives in Yeoman Road. Wacker opened his mouth and bared his teeth in a snarl. And over there, Mick said, that's Paddy. My breathing, which had been going about its rhythmic business year in, year out, causing me no worry whatsoever, suddenly seized up and broke down, and I was paralysed by the devastating combination of Paddy's beauty, his life force, and his dazzling smile. I was so overawed that I thought Paddy should be the boatman's manager. It seemed contrary to the natural order of things that he was just a barman. He was obviously so far superior in every way to runty, unpleasant Mick that I had a little conversation in my head where I agreed with myself that if I was the boatman's owner, I'd sack Mick and replace him with Paddy. Thanks to Ma's indoctrination, I didn't believe in love at first sight. However, one look from Paddy had been enough to turn me into Queen Sap, even worse than Leechy, officially the most self-confessed sappy girl Marnie or I had ever met. I wanted him more than I had ever wanted anything, and I was terrified that I wouldn't get him. The normal thing would be to talk about it, but I was trying to make sense myself of the cataclysmic effect he had on me before I told anyone else. I couldn't contemplate hours of girly analysis with Marnie and Leachy, lying on the bed, thinking up ways to make Patty fancy me. 
My urge for him was immeasurably more visceral and adult than any of the other crushes I'd had. And there was one thing I was certain of. Sparkly mascara was not the answer. Another reason I kept my mouth shut was that Ma, Dad and Bid, especially Bid, would have laughed at me. Everyone assumed that I was as tough as old boots. And if I was ever foolish enough to reveal any weakness, the reaction was mild hilarity. Over the years, I'd learned to never bother with tears, because all I got was chuckles and, look at you crying there like a great big eejit. However, my paddy obsession came dangerously close to being unmasked when I asked Ma and Bid, How do you get a man to notice you? Ma's advice was, Be yourself. Bid's advice was, Don't wear a bra. Be myself. So who was I? I was the uncomplicated, robust one, so I decided to play to my strengths. No feminine wilds for me. When Paddy loaded up a tray with ten pints of lager and asked, Need a hand with that, Grace? I said stoutly, Not at all, and hoisted it off the counter, my arms trembling with the strain. I was subsequently to see Marnie refuse to carry any tray with more than four glasses on it and have barmen tripping over themselves in their desire to help. I did every shift I was asked to do, in the hope of coinciding with Paddy's. I was almost afraid to consider it, but I thought he liked me. The night he slipped an ice cube down my back and we had a minor wrestling match, which left me breathless and elated, I was nearly sure of it. The most important thing I needed to establish was whether or not he had a girlfriend. I lay on my bed plotting and planning. Ask Johnzer. Ask Wacker. Ask any of the other equally horrible barmen. I realised I could just ask Paddy. So, Paddy. I flipped the lid off a bottle of tonic, caught it and tossed it over my shoulder into the bin. You have a girlfriend? Good shot, he said. No. Why, you offering? You wish. I picked up my tray and swung past him. I do, actually, he said to my retreating back. I laughed over my shoulder. Dream on. You're breaking my heart. Later at home in my bedroom, I unwrapped those words like they were precious jewels and listened to them again and again. I do, actually. You're breaking my heart. I was building a connection with him, like constructing a house of cards, trembling with terror every time I added a new one in case it sent the whole edifice collapsing into disarray. We had lots in common. He was interested in politics. I was interested in politics. Well... I wasn't really, but I knew about them. And we were an obvious physical match. Not many girls were five foot nine. When I was subsequently discarded in favour of a five foot nothing, I felt like a shamefully massive, lumbering lunk who couldn't fit through doorways and who broke chairs when she sat on them. The night of my birthday, Marnie's and my seventeenth, I added another card to the house by proposing to introduce him to the most important person in my life. My twin sister will be in later. It's our birthday. Your twin? There are two of you. One Grace Gildee is bad enough. I flicked water from the running tap at his face and he recoiled, laughing. Are you going out later to celebrate? Am I invited? Why would we invite an Egypt like you? Ah, go on, Grace. No. Ah, please. What part of the word no don't you understand? I was almost pitifully pleased with that particular line, thinking at the height of sophisticated flirting. Then in came Marnie, and with one look she swept away all that I had built up so carefully and doggedly and grabbed the prize. There was a moment when I felt I had a choice, that if I put up a fight I was in with a chance. Then I copped on to myself. Paddy wanted Marnie. But even if he hadn't, Marnie wanted him, and I could never deny her anything. It was hard, though. I saw them at work and I saw them at home. There was no escape. I had to witness him kissing her and holding her hand and giggling with her. I had to listen to her graphic accounts of their fabulous sex. And then he pulled my legs up around his waist and, Grace, I swear to God. 
but I got used to thinking of him as Marnie's. Now and then I had unexpected moments when I remembered the connection I'd felt with him, but I realised I must have been delusional. They were together for nearly three years, and I knew Paddy had stopped loving Marnie before she did. It was the spring before our twentieth birthdays. Paddy was in his final year in college, he was due to begin training as a barrister in October, and it was obvious, to me at any rate, that he was ready to move on to the next part of his life. I tried to warn Marnie, but she was unreachable. In a way, it was as bad as if he'd fallen out of love with me. Her pain was mine. Then Sheridan told me that there was more going on with Paddy and Leachy than their platonic comforting sessions. I couldn't believe it. Leachy was like a sister to Marnie and me. But Sheridan insisted it was true, insisted with such force that, even though it was none of my business, I went to Leachy and asked her to stay away from Paddy. Leachy was always eager to please, but instead of acceding, she said surprisingly firmly, No, Grace, I'm Paddy's new girlfriend. New girlfriend? I was stunned. But he already has a... I gazed at her and the full truth dawned on me. Are you... Are you... Sleeping with him? No. She coloured. You are. Oh, God. God, oh, God, 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 I groaned, overwhelmed with fear. What would Marnie say? What would Marnie do? Leechy, please stop. You've got to. Where's your loyalty? Normally I would be loyal, she said. Normally I'd never take another girl's man. I felt like saying, normally you wouldn't get the fucking choice. You're not exactly Cindy Crawford. What about Marnie? I begged. She's been your friend since you were five. Marnie and Paddy are over, she said with quiet confidence. I'm his type. I'm sensible and steady, and I like the carpenters. Marnie was just a teenage thing. Beachy, you're imagining it. I wanted to tell her how I'd once thought his type was robust and mouthy, how I was certain that he was simply using the consequences of sleeping with her to somersault himself out of Marnie's life. I love him, Grace, she said with continued confidence, and that was that. I blamed Paddy, but I blamed Leachy more. If she hadn't slept with Paddy, Marnie wouldn't have been unhinged enough to sleep with Sheridan. And if she hadn't slept with Sheridan, Paddy wouldn't have pummeled her into unconsciousness. An event that I think altered her forever. It was over four years before I saw him again. It was at a work thing, an early evening launch of something, in a crowded hotel function room. Suddenly he was there, taller than everyone else. He didn't look poor and wild anymore. His clothes radiated newness and money but it was definitely him. I stared for half a second too long, enough time for him to see me. Shock stamped itself on his face. He went white, and his expression froze. I turned my back to him. Gotta go, I said to the cluster of people I was with. Why? I abandoned my glass on a passing tray and zigzagged through the throng, making for the door. By the time I reached it, Paddy was blocking my path. Grace. I dipped my head and moved sideways, but with one lithe move he was in front of me there also. Grace, it is you, isn't it? I swiveled in another direction, but once again he was ahead of me. Grace, please, is this how you treat an old friend? What? I jerked my head up. You're no friend of mine. It was a mistake to look at him. He was a picture of anguish. Grace, please. Beseechingly, he said, You and I have always been friends. Friends? I was disgusted. After what you did to Marnie? My loud outrage attracted a couple of startled looks. Paddy noted them. Can we talk? He asked quietly. Work away. I folded my arms. I'm all ears. Not here. 
somewhere a bit more private. Where I can explain. There couldn't be an explanation. But curiosity was always my downfall. Maybe there really was something that would make sense of it all. There's a private bar here in the hotel, he said. Will you give me ten minutes of your time? He made it so easy. If I'd had to go any distance in his company, I wouldn't have done it. And what was ten minutes? In the hushed, wood-panelled comfort of the snug bar, Paddy placed a drink in front of me. You've six minutes left, I said. In that case, I'd better make it quick. Okay, I, I was young and... and off my head and very angry. My mother had died, my father was such a nut job. It's no excuse! I'm not trying to excuse myself, I'm just trying to explain. He hung his head. I had no home. That's the only way I can put it. A long pause ensued before he spoke again. When I met Marnie, she became my home. All of you, really. You and Bid and your mum and dad. Another period of silence. But when I stopped, when it happened that I didn't love Marnie any more, I blamed her. I thought I'd stopped loving her because she was weak. If she'd been a different person, I'd still be in love with her. But she wasn't. And I wasn't, and once again my home was gone. I was surprised to feel a little bud of sorrow for him. Then I remembered Marnie's swollen, battered face, and it vanished. I've been haunted by shame, he said. Good enough for you. And why are you telling me? You should be telling Marnie. He hesitated. I've thought about it. I still think about it. But knowing what I know, knew, of Marnie, if I got in touch, I think it would open old wounds. I reckon I'd make things worse, not better. The very annoying part was that he was right. If Marnie was to hear from him now, it would set her back years. But I'm never entirely sure. It's something I think about and I wonder. And on that fascinating note, I swallowed the remains of my drink and got to my feet. Your ten minutes are up. How is she? he asked. Marnie? Fine, I said. Far better without you. You were shit to her. I had to be. It was the only way of ending it. She would never have accepted it otherwise. Once again, he was right. She's a very special girl, he said wistfully. Will you stay for one more drink and tell me how she is? No. Please? No. Oh, all right. I had nothing else to do. Well, that was how I justified it to myself. Paddy bought more drinks and went on to talk with such kindness about Marnie, such sadness about how sensitive she was, how hard she found it to be happy that, to my eternal shame, I half agreed with him. The clang of a metal barrel interrupted Paddy's flow of words. God, that takes me back, he said. We watched as the barman changed the barrel. Remember we used to do that in the boatman? I nodded, abashed by the memory of me lugging heavy stuff around the pub in an attempt to impress him. What a gobshite I'd been. You were the only girl who could change a barrel, he said. You were like this amazing Amazon. Spectacular. Nothing daunted you. I was stunned. I had always thought that hoiking things around like a stevedore was what had put Paddy off. I'd never before met a woman like you, he mused. I couldn't look at him. I swallowed so loud we both heard it, and my Adam's apple leapt up and down like a piston. I've never met one since. Christ! I attempted a sideways glance at him, and when our eyes met, emotion surged between us. Resistant though I was, and I was, all I had to do was think of Marnie's swollen, battered face, I felt we were intimates, like he and I truly understood each other, the way we had been before he'd met Marnie. Another drink, he said. No, I'm going. Sure. Go on. Just one more. 
I hesitated, then gave in. Oh, okay, just one. When he returned from the counter, he placed our drinks on the table, then turned to me and said, I've got something to say, and if I don't say it now, I'll never say it. I had a fair idea of where this was going. I made a mistake, he said. I picked the wrong sister. I closed my eyes. Don't. Even if he hadn't done the terrible things he'd done to Marnie, it was taboo to get involved with your sisters or friends, old boyfriends. He would always be hers. Come home with me, he said. I was convulsed by longing. I would have given my all for just one night with him. One night of his naked body. One night of dirty, tender, heart-aching sex in every conceivable position. One night of him thrusting into me, his face contorted with lust for me, me, me. No, I said. No? No. The picture of Marnie in the hospital wouldn't go away. I grabbed my bag and got up to leave. You'll change your mind, he said. I'll persuade you. Not me, I said, wondering what he'd do to convince me. But nothing happened. I didn't hear from him again. Not a word for another eleven years. Plenty of time for me to reflect on my refusal. Then, last summer, I got a phone call from Annette Babcock, the commissioning editor of Palladian, a publishing house that specialised in celebrity autobiographies. I'd ghostwritten a couple of books for them in the recent past, a sportswoman's life story and the trials and tribulations of a woman who was once Miss Ireland and who'd had 28 cosmetic surgery operations to keep her modelling career on track. It was the sort of work hacks often do on the side, what with most sports people or models, or indeed politicians, being borderline illiterate. The work was intensive, also soul-destroying, as you tried to transmute someone's dull life and tedious anecdotes into readable prose, but the money could be good. Can you come in? Annette said. I've a job for you. When I was sitting in front of her, she said, We're doing Paddy de Courcy's book. Jesus, I thought, Paddy de Courcy. We think you'd be the right writer to do it. It'll mean spending a lot of time with Paddy over the next month, but that's no hardship, is it? Is it, she repeated, and I didn't reply. What? Oh, sorry, just thinking there. I cleared my throat. I had plenty of questions. First and foremost, why me? Don't let it go to your head, Annette said snippily. Clearly she fancied him. It's not like he requested you. We've a panel of writers we use. We put a few names to him. He said he'd read The Human Race, the sportswoman story. He said he liked your work. Did he? The thing was that I'd sort of forgotten about Paddy de Courcy. I mean, not entirely. It'd be bloody hard to, the way he was always on the news or had his handsome mug grinning out from the social pages. At times when I saw him, I got a surprised little twist of something in my gut. But most times I felt nothing at all. Well? Annette asked. You in? I don't know. What? I was confused. Was this not risky for Paddy? I knew stuff about him that probably no other journalist knew. But maybe that was why he'd decided on me. Because he wouldn't have to fess up about putting Marnie in hospital and shock the bejesus out of me. Maybe he knew he'd have to include it in the book, but thought he could get me to do a nice, sanitised version. Or maybe I was overthinking this. Maybe Marnie was so far back in his distant past that he'd totally forgotten what he'd done. Maybe he really had liked my work on the human race. Maybe this really was just a job. The money's good, Annette said anxiously. She threw a figure at me, and in fairness, she was right. I can try to get you another couple of grand. Yes, but... I was all mixed up. Why would I help Paddy? The thought of working with him, 
of letting him benefit from my writing skills made me feel disloyal and uncomfortable. Then my crusading spirit took over. Maybe I could get justice for Marnie fifteen years after the event. I thought about it a bit longer, and the conviction that something good could come of this got stronger. OK, I said to Annette, I'll do it. A little bit more enthusiasm, if you don't mind, she said. Personally, I'd be creaming myself at the thought of all that time with Paddy. I closed my eyes. Christ, did she have to? Now listen to me, Grace. This is a highly confidential project, because of the danger of pre-publication injunctions from other politicians. Tell no one. My lips are sealed. The minute I got home, I told Damien. His autobiography? Damien was deeply suspicious. Why? He's done nothing except shag models. He's not the leader of a party. He hasn't even been a minister. The world of celebrity autobiographies has changed, I shrugged. You don't need to have done anything. All you have to be is good looking. Damien was watching me, his face still, his eyes bleak. Why did you say you'd do it, Grace? After what he did to Marnie? That's precisely why. I'm wondering if I can get, I don't know, something for Marnie. Even an apology. It was a long time ago, Damien said quietly. Marnie's married now, the mother of two children. She mightn't want any of this made public. She mightn't want anything to do with him. And then again, she might. Perhaps you should talk to her before you go any further. I've already said I'll do it. He shrugged. You can change your mind. You haven't signed anything. No. I know. But I just feel I have to do this. It was such a big thing to happen to Marnie and me, I said. I know you can't understand because you weren't there, but this feels like a chance, I don't know, to... Oh, I don't know, Damien. I sighed heavily. To undo something bad. My words fell into silence. How could I make him understand? The hook was in my flesh. Despite my suspicions and my fears of disloyalty, I had to do this. Don't look so sad, I pleaded. Damien gave a rueful little laugh. He knew all about my teenage thing for Paddy. Okay, I said, okay, okay, if you really don't want me to do it, just say it and I won't. Grace. Then I felt ashamed. Damien would never make that sort of request. He wasn't that kind of man. Shaking his head, he began to walk away. The money's good, I called after him. Great, his voice floated back to me. We'll buy lots of things. Our first session to discuss the structure of the book was held at Paddy's office. I'd forgotten what it was like to be within breathing distance of him. His size. Those eyes. That presence, oh, charisma, whatever you want to call it. Such a perfect, powerful, physical presence. There was so much of him, concentrated into just one human being, like really strong coffee or dark, dark chocolate. It was almost unbearable. He shook my hand and kissed me lightly on the cheek. I'm delighted we'll be working together. God, you're such a politician, I complained. Where am I sitting? Wherever you like. On the couch, if you want. Your casting couch. My couch. I took a hard-backed chair, muttering under my breath that it was probably safest. Patty sat behind his desk, and I opened my yellow pad. Defiantly, I said, First things first. Will we be including the episode where you hospitalised my sister? Still the same grace, Paddy said, but without rancour. Always championing a cause. But I think it's best if we draw a veil over that youthful episode. Oh, I see. That's why you asked for me, as I'd suspected. If you think I'm going to protect you, you can so forget it. I stood up to leave. Not to protect me. Sit down, Grace, would you? To protect Marnie. You think she'd want that printed in a book? 
That's what Damien had said. Would she? he asked again. I didn't know. I hadn't asked her. Slowly I sat back down. But if I wasn't doing this project as Marnie's champion, why was I here? The money's good, Paddy said, reading my thoughts. Come on, Grace. We've both got a job to do. Let's do it. The money was good. I'd recently bought a new car and the repayments were high. I picked up my pen again and, to my surprise, we worked for three hours and made good steady progress. This was just a job, I realised, and it was going to be fine. Our second session was five days later and once again the work was productive. We'd covered his childhood and had got as far as the death of his mother when all of a sudden Paddy stopped talking and bowed his head. When he looked up again, his eyes were swimming with tears. Normally I would think, a man crying, how funny. But perhaps because I'd known him back then, in the aftermath of his mother's death, how lost and wild he'd been, I felt unexpectedly sad for him. I passed him a Burger King napkin from my bag and roughly he wiped his eyes. Within moments he was himself again. Well, that was embarrassing. He laughed. He looked at the napkin. Hold the front page. Grace Gildee was kind. I am kind. I was defensive. To those who deserve it. I know you are. You know, Grace, he gave me the full benefit of his blue gaze. I came to Palladian because of you. What? Talk about an abrupt change of subject. I've always followed your progress. I've always known which paper you were working for. I've always read your stuff. Why are you telling me this? Because in all these years, I've never stopped thinking about you. An involuntary thrill flamed from my toes to the roots of my hair. I've thought about you every single day. You're the only woman who could ever match me. I didn't want to be, but I was flattered. I was excited. Just like that, I was right back in it. The teenage me had been reactivated, and I was dreamy and distracted and half-blind with lust for Paddy. But that night I couldn't sleep. There was no way round the truth. My attraction to Paddy was a bad, bad thing, dangerous and dirty. It was a long time ago, maybe he's changed. What about Damien? What Damien and I had was rare and good. Instinctively, I knew what had to be done. I would end my involvement in the project. But when I met Paddy to tell him to find another writer, it was as if he'd been anticipating it. Before I got to open my mouth, he closed his office door and said, Don't, Grace. Don't abandon me. But, please, you're the only one I trust to tell the truth. I need you. I couldn't help it. He made me feel too important to him to resign. That day's work and our next session two days later were conducted in such a state of sexual tension that I couldn't think straight. Our early progress had slowed to almost nothing, but I didn't care. I was locked inside myself, in a process of constant negotiation. I just wanted one night. One night I had been owed from eleven years earlier. Or eighteen years earlier. It wouldn't mean I didn't love Damien. At home, Damien watched me and said nothing, and I managed to convince myself that he hadn't noticed anything. Until one evening at home after work, when a New Age catalogue had come in the post and we were picking out the courses we'd most hate to do. Tribal drumming would be horrific, I said, laughing with cringy glee. Imagine the types you'd get. For me, he said. My very, very worst one would be, let's see, here we are. Release your locked emotions through song. An entire weekend of it. Jesus. Now I know what to get you for your birthday. Grace, I'll just say one thing. Alerted by his sudden change of tone, I looked at him. 
What's up with you? If one of us cheated, Christ, I hate that word, he said. We might survive it, but things would always be different. The trust would be gone. The innocence. I... The obvious reply would be to ask what had prompted his statement. But I couldn't go down that road. He hadn't accused me of anything. That was what was important. And in fairness, I hadn't done anything. Okay, Damien. I know that. Good. Good. B because I'd hate to think... He seemed about to say something else, and I willed him not to. Because I love you, you know? My usual response when he told me he loved me was to ask him if he was coming down with something. But this time I just said, I know you do. Then swept along by a sudden deep rush of love and gratitude, I said, I love you too. Careful, he said. We don't want to turn into heart to heart. We both laughed, a little nervously. The following day I had another meeting with Paddy. The sun was bursting from the sky and he was waiting outside for me, watching me whiz into the allocated parking space. I got it first time, one smooth, confident swerve, my car landing exactly equidistant from the four white lines, a perfect bit of parking in my perfect car on this perfect day. Nice work, Paddy said, not even pretending to hide his appreciation. All down to the car, I laughed. You love your car? he asked. I love my car. In his office, I sat at the desk to start work, and Paddy said, So what about you and Damien? What about us? I couldn't help sounding defensive. Still in love? Yes. You wouldn't think of breaking it off with him? Why would I do that? So you could be my girl. We'd be fabulous together. Look. He scribbled a number on a piece of paper. This is my private mobile number. My private private number. Only my personal trainer has it. Have a think about what I said. He shrugged. If you make any decisions, ring me any time, day or night. I was unable to speak. The nerve of him. And yet I was shamefully flattered. Unless he was just playing games. I'm completely serious, he said. I know you don't believe me, but I'm going to keep on saying it until you do. You're the only woman I've ever met who can match me. I nearly puked, with longing and shame and shame and longing. Three days later, the news broke that Paddy was getting married, and I admit it. I felt like I'd been jolted with a stun gun. He owed me nothing, no promises had been made, but he'd behaved as if... The dislocating shock was compounded by the discovery that his bride would be leechy. It was my ego, I told myself. That's what it was. Wounded because I thought I was special to him. He rang me. Is it true? I asked. Grace, is it true? Yes, but I disconnected. He rang again. I switched my phone off. Then I found out about Lola. While interviewing Captain of Industry Marcia Fitzgibbon for My Favourite Insult, she complained that her stylist was on drugs, screwing up work left, right and centre, and insisting that Paddy de Courcy was her boyfriend. If you could see this woman, Marcia told me, I mean, her hair is purple. It was easy to track Lola down. She wouldn't confirm that she'd been seeing Paddy and, paradoxically, that was proof that she had. Feeling more and more stupid, I rang Palladian and told them I was out of the project. They kicked up, but there was nothing they could do because the contract hadn't yet been signed. For the next two or three weeks, Paddy continued to ring me, and I never answered his calls. Until one day, on some whim I didn't understand, I did. Just hear me out, he said. And although I hadn't a clue how he was going to talk his way out of things, 
My curiosity, as always, was what did for me. My office, he suggested. Okay. I'll send Spanish John. I'll walk. Paddy's assistant showed me into an empty room. He wasn't even there waiting for me. I shouldn't have come. I lit a cigarette, the flame of my lighter trembling, and decided to count to sixteen. Why sixteen? No idea. If he hadn't appeared by then, I was off. One, two. There he was. Firmly, he shut his office door behind him, and his presence filled the room. Congratulations, I stood up, on your forthcoming marriage. Look, I know. He looked abject. But it doesn't have to change anything. Grace, I, I don't even love her, he said. Much as I despised Leechy, I wondered how anyone could be so callous. I'm a politician, Grace. I need a suitable wife. I'm sorry for not telling you personally. What happened was I asked to see some rings. The jeweller leaked the story. It was out there before even I knew it. We can carry on as before. He had stolen closer to me, close enough to take the cigarette from my hand and put it in an ashtray. Softly, he said, better than before. When are you going to put me out of my misery? I want you so much it's killing me. Sleep with me, Grace. Sleep with me. He put his hands on my hips and, bending his knees slightly, pressed his erection against my pubic bone and murmured into my ear, That's how you make me feel. Always. All the time. He whispered, Think of us in bed together, Grace. Like I thought of anything else these days. It was as if I was hypnotised, and I was suddenly certain that I was going to sleep with Paddy. The moment I had fantasised about for years was upon me. But why now? Now that he was getting married to someone else? That, strangely, was the reason. The shock news had showed me how much I wanted him. We moved closer. The heat of Paddy's breath was on my mouth. He was going to kiss me. But Damien... My body was opening in response to the look of intent in Paddy's eyes. Almost swooning from his nearness, I closed my eyes, then his tongue was in my mouth and mine was in his, and we kissed. What about Damien? Paddy's hand was on my breast, his fingers seeking my nipple, his body hard and warm against mine. Damien! My knees were buckling with desire. Then, in my head, I saw Marnie, her face purple and swollen. I opened my eyes and wrenched myself away. No, Paddy, I'm not doing this. It came from nowhere. A slap with his open hand across my face, catching my eye socket with his ring. The force of it sent me staggering to the floor. I felt wetness beneath my left eye, and for one humiliated moment I thought I was crying. It was actually a relief to wipe my hand across my cheek and find it covered in blood. You probably won't need stitches, he said, almost like an apology. How do you know, I said thickly. You do this often? I'd intended to be sarcastic, but from the way he was considering me as if weighing up how much of a liability I was, I realised that actually, yes, he did do this often. Marnie might have been the first, but there had been others since her. I gaped then dropped my gaze because I thought it might be safer not to look at him. If you ever tell anyone, he said, I'll kill you. Okay? Okay, he said, louder this time. I was mopping the blood off my face, astonished at its quantity and redness. Okay. He knelt beside me. I thought he was about to help me to get up, and I was preparing to shrug him away. With one hand he took my cigarette from the ashtray, and with his other, clasped my wrist. Our eyes met, and after a freeze frame of disbelief, I knew what he wanted to do. No! 
Frenziedly, I tried to scoot backwards across the floor. Yes. He pinned me down, kneeling on my forearm, bringing the burning red tip onto the centre of the palm of my hand. It was quick and terrible, immeasurably worse than I could have imagined. But more horrific than the physical pain was that I'd been marked by him forever. I barely remember leaving his office. Out on the street I lurched on leaden legs through the crowds of Kildare Street, and without having consciously decided to, I gravitated towards the peace of Stephen's Green, where, incapable of anything else, I sat on a bench. Everything had slowed down. All my thoughts were dragging. I'm in shock, I realised. I'm in shock. My face was still bleeding, not pumping blood like it had initially, but there was a steady stream that kept using up tissues. I'd hold one against my cheek, and a little while later I'd look at it and see that it was red and falling apart. Then I'd get a fresh one. How strange that I had a packet of tissues in my bag, I thought, feeling very far away. I'm so not a packet of tissues person. But when I'd looked for them in my bag, there they'd been. Like, like, little helping things. My hand pulsed with pain, a shocking, somehow menacing pain, so severe that I thought I might vomit. And then my rage came into focus, red and hot and thick, gathering might and viscosity. Fucking Paddy de Courcy. I was sickened, quite literally sickened by what he'd done to me. It was unbearably humiliating. He had used his superior strength on me, and I hadn't been able to do a thing about it. I'd simply had to take it. But he was fucked now. As soon as I was able, I was going to hail a taxi and tell them to take me to the nearest cop shop. There was one in Pier Street, and I was going to get him arrested for assault. He would regret having fucked with me, I promised myself with bitter resolve. He'd be sorry he'd ever thought he could get the better of me. I wasn't just some stupid girl who was so mad about him that she'd keep shtum. I've never forgotten you. I've always known where you were working. I've always read your articles. All that stuff he'd said to me when we were first working on the book, which had soft-soaped me into giddiness even while I wondered if he was just telling me what I wanted to hear, I was now certain was true. But instead of being flattered, I thought it was sinister. Maybe he hadn't cared about me when I was a teenager, but I was sure now that that time, eleven years ago, when I wouldn't go home with him, had left a barb. Paddy de Courcy probably didn't get turned down very often. Since then, he'd probably regarded me as unfinished business. Not a priority, I wasn't that important, but something on his back burner, a grudge to be avenged if the chance ever presented itself. Then I was on my last tissue. I couldn't stay on the bench any longer. It was time to get up and make my way to Pierce Street. I got to my feet, and maybe it was because I was finally in motion, putting my thoughts into action, that I suddenly understood that I couldn't shop Paddy to the police. All the threats I'd made in my head were just bravado, because I knew the exact conversation I'd have with the desk sergeant. Why did Mr. de Courcy assault you? because he was angry with me. And why was he angry with you? Because I wouldn't sleep with him. And had you given Mr. de Courcy reason to think you might sleep with him? Probably. Yes. I couldn't do it. Not because I thought Paddy was in the right, far bloody from it, but because Damien would find out what had been going on. I'd lose him. And with that, I knew I was fucked. I had to suck it up. I had to take it. I had to keep my mouth shut. I sat down again, feeling like I was going to rip open with helplessness and frustration and fuckedness. This is what it means to implode, I thought. This feeling of bursting, but no relief. I clapped my left hand, the one he hadn't burnt, over my mouth and shrieked into it. 
I screamed until tears burst from my eyes and my head began to clear and I saw what I had to do. I had to go back to work. No grand gestures, no taxi hailing, no commands to be taken to the nearest police station, no ringing declarations that I wanted to report a crime. I just had to do the do and act normally and go back to work. But how am I going to explain my face? My hand? What am I going to tell people? What am I going to tell Damien? I tried to piece a story together. Someone bumped into me? Someone was running and came flying at me and knocked me over. But then I'd have fallen backwards, no? And hit the back of my head, not the side of my face. Okay, how about someone ran into me from behind? Yes, better. I'd have fallen on my face. But how would that explain the burn on my hand? I searched and searched in my head and eventually thought, Okay, how about this? I'd tripped on a loose paving stone, I'd tumbled and banged my face, I'd dropped my cigarette, and my hand landed on it. It was crap, but it would have to do. I tried it out on the motherly woman working in the chemist in Dawson Street. Those footpads are a disgrace, she said. You certainly took a nasty tumble. The wound in your face might need a butterfly stitch. You should go to outpatients. No, it wasn't that bad. I wouldn't let it be that bad. Could you just put a plaster on it? I asked. Some savlon and a plaster? Just to stop the bleeding. It's up to yourself. I'm only saying it because I wouldn't want it to scar. A lovely looking girl like you. I would have wept at her kindness if I'd been that sort of person. She wiped some antiseptic along my cheek. You're a brave one, she said. I thought that would sting. It had. But I didn't want to show it because, yes, I knew it was stupid. I felt Paddy would be winning yet another round. Your cheekbone, the woman said. It obviously took a hard crack there. It'll bruise up in a day or so. Black and blue for the next week. Just so as you know. Cancel any photo shoots. Back at work, TC, Jacinta and the rest of them weren't exactly compassionate. They just found it too funny. But they blithely accepted the loose paving stone explanation. So by the time I saw Damien at home that evening, my story was smooth well-rehearsed and obviously convincing because he was concern itself. He cooked dinner, he went out and got a DVD, he opened a bottle of wine, and after a couple of glasses, I became giddy with unexpected elation. Damien and I were okay. Damien and I had been saved. I'd been so stupid. I'd been infected with decorsiitis. I'd run the most idiotic, incredible risk. But it was over now. It had passed, and Damien and I were safe. I wouldn't think about what Paddy had done to me. I wouldn't even let myself be angry. I would simply be grateful that I still had Damien. The alarm clock rang, and I woke with a jolt, plunged right into the horror of the previous night. The spectacular failure of the confrontation with Paddy. Marnie's cold rage. Damien's questions. My entire body, even the soles of my feet, felt like it had been beaten up. The adrenaline of the past few days had taken its toll. I stretched out a weary arm. Damien's side of the bed was empty. It wasn't even warm. He'd obviously reset the clock and left ages ago. It felt like an omen. In the cold light of day, I knew, full and terrible and certain, that Damien was going to find out about Paddy and me. I'd known it last night, but it seemed worse, truer, today. Marnie was so angry she'd probably tell Damien. Christ, maybe she'd already told him. Maybe she'd called him at work. Maybe, even now, he knew. My heart almost seized up in my chest at the thought. And if Marnie didn't tell, de Courcy would. Again, maybe he'd already done it. After last night, there was bound to be some sort of comeback from him. He would find some way to hurt me, to punish me, and the easiest thing would be to take away the person I treasured the most. 
The whole appalling scenario played in my head like a horror film. Damien's pain, his grief, his bitterness at having been betrayed by me. He wouldn't be able to forgive me, I was certain of it. It was such a stretch for him to trust people. And once that fragile trust was broken, it couldn't be repaired. I was panting, actually panting with fear. This couldn't happen. But I had no way of stopping it. One thing I was sure of, I couldn't let Damien find out from someone else. I'd have to tell him myself. Maybe tonight? But, oh my God, the thought of it. I was trapped in a nightmare. And the thing was, this entire situation, it was no one's fault but mine. I'd made it happen, hadn't I? Quite apart from my carry-on with Paddy. I hadn't had to get involved when Damien told me about the press and their story about D, had I? I didn't have to appoint myself as D's unofficial investigator. I didn't have to start poking my nose into secret newspaper deals. I didn't have to start rounding up Paddy's old girlfriends. But I had. I liked D. I admired her, and any sort of injustice fired me up. But when the chips were down, what was D to me? A connection to Paddy. That's what she was. Probably the reason I'd asked to interview her all those months ago. Why I'd been so pleased when she invited Damien and me over for off ends pasta. And definitely why I'd got embroiled in this political skullduggery. But what the hell was wrong with me? I'd had the audacity to get irritated with poor Marnie's long-lived attachment to Paddy, but was I any better? I knew what he was capable of, and I still thought I could take him on. And now, big surprise, my life had blown up in my face. Last night, Dee had tried to be art of war about the disastrous showdown. We can learn from our mistakes, she said. But I didn't believe in that sort of thing. I preferred not to make mistakes in the first place. And if I did make them, I'd rather cover them up and pretend they'd never happened. God, I'd been so wrong about Leechy. I was certain she'd have a cigarette scar on her hand. Because she'd been the person who'd persuaded Christopher Holland to sell his story about Dee, I'd made the mistake of thinking she was just another of Paddy's lackeys. Herself and Sheridan running around, ordering the world to Paddy's vision, no better than Spanish John. But maybe Paddy treated Leechy like an equal. Maybe they'd come up with the idea together as a team. Maybe Paddy had found the one woman he didn't need to abuse. Maybe he really did love her. I was almost an hour late for work, and I was wondering what excuse I'd give Jacinta. As I crossed the office to my desk, she was embroiled in some sort of tussle with TC. Good, maybe I could just slip in and pretend I'd been there all along. I can't do it, TC was saying in a high, panicky voice. You have to, Jacinta said, her voice steely and calm. TC saw me, and his face lit up with hope. Grace! Well, there was my cover blown. He darted out from behind Jacinta. Will you do it, Grace? Please, Grace. Do what? Interview Zara Kaletsky. I've lost my nerve. I love her too much. I... Christ, could things get any worse? TC, you begged for the job, Jacinta said, with a sort of amused contempt. So go and do it. Please, Grace, T.C. thrust his beautiful red binder at me. I'll cover all your work. I'll stay late. I'll have sex with Damien. I'll do whatever you want. Where the hell have you been? Jacinta demanded of me. Then she switched back to T.C. and yelled, Why should Grace do it? She was in her element, having two people to shout at simultaneously. Probably as enjoyable as those four hands massages where two therapists rub you at the same time. Not that I'd know. For God's sake, TC. Her tone dripped with scorn. Be a man. It was that sentence, the unnecessary disparagement of it, that changed my mind. She was such a bully. And right at that moment I'd had a belly full of bullies. Which hotel? I asked TC. Where's this thing going down? The Shelburne. They had nice biscuits there. I hadn't had any breakfast. I'd like some sugar. I'll do it. 
I scooped up the red folder of loveliness and headed for the door. I'll decide who does what around here. I could hear Jacinta yelling after me, but I was already gone. A grim hotel corridor, disgruntled journalists lining the walls, the customary impenetrable selection process, business as usual. I parked myself in a plastic seat and prepared to endure. No one spoke. Seconds took hours to pass. Despair circulated instead of oxygen. Hell's waiting room might be a bit like this, I thought. TC had compiled a volume of research notes weighty enough to rival war and peace. But everything seemed so pointless and stupid that I could bring myself only to glean the bare bones about Zara Kaletsky. Her life was such a cliché, it was almost parodic. She'd been a model who'd crossed over to acting. A few years ago, she'd moved to L.A. and fallen off the radar, and the Irish press would have been faster to interview a zinc bucket. Then she'd got a part in a Spielberg film, and suddenly all Irish outlets were clamouring like hungry dogs for a piece of her. The terribleness of last night, the hubris, the failure, Marnie's anger, Paddy's easy victory had imbued me with wretched hopelessness, with a sense that life on earth was a miserable business, that goodness was always trumped by bad, that those with power would never cede any of it, that the little person would never win even the tiniest of victories. It felt immoral to celebrate a woman who earned a shockingly large amount of money from the frivolous business of pretending to be other people. Grayskill D, the spokesman? I got to my feet. I'd only been waiting two hours and seventeen minutes. That must surely count as a record. Thirty minutes, the clipboard maven hissed malevolently as I passed her to enter the sanctum. Not a second more. Grand, I hissed back. I took a moment to gather more spittle on my tongue. Proper hissing requires a good deal of it. Then, like air leaving a burst tar, said, Certainly, miss. Not a second extra. Thanks for your assistance. I was pleased with the way I'd managed to think of so many words with sibilant sounds. No notice. Just off the top of my head. With a perky, but I hoped unsettling, smile at her, I closed the door. Then, I just couldn't stop myself, I opened it again, thrust my chin at her, gave a quick, snaky sss, and closed the door once more. She'd think she'd imagined it. Zara was alabaster pale, with a cap of short, shiny hair, and eyes so dark and soulful they were almost black. She rose and smiled, six foot tall and thin as a whip. I waved her back into her seat. Don't get up, no need. Whipped open my notebook and clattered my tape recorder onto the table. I didn't catch your name, she said. No? Uh, Grace, but it doesn't matter. We'll never meet again. And you don't need to end every sentence with my name to convince me of your sincerity. I'm already convinced. She looked a little alarmed. So, no publicist sitting in and monitoring our every word? I asked. No. I thought, I think it makes everyone uncomfortable. Grant. It just meant she wasn't proper, really weird with many perversions, A-list. Okay, Zara. Let's do us both a favour. You must be sick of doing interviews, and I'm not really in the mood either. We'll make this quick. Wheat allergy? What? Wheat allergy? I repeated, louder this time. Yes or no? No. Really? Lactose intolerant, then, yes? I scribbled on my pad. No? Sure? Okay. You might want to sort that out, if you don't mind me saying. Yoga. Saved your life? Meditation, actually. Same difference, I muttered. I'd done neither, but why let the facts get in the way? I scanned TC's notes. Middle child, I said. Let me guess. Parents more interested in your siblings, blah. You started singing and dancing, blah, to get their attention. Yes? Yes. Good girl. Let's see. Six foot tall at the age of twelve. Ugly duckling. Blah. Swan. Beauty queen. Miss Donegal. So far, so blah. 
Anorexia? Um, bout of anorexia, I said. As a teenager, yes? I nodded along with her. But you're grand now. Great appetite. Always stuffing your face. Just a very high metabolism. My glance leapfrogged further down the page. La la la, let's see. Irish soap. Big success. Hmm. Had gone as far as you could go in Ireland. Yes. 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 Good. Went to LA, hoping to make the blah time. Struggled initially. Then got lucky when Spiel blah saw you in something or other. Tell me, why did these people bother having lives at all? When they're not capable of one original action? When everything has already been pre-scripted in the pages of Hello? No, wait, whoops, <laughs> nearly missed that. You went to South Africa first. Then you went to LA. Why'd you go to South Africa? Since when did they have a film industry? Fancied a change of scene, she said in a strained voice. Brand, I said breezily. Don't tell me, I don't care. Whatever it was, bankruptcy, plastic surgery spree, your secret's safe with me. So, what else can we discuss? Men? Let me guess. No one's special, you're having fun at the moment, but you hope to settle down at the ancient age of thirty. Yes? I'm already thirty-three. Was she? Looking good on it. That'd be all the poison she injected into her forehead, I presumed. You'd like two children, a boy and a girl. You're based in LA now, but Ireland will always be home. Yes? Yes. Excellent. Let's call that done. I got to my feet and stuck out my hand. Pleasure, Miss Kaletsky. She wouldn't take my hand. Uppity diva. Come on, I cajoled. No hard feelings. I thrust my hand at her again. She looked at it, but wouldn't hold it, trying to shame me into letting it drop. Have it your way, I said. Nice meeting. How did you get that mark? What mark? It was then that I realised she wasn't refusing to shake my hand but that her attention had been caught by something. She took my right hand between both of hers and uncurled my fingers. That mark, she said. We both looked at the circle of pink, shiny skin in the middle of my palm. I... Then we looked at each other. Something passed between us. Information that was fully articulated without having to even say his name. My fingers tingled. Snap. In one lithe movement, she splayed the fingers on her right hand, flashing her scar like an ID. I couldn't speak. I was literally struck dumb. Let's see, Zara surveyed me. Always considered yourself a bit of a firebrand, yes? Edited the school magazine? Got up a couple of small petitions. Nothing too controversial. Decided not to go to college, but to learn at the University of Life. Yes? Worked hard news until you found you didn't have the stomach for it. At some stage, crossed paths with Paddy de Courcy. Thought you'd be the girl to change him. But ended up with a face full of bruises and a burnt hand for your presumption. Yes? I opened my mouth. Sentences floated and danced in my head, but none of them emerged as sounds. Finally, I said, He's the reason you left Ireland. I made the mistake of going to the police. He was so angry I thought he was going to kill me. She went to the police. And was he, like, charged? How had he kept that out of the press? <laughs> Not at all. She rolled her eyes. These two fat Egypt showed up in their yellow jackets, and as soon as they'd established it was only a domestic, they told us to kiss and make up. Then they were off down the road to buy chips and batter burgers. All I could do was apply for a barring order, which would take twelve weeks. By then I was long gone. Why South Africa? It was the furthest place I could think of. Why hadn't I thought of Zara? 
I didn't know. Perhaps I'd assumed that Paddy wouldn't hurt glamorous women, those who might be listened to. Excitement began to build. An idea was taking shape. It's not just you and me, Zara said. I know. There's Selma Teeley. The mountaineer? Retired? He broke a bone in her hand that never healed properly. What? Really? She rang me when I started going out with him, trying to warn me. By the time I discovered she wasn't some mad, stalkery ex-girlfriend, he'd made me come off the pill, got me pregnant, made me have an abortion, then raped me the same day. She paused, then added, among other stuff, of course, but that's the one that stands out most. Christ, I breathed. Did you go to the police? Zara asked. Ashamed, I shook my head. Like they'd have believed you anyway? Zara flicked her eyes heavenwards. It's hard enough if you're getting lamped by a bloke, but if you're hit by delicious Paddy de Courcy, the housewife's choice, you haven't a hope. I don't know why I bothered. Who would ever have taken my word over Paddy's? Me? An ex-model in a crappy soap? But you're not an ex-model in a crappy soap any longer, I said. You're now a Hollywood star. God, yeah. When you put it like that, I suppose I am. You're powerful now, Zara. More powerful than him. God, yeah. When you put it like that, I suppose I am. Marnie She was lying in bed in what had been her teenage bedroom, playing the Leonard Cohen record she used to listen to when she was fifteen. The original vinyl record. Some people would probably get excited about that. Idiotic boys in black t-shirts. A person was at the front door. Her bedroom was right over it. She heard everything that happened down there. Grace, Ma's voice declared. What a lovely surprise. And in the middle of the working day... Grace. Marnie had been expecting a conciliatory visit from her. In fact, she'd been starting to wonder what was taking her so long. Where's Marnie? Grace's voice was terse. Upstairs, in her old room, playing that wretched Cohen man's record. I should have snapped it over my knee the day she left home. A moment later, there was a light tap on the bedroom door, and Grace's voice called, Marnie? Can I come in? Marnie contemplated refusing. She could simply send Grace away without seeing her. But she'd spent a sleepless night at the mercy of her imagination. The pictures in her head had been excruciating. What exactly had gone on with Grace and Paddy? She needed to know. Door is open, she said. Grace sidled in. She looked abashed, but there was something about her she was trying to contain an energy and excitement. Marnie, we need to talk. I, I've so much explaining to do to you, and I will. But something has happened and it won't wait. I don't care, Marnie said. Whatever is happening will have to wait. I want to know all about you and Paddy. Now. And, she added with as much hostility as she could muster, don't do a PG version to save my feelings so that I won't drink. Grace actually squirmed, then rallied with, Are you sober? Not much point me telling the story if you're not going to remember any of it. I'm sober. Marnie bit the words out with icy dignity. She stared at Grace, hoping the bitterness she felt showed on her face. Grace stared back at her. They flat-eyed each other for several long seconds, then Grace dropped her look. How come you didn't drink? she asked. The truth was that Marnie had no idea why she hadn't got drunk. The rejection she'd experienced last night, the humiliation, the self-hatred, the sense that she was an idiot and had always been an idiot, these were the exact feelings she usually sought to obliterate with alcohol. Add anger into the mix, anger with Grace and Paddy, 
and extreme drunkenness could be considered a dead cert. Instead, she'd sat in the kitchen chatting with Ma, drinking cocoa and eating poppy seed cake, and complaining about how the seeds stick between your teeth. Perhaps I grew up a little last night, Marnie said with acrimony. Perhaps my youthful ideals about people were stripped away. Or maybe I just couldn't stomach Dad's nittle wine. So, Grace, tell me about you and Paddy, your big love affair. And remember, I'll know when you're lying. One of Marnie's dubious gifts, the ability to recognise an attempt to humour her. Okay. Grace sat down heavily, opened her mouth, and told the story beginning with her first night working at the boatman. At times she paused, choosing words with great care, perhaps. Marnie wondered, words that softened the most brutal parts? But when she eventually finished, Marnie knew instinctively that nothing had been left out. Grace was as white as milk from the ordeal. I'm bitterly ashamed, Marnie, and that's putting it mildly. From day one, I wanted to protect you, and I'm the one to cause you so much pain. Stop, Grace, stop. Enough for now. This wasn't over, but Marnie couldn't take any more. So can I tell you what's happened? Grace asked. Marnie nodded, her eyes closed. There are two other women of Paddy's. There might be even more. We're going back again tonight. To Paddy's? Yes. Will you come? Would she? Why would she help Grace? Why would she return to the scene of her humiliation? But the truth, Marnie realised, was that she was glad of the chance. Why? Was she a sucker for punishment? But there had been too much confusion and shouting last night. This was an opportunity to do it again, but better. All swearing affidavits, Grace said. We detail under oath what he did to us. D has given us a lawyer. You on? Marnie nodded. I'll set it up. Can I tell you how we're planning to play it tonight? No. She wanted Grace to go now. She was exhausted. After Grace had left, Ma came into Marnie's room and sat on the bed. Turn off that dirge, she urged gently. He'd make Coco the Clown feel suicidal. Okay. Marnie lifted the needle and, mid-sentence, Leonard Cohen ceased. That's better, Ma said. Would you like to tell me what's going on? Marnie was overwhelmed by the size of the situation. Helplessly, she said, Paddy de Courcy. What about him? It's... I... Grace... Oh, it's really complicated. He was your teenage boyfriend. A long time ago. You're married now. You have two children. Yes, but... If a person continues to see only giants, it means he is still looking at the world through the eyes of a child, Ma said. Anouise Neen. Marnie nodded. Things do not change, Ma said. We change. Thoreau. Good point. If at first you don't succeed, you're running about average, Ma said. M. H. Alderson. Marnie stopped looking at Ma. 
Never grow a wishbone where your backbone ought to be, Ma said. Clementine Paddleford. Marnie stared at her lap. When life throws us lemons, thank you, Ma. That's enough, Marnie said. It was like a rerun of the previous evening, except that there were two cars this time. Marnie waited in one with Zara and Selma. Grace was in the other, with Dee and Lola. It was ten to eleven, and Paddy and Alicia were expected shortly. Selma looked from Marnie to Zara and laughed. Paddy definitely doesn't have a type, does he? True. Marnie was fascinated by the other two. Zara had a face of transcendent beauty, and was so lanky she was like a normal person who had been stretched to twice their length. Selma, by contrast, had a lean, bony look, crinkly blonde hair, and a short, wiry, sportswoman's body. Her calves were far too muscular for the spindly heels she was wearing. Marnie thought she looked like a sideboard. Even their personalities were poles apart. Zara was languid and sarcastic, whereas Selma was confident and mouthy. As they waited for Paddy and Alicia to come home, they exchanged war stories. Zara had been his girlfriend for two and a half years. Selma had been with him for five, and actually living with him for three of those years. Zara had been pregnant and raped by him. Selma, when he'd broken a bone in her hand which had never healed properly, had had her career as a sportswoman effectively ended by him. That's horrific, Selma, Marnie breathed. Why didn't you go to the police? The words were out of her mouth before she'd thought them through. Selma gave her a hard look. Why didn't you go to the police? Sorry, I... It was a ludicrous question, considering what Marnie herself had been through with Patty. But when you heard that someone had been hurt by someone else, the automatic response was to suggest that they went to the police. Because you loved him, right? Selma pressed. You didn't want him to get into trouble. Selma, I'm sorry, I just wasn't thinking. God, she was scary. Well, I loved him too, Selma said. Or at least I thought I did. But we won't get into that now. Obviously, I was out of my fucking mind. Anyway, I did go to the cops four separate times. My God, Zara said. I'm surprised you're still alive. So how do you wriggle out of any charges? You know what he's like, Selma said scornfully. He always talked me out of it, swore to me on his mother's memory that he'd never touch me again, blamed it on his job being stressful. The usual. And Pico here bought it every time. Kept thinking things would be different. Hope sprang eternal. She gave a little laugh and added, Then it stopped springing. And when he dumped me, I suppose then I could have gone to the cops. Nothing stopping me, but well, I wasn't myself, put it that way. Confidence destroyed? Zara said sympathetically. Marnie listened agog. I was a fucking wreck, Selma said. It took me a full year before I could eat peas. Peas? Marnie said. Why peas? Because my hands shook so much they wouldn't stay on my fork. How come there's never anything in the papers about him? Marnie wanted to know. Until someone actually brings charges, there's nothing to report. But what about... Police were called to a disturbance at Paddy de Courcy's house, that sort of thing. Zara and Selma both furrowed their foreheads and looked at Marnie with a sort of concerned pity. Unsubstantiated innuendo? Zara raised her thin black eyebrows. Are you mad? Selma cut in. He'd slap a writ on them so fast their heads would spin. And he has the press in his pocket, Zara said. Great relationships with editors and journalists. They love him. Duh, Selma added. I live in London. Marnie felt she had to defend herself. How would I know? She caught her breath. Oh, my God. Here's his car.
All three of them slid down in their seats, although they were parked too far away from his flat to be spotted. Selma couldn't resist sticking her head up for a look. Look at him, the fucker, she breathed, her eyes glittering. They'd decided upon a three-minute wait this time. Dee had deduced that last night's eleven minutes had been far too long. Go in fast and hard, she'd recommended. Ideally, before he has time to do a piss, don't let him get comfortable. As they emerged from the cars, two groups of three, and joined forces, Marnie watched Selma walk like a sideboard up to Grace and ask, After last night's balls up, will he even let you in? Yeah, Grace sighed. He's not a bit scared of us. Dee got them through the downstairs entrance. Courage, mes braves, she urged after them as they climbed the stairs. I'll be with you in spirit. Grace went first, then Lola, Selma, Zara, and right at the back, Marnie. Her legs were buzzing with anxiety as they filed down the hall and gathered outside Paddy's flat. Do the knocker. Selma told Grace. But he's expecting D. He'll open the door in a minute anyway. Bang the knocker, Selma urged. Be proactive. But it was too late. Paddy was swinging the door open, and when he saw the cluster of them waiting to see him, he exploded with laughter. Real laughter, Marnie thought. Not the fake kind that people sometimes do in an attempt to undermine. We left it too late, she realised. He's had his piss. For God's sake, he declared. What now? Can we come in? Grace asked. He flicked his eyes heavenward. Not for long. And I don't want you making a habit of this. This will be the last time, Grace said. As they filed through the door, he lavished compliments. Lola, beautiful as ever. Selma! You look great. It was only when he focused on Zara that Marnie noticed the tiniest loss of aplomb in him. Spielberg's muse, what an honour. And Marnie, of course. In the sitting room, the same venue as last night, everyone sat except for Grace and Paddy. Marnie had somehow ended up in the same seat as last night, which she feared augured badly. She watched as Grace thrust a large, fat, white envelope at Paddy, and he ignored it. Should I get Alicia for you? He solicitously asked Grace. Will we be having a repeat of that strange little scene from last night, with you shoving her sleeves up? Grace's face flamed, and she shook her head abruptly. No need for Alicia. Once again, she thrust the envelope at him, and this time... To Marnie's relief, he took it. Present for you, Grace said. Copies of affidavits made by the five of us, detailing what you did to us. The originals are in a safe. Paddy took a seat, slit the envelope, and flicked briefly through the pages before casting them aside as if they were nothing. A lone woman making accusations, Grace said, standing in the middle of the room. You could dismiss her as an utter. Two, even. But three, you're getting into different territory. And when there are five, it's looking very bad for you. Especially when one of them is Hollywood's hottest new star. Paddy laughed. And it's only a matter of time before we talk to more of your exes, Grace said. An amused little grin sat on Paddy's face. Grace, Gildy, you're gas, so you are. The bees you get in your bonnet. Then he turned to Zara and said, Zara Kaletsky. Well, I must say I'm honoured to have you in my humble home. Tell me all about Los Angeles. Is it true what they say? That no one ever eats? I'm not here to discuss Los Angeles with you, Zara said coldly. Because if they don't eat... That would suit you down to the ground. Paddy winked at her. You and your, ahem, old trouble. Marnie had a vague memory of having read somewhere that Zara had had anorexia when she was a teenager. God. Paddy went straight for the jugular with everyone. 
This was going to be like last night all over again. He'd undermine them all individually, and they'd just fall apart. And Selma, he turned the warmth of his smile on her. How's the sports consultation going? Oh, I forgot. It went belly up for you. That must have been tough. No money coming in. Life can't be easy. Well, now, he gave a great big smile around the room. It's been a pleasure talking to you girls, but I've had a long day. So, if you'll excuse me, Patty. The affidavits, Grace said. We're serious. He stretched his arms above his head and gave a long, yowly yawn. Serious about what? We will go to the press. Will you now? Unless... Unless what? Unless... Grace inhaled, and the entire room became frozen and focused. Marnie noticed that even Paddy, who was doing a great impression of someone who simply couldn't be less interested, was listening. Unless you resign from New Ireland, Grace counted on her fingers, announce that you're opting out of Irish political life, accept a lecturing post in a U.S. university for at least the next five years. As the list went on, Paddy barked with laughter. Apologise individually to each of us here. Withdraw the story about the Moldovan women from the press. Call a halt to all other plans to undermine D. Grace finished. That's it? Paddy asked, wreathed in smiles. Yes. Marnie heard Grace's voice betray the tiniest little tremor. Perhaps no one else heard it, but she knew her so well. You're not asking for much, are you? He said sarcastically. That's the choice, Grace said. It's either that or we all go to the media with our stories, and you're sunk anyway. My word against yours, he said. There are five of us, at least. So what's it to be? Paddy sat back in his seat and watched avidly by everyone in the room. He closed his eyes. Marnie stopped breathing. Eventually, Paddy straightened up and opened his eyes. He looked around the room at each of them in turn. The tension in Marnie intensified. She thought her chest might burst. Then Paddy took a breath to speak. No, he said. No. Marnie dug her nails into her palms. This was another disaster. Worse than last night. Resign? Paddy asked scornfully. Give up politics? Leave the country? Lecture in a foreign university? Are you fucking mad? No way. Is there anything at all you'll do for us? Grace asked. The tremor in Grace's voice was really audible now, Marnie realised. Everyone, including Paddy, must be able to hear it. Marnie wished she'd shut up. She was humiliating them all. Paddy laughed. No, there is nothing I will do for you. Not even call off the Moldovan story. You call off that story, we'll call off ours. Surely that's fair. Oh, all right, all right. Still grinning, Paddy said, I don't know where you get the idea that I've any influence with the Irish media. Sure, I'm only a humble TD. But I could have a word, see if, as a favour to me, some of the journos who have it in for her will back off. With a chuckle, he added, And, without prejudice, you can have your apologies. For what they're worth, hung unspoken in the air. But that's it, he said. That's all you're getting. You'll leave D alone. And you'll apologise to us, Grace said in a flat voice. That's it. That's it. Take the offer right now, or it's off the table. Take it, Grace, Selma urged in a low voice. Don't, Zara said. Clock is ticking, Paddy said. Take it, Grace, 
Selma repeated. Don't, Zara said. We can get more. But he says he won't, Grace protested. This is all we'll get, Selma said. No! Zara was clearly very angry. Wait! We've got the power here! Marnie watched Paddy watching the tripartite tussle. His face gleamed. He obviously loved this stuff. Time's running out, girls, he said. What do you think, Lola? Selma asked. Hold out for more, Lola said. The resignation, at least. Marnie? Selma asked. Marnie was surprised to be asked. Take it. She'd like the apology. Three, Paddy said. Two, take it. No! Sarah made one last-ditch attempt to change their course. Hold out for more. One. With a heavy sigh, Grace said, Majority vote. She turned to Paddy. Okay, Paddy, we'll take it. Wise choice, very wise choice. Marnie was fascinated by how he found this so very amusing. Clearly he thrived on it. And I'll have the originals of those affidavits, thanks. Get them round to me tomorrow. Okay, Grace said, looking very subdued. If Marnie didn't know for a fact that Grace never cried, she wouldn't have been at all surprised if a tear or two had trickled down Grace's face. Go on, then, Grace sighed at Paddy. Go on, then what? Apologise. What? When? Now. You mean, right now? When were you thinking of? Well, he shifted back in his seat. When else? Grace asked. The gang's all here. Paddy pushed himself further into his chair. Marnie watched in fascination. He really didn't want to do this. It doesn't have to be now, he said. Probably best if it is, Grace said. It might be a long time before we're all together again. Go on. Grace urged. Start with Lola. Paddy looked at Lola. He seemed lost for words. Lola, I'm... Uh, way out of your comfort zone, Marnie thought. Sorry, Grace prompted. Sorry if I hurt you. And for saying my hair was purple, Lola said in her little voice. It's Molochino. Molochino, he echoed. Next along was Zara. Zara, I'm sorry if I hurt you. Zara gave a sardonic smirk, and Paddy moved to Selma. Selma, I'm sorry if I hurt you. Marnie, I'm sorry if I hurt you. It had happened too fast. Marnie had expected special words which pertained exclusively to her, but he was already on to Grace. Grace, I'm sorry if I hurt you. Last apology done, Paddy exhaled with evident relief, and after a split second, the room exploded into laughter. All of them, except for Marnie, were howling. What was going on, she wondered. What are you laughing at? Paddy seemed confused. You, Sarah said, we're laughing at you. Why? Paddy frowned suspiciously at her. I'm sorry if I hurt you, Selma mimicked. How do you think a broken wrist feels? Or a ruptured spleen, Sarah said. Or a dislocated shoulder. Did you really think we expected you'd resign and go to America? Grace asked cheerfully. But why did you say... Paddy asked. Marnie suddenly understood. So, from the shutdown expression on his face, did Paddy. Oldest negotiating trick in the book, Grace said. Ask for more than you want. 
and you fell for it because you thought we were just a bunch of stupid women. All we wanted was a commitment from you to stop sabotaging D. Did you like the way we did it? Selma asked giddily. Take it, Grace. No, don't take it, Grace. It had all been rehearsed, Marnie realised, right down to the tremor in Grace's voice. She remembered now how, earlier in the day, Grace had invited her to be in on the whole thing, but she'd been too angry. But the apologies, Paddy asked faintly. That was just for the laugh. Like your apology would count for anything, Zara declared with terrible scorn. Like we'd ever forgive you. We knew you'd hate having to do it, Grace said. After all, being a power-mad mentaler means never having to say you're sorry. Paddy rose to his feet. His fists were clenched. Whoa! All five of them exclaimed in mock fear, as if they'd choreographed it. Careful, Paddy, Grace said. You don't know your own strength. You might hurt someone there. Keep him away from any lit cigarettes, Lola said. And the laughter broke forth again with renewed intensity. Paddy lowered himself slowly back into his seat, and his eyes moved from one woman to the next as all of them laughed at him. He hadn't expected this, Marnie knew. To her eyes, he actually looked frightened. We only made you apologise in order to humiliate you. And look at you, Grace declared, breaking into a fresh round of hilarity. You're mortified. In high spirits, they skipped and tripped back down the stairs to Dee. It was a triumph, Grace told her. Everyone was talking over each other, everyone except Marnie, telling Dee what had happened. And Grace was pretending to be nervous. And then Selma said, take it. And Zara said, don't. And Paddy was smirking away, thinking we were falling apart. And Paddy was so humiliated. Everyone back to mine for drinks, Dee said. Grace, bring that man of yours. He deserves to be in on this. If it wasn't for him, none of it would have happened. Grace looked anxiously at Marnie and said, Ah, no, Dee, it's late. He might be in bed. So get him out of bed, Dee ordered. We're celebrating here. N no, let's leave it. Marnie understood. Grace was afraid that Marnie would tell Damien about Grace and Patty. Ring him, Marnie said quietly. I'm not going to say anything. She'd already caused so much destruction especially to Daisy and Verity. The world was too full of pain, she couldn't add any more. Yet she was angry with Grace. She hadn't forgiven her. Maybe I never will. The thought was surprising. Interesting. Despite Marnie's assurance, Grace claimed she couldn't get hold of Damien. No answer, she said, snapping her mobile shut. Try the house phone, Dee ordered. I've tried it. Try his mobile. I've tried it. Try his office. I've tried it. Leave a message telling him what's going on. Maybe he'll come along later, Dee said. OK, everyone, let's go. Marnie got into Selma's car, but asked to be dropped off at a taxi rank. Aren't you coming to Dee's to celebrate? Selma and Zara seemed quite shocked. Marnie shook her head. She just wanted to escape. She wished she could go back to London immediately, but the last flight of the night had left. If you're sure, Selma said. Quite sure. Marnie jumped out and caught a cab back to Ma and Dad's. The full import of the night's events was settling on her. There was no getting around it, no avoiding the truth, that she'd been nothing to Paddy. Nobody a teenage thing that he'd totally forgotten. So many other women had come after her, including her own sister. Women who overshadowed her, who'd been with Paddy for longer, who'd lived with him. Marnie's face smarted with heat as she acknowledged that she had hoped that he'd behave as though they shared a special bond which transcended the passage of time. 
that although their love had been too incendiary to survive, they had carried each other in their hearts as they forged their different paths. But theirs hadn't been a grand passion. The simple truth was that she'd been a neurotic, insecure fuck-up, and he'd joined in for a while, before changing his mind and deciding that, actually, he wanted to be normal after all. She felt humiliated and angry. But who was she angry with? Grace? Paddy? Herself? She didn't know. All she knew was that she was returning to London in the morning and that she was not alone. Alcohol was there for her. It would never let her down. Grace The phone rang, jolting me from a deep, drunken sleep, and my heart nearly exploded from the shock of the noise. I'd been up half the night, celebrating with Dee, Selma and Zara. It had been after five when I'd staggered in, rowdy and raucous, and woken Damien up. Where were you? I pulled at him. I was ringing and ringing you to come and join the party. I was on a story, he'd said, and I have to get up in two hours. But I want to tell you how we laughed at Paddy. Tell me another time. Now, according to the alarm clock, it was ten past nine. I was alone in the bed. Damien must have gone to work. I picked up the phone just to stop the horrible, frenzied shrieking. My nerves were all a jangle. Last night's adrenaline and alcohol had worn off, and I was once again enmeshed in the all-consuming fear of Damien finding out about Paddy. Tentatively, I said, Hello? It was Marnie. I'm in Dublin Airport. I'm just about to get on a flight. So early? I meant what I said last night. I won't tell Damien about you and Paddy. Thank you. I should have been thrilled, but her tone was dispiritingly hostile. And stop coming to London every weekend. I don't want to see you. I was stricken. I needed to keep visiting her. So many dangerous, possibly even fatal things could happen while she was drunk, and there really was no one else to check on her, and God only knew how she felt in the wake of this de Courcy business. Last night, some of the other girls blossomed visibly as Paddy became reduced in their eyes. Lola the stylist, in particular. It was as if she'd shrugged off her fear of de Courcy, and she was suddenly standing fully upright. But there were no high spirits and group bonding from Marnie. In the triumphant Al Fresco debriefing for Dee, she'd stayed on the edge of the group. Then she didn't come for a drink. Cunningly, she'd pretended she was. She'd got into the car with Zara and Selma, but by the time they arrived at Dee's house, Marnie had jumped ship. I didn't know what Marnie thought of Paddy now. I just couldn't call it. But I suspected it was one of two extremes. Either she'd realised that she and Paddy had been nothing but a teenage fling, or else she was still holding on to the love of her life theory. Either way, I suspected her way of dealing with it would be to drink a lot. Stay away from me, she said. Then she hung up. I had to confess to Damien. The thought of it was so frightening I whimpered into my pillow, but it was the right thing to do. But a cowardly little voice whispered, What if there's no need to tell him? What if de Courcy had no plans to drop me in it? What if I went ahead and told all to Damien when it wasn't necessary? So maybe I shouldn't tell him. But could I live with the guilt? Its cumbersome presence had kept us knocked off balance since last summer. Maybe I should just square my shoulders and bite the bullet and tell him. Christ. Lola. Saturday, 24th January, 10.06. Driving to Nokovoy. Planned to pack up and return to Dublin. Suddenly keen to just get it done. Much to think about as I drove. Discovered was glad had made trip to Dublin. Not glad after first night of Paddy confrontation, of course. When he had said, 
Who's going to believe that fashion flake with the purple hair? I was aghast. Had seen the light. I had just been little doll to have kinky sex with. Like I was less than a person. Bad, burny feeling. How had I let self be treated so badly? Had always thought because he loved his dead mother that he was sensitive man. But as drove along, realised he was sensitive man, but also unpleasant man. People can have many aspects. Handy thing to know. But second night, with Zara and Selma and much mockery of Paddy, was liberation. He no longer seemed so scary. Or, interesting this, so good-looking. Boofiness of hair, a bad business. Also, knowing he had hurt other women was helpful. Wouldn't wish it on worst enemy. Technically, Sybil O'Sullivan, even if couldn't remember why we had fallen out. But no longer felt like it was my fault. He was first, and would be last, man who hit me. He, however, had form. So whose fault was it? Yes, his. He had got me at vulnerable time in life. Best friends all coupled up, mother deceased, no father figure. I'd been a bit like Paddy, actually. But at least I didn't go round punching people in Fizzog. 12.29 arrived Nokovoy. Two seconds after parked car, Considine's door opened. I legged it across grass and into his house. Tea? he asked. Yes, yes. Okay, you ready to hear everything? Had texted him bare outline, but had given no details. He said, ready. I'm so keen to hear, didn't even go potholing today. Sacrifice? Have been listening for your car for last three hours. Like lonely rural person. Just like lonely rural person. Same wavelength. In fairness, must warn you, Considine, I did not cover self in glory. At no point did I swagger in front of Paddy and say, Ha! Once upon time was mad about you, but now see you as boofy-haired brute that you really are. That is shame, he said sympathetically. Missed opportunity. But surely you said, I have moved on with my life. No? No, he nodded understandingly. Two Hollyoaks. Exactly, Considine. Two Hollyoaks is exactly what it is. Even though you have moved on. Yes, but no one should say it. Saying it makes you sound like you not moved on he said. Paradox. Yes, indeed, Considine. Paradox. Okay, from start to finish, here is whole story. Related it all. Even the unpalatable details. First night I said almost nothing to him and my knees wouldn't stop shaking. However, second night, different story. Bragging slightly. Made him eat own words about purple hair. Molochino, I said, made him repeat it. Best thing you could have done, taking him on, Considine concluded. We'll stand to you, no doubt about it. You not terrified of bumping into him when back in Dublin? No. On other hand, was not relishing thought of it either, but why dwell on negative? Sunday, 25th January. Packed everything. Tidied house. Said my farewells to everyone in town. Must admit, very choked. Had arrived five months earlier, a wreck. Now returning to old life, not exactly as good as new, because would never be the same as was before I met Paddy, but in reasonable enough nick. Considine came to help carry bags into car. Didn't take long. Everything in? He smacked the boot. Yep. I slapped the back window. Everything in. Both of us being over-jovial and manly, our hands hanging conspicuously by our sides as if they had suddenly swollen to ten times their normal size. Will you be back? He asked. Yes, probably. Some weekend. For hen night, maybe? He nodded awkwardly. We both swung our abnormally noticeable hands. After silence, I said, Thank you. 
you have been kindly to me in my time here. Sharing your telly? Advising me on de Courcy? He nodded again. You have been kindly to me also. Tranny evenings? Loan of plunger? Badger's arse night? More silence, then I asked. You ever come to Dublin for your eco-swat job? No. Oh. You ever come to Dublin to visit friends? No. Oh? Have no friends in Dublin. Surely I am your friend, said stoutly, and I live in Dublin. In that case, might visit you. Good. We will get rough as badger's arse. We'll look forward to it. Goodbye, Lola. Looked at him. Dark eyes. Messy hair. And God, you know something? Took step towards him. He took step towards me. I tilted my face up to him. He grasped me with hand around lower back and held his mouth against mine. Lips touching lips. For a few seconds stayed like that, without moving, like movie kiss. Quivered, both of us actually quivered with want. Felt it in him. Felt it in me. Before melting into each other. Slow, sensual, knee-weakening. Rosa Considine, extremely sexy kisser. 1844. My flat in Dublin. Welcomed home by Bridey, Barry, Trees and Gem. Said goodbye to all your knockavoy pals, Bridey asked. Yes. Sad. Yes. We will go back one day for a visit, she promised. Uncle Tom's cabin should be free for bank holiday weekend in about seven years' time. Grace Saturday had passed without me getting up the nerve to confess to Damien. It also passed without de Courcy shopping me to Damien. Sunday, too, passed without incident. Then it was Monday, and Damien rang me from work. Charlie and Angus have killed the story about D. His voice was trembling with excitement. So Paddy had stuck to his word and got his source to withdraw the story. Probably the only decent thing he'd ever done in his life. It was only now that he'd actually done it that I believed it. Even over the weekend, I'd half expected to see the story about Dee pop up in one of the papers. You've saved Dee's career, Damien said. So have you. Seriously, a general election is going to be called soon. If Paddy had got his way, he'd be going into the campaign as leader of New Ireland. You were the one who risked his job. Anxiously, I added, you haven't been sacked. He laughed. No. No talk of a leak. No one's making a big deal of it. Stories were killed all the time. It was a routine occurrence. There won't be any fallout, he promised me. It's all going to be okay. I wanted to believe him. One way and another, it had been a rough six months. Since the summer, I'd been desperate to make things up to Damien and for us to be back to normal. Maybe now we could be. Maybe the whole horrible de Courcy episode had finally been put to bed. Daring to be hopeful, but still holding my breath, Monday passed without Paddy de Courcy ruining my life. Ditto Tuesday. Ditto Wednesday. On Thursday, the Taoiseach Teddy Taft called a general election. This was very good news. Paddy would be up to his tonsils with campaigning. And he was getting married in five weeks. He'd have no time to be bothered with someone like me. I decided it was safe to breathe again. Lola Monday, 2nd February Recommenced work. Had expected slow start. But no. Funny thing had happened. Sarah Jane Hutchinson had suddenly been elevated to Queen of Society. Combination of her new wealthy boyfriend and her connection with Zara Kaletsky had thrust her to summit of pile. Despite bloodhound knees, everyone wanted to be her friend. Everyone wanted to serve on her committee. 
everyone wanted to use her stylist. Yes, I had stuck with her through the bad times, for once in life backed the right horse and looked set to reap rewards, assuming could hold it together and not burn any expensive dresses at shoots. Phone began ringing. First week of February. Snowed under with work. Changed mind about styling Grace Gildee. People are the way they are. No point trying to change them. Also, cannot spare time. Monday, 9th February, 2113. Siam Nights. Jem had called emergency summit meeting in Thai restaurant. Despite me being snowed under with work, he insisted that I attend. Was 43 minutes late. Rushed in. Apologies, apologies, but I'm... Yes, snowed under with work. Sat down. Looked around at Trees, Bridie and Jem. What did I miss? He wouldn't tell us until you got here. Bridie, sour. Apologies, apologies, but I'm... Don't say it. Now that everyone is finally here, Jem said with ominous formality, have something to tell you all. Heart sank. He was getting married to stinky Claudia, and we would be stuck with her forever. Worse, would have to go to her hen night, maybe even organise it. I'm not a hen party person. Too dangerous. Tell us then, Bridie demanded. Jem suddenly shifty making patterns with his glass on the table. I've, uh, met someone. Moment to digest his words. Met someone? You mean, a woman? He nodded, still shifting glass about like receiving messages on Ouija board. But you already have woman. Claudia! Yes, Claudia, Trees confirmed. With his hand, Jem made short, brutal, mafia-style chop across his neck. Gone. Claudia was gone. Who goned her? I asked, indignant. You? He assented. Tonight she sleeps with the newsreaders. What, all of them? Bridie asked. He shrugged. Wouldn't surprise me. So you just cast her aside like out-of-date Muller Fruit Corner? I demanded. Why you annoyed? Jem surprised. You hated her. You all hated her. Clamour of disagreement. Didn't hate her. <laughs> no, didn't hate her. Really quite fond of her. Oh, all right, Bridie admitted. Did hate her. But she hated me too. Trees? Jem asked. Yes, hated her, Trees said. Lola? Jem asked. Yes. Hated her. Of course. Sorry, was just having moment of identification with dumped woman there. Has passed now. I'm bloody delighted. Who is this new one? I hope she's a bit nicer than Claudia. I would settle for her liking Jem, which Claudia had never seemed to manage. Jem's face lit up with sappy glow. Gwen, you will meet her. You will love her. Yes, but he had said that about Claudia too. Grace. When Ma notified me about Bid's final diagnosis, I could have wronged Damien at work, but I decided to wait to tell him in person. Because of the forthcoming election, he was working an average of 14 hours a day, stuck on tour buses, covering god-awful campaign trails. It was 10 to 12 when he got home from work that night. In here, I called from the living room. In here! He pushed open the door and cheerily I said, Guess what? His face went grey. Slowly he sat down on the floor. Still no new couch. It hadn't even been ordered. Just tell me, Grace. Clearly he was expecting some type of bad news. But I'd been so upbeat. I looked at his anxious expression and was seized by a blinding flash of terror that he and I would never be right again. The night with Zara and Selma should have fixed things, but here we were, Damien and I, still mismatching each other's moods. Bid scan, I said. She got the all clear. It wasn't what he'd expected. 
I could almost see the cloud of angst lift from him. Serious? He began to smile and smile. My God, she's unbelievable, isn't she? Unstoppable. The old boot will probably outlive us all. I thought she wouldn't come through it, Damien admitted. I don't know what I thought, I said. I suppose I simply hadn't let myself think at all. It's bloody fantastic news, Damien said. Even more fantastic, I said. We can start smoking again. Six months without a cigarette. I couldn't have done it without you. Pompously, I said, our sacrifice kept her alive, of course. You do know that. But instead of laughing, his cheer seemed to drain from him, and the mood once again went into a nosedive. What the hell was happening now? I've something to tell you, Damien said with terrible weariness. Instantly I was plunged into the horrors. The hideous fear intensified when he said, A confession. Don't let this be happening. I didn't want to worry you while the jury was still out in bid, he said, but I've betrayed you. Such a horrible word, that. Betrayed. I tried my damnedest, Grace. Damien was a picture of remorse, but I just didn't have it in me to resist. With Juno? Why did I ask? Hadn't I smelt her in my house, in my own bed? I'd known she'd been there. I'd known it in some deep, hidden part of me. But I'd wanted so much to be wrong that I believed Damien when he told me there was nothing going on. Yes. Sometimes with Juno. Sometimes? I was tangled up in shock and confusion. There have been others? Was this worse or better? It was hard to know because it was all so horrific. Grace, wait, Damien said urgently. What are we talking about here? You tell me. I've been smoking. Cigarettes. While you've been in London with Marnie. It took several seconds for me to understand. You've been smoking? He nodded. That's all? It was what I'd smelled. The faintest trace of cigarette smoke. I'd confused it with infidelity. We had a pact, he said, and I didn't honour my side of it. But it's okay. I lied to you. But who cares about a few sneaky fags? Y you haven't cheated on me. Grace, that fecking word. No, I haven't. Oh, God, Damien, I thought... I'm so relieved, I'm... I should have been skipping around with relief. But suddenly something else was there. Where had it come from? Why now? And then I understood that it had been there all along, just waiting for its moment. What? I said defensively. Guilt jumped from my eyes and there was an answer waiting in his. Neither of us spoke and something, anything, was needed to break the strange atmosphere. I pressed my feet against the floor to stand up, but then he spoke, and I froze. Grace, I know. I couldn't speak. About you and de Courcy. The fear I'd felt when I'd thought Damien had slept with Juno was as nothing compared to this. This was infinitely, immeasurably worse. How? The word was tiny. When you were working on his autobiography, you couldn't miss it. My life was draining from me. My entire existence was disappearing, dissolving into nothing. I actually stopped being able to feel my feet. Please. I wanted to tell him that nothing had happened with Paddy and me, but that was only true in the strictest interpretation of the words and I had too much respect for Damien to fob him off with that shite. Then, your bruised face, the cigarette burn on your hand, <laughs> that story about you tripping on the paving stone. Damien laughed softly and shook his head. I was horrified. I'd thought he believed me. How could I have been so thick? But why didn't you say anything? 
My voice was croaky. If you were going to lie to me, he said, what good would it do to tell you that I knew? That was the very worst moment of my life. Even as it was happening, I recognised it. Shame engulfed me. Pure shame. Not that hot, blustery, shouty stuff where you go on the defensive, trying to pretend you're not in the wrong. I knew I was in the wrong. Damien didn't give his trust easily. It was a rare and precious thing, and I'd treated it like a pair of old jocks that you use for cleaning the windows. It was six months ago. How have you lived with it? This is what baffled me. Without saying anything to me. Because I loved you. I wanted to stay with you. I wanted to fix it, if we could. Oh, Christ. Successive waves of shame hit me as I remembered how Damien had tried to patch up the damage I'd caused. He'd got a bank loan to replace the car that Paddy had burnt out. He'd instigated date night in an effort to rekindle a connection between us. He'd given up cigarettes to keep my aunt alive. I wanted to vomit. But why weren't you angry with me? He looked at me. He seemed surprised, then almost contemptuous. I have been angry. I am angry. He bit the words out and suddenly I knew the full extent of his rage. He wasn't trying to hide it any more, and it was a cruel and terrifying thing. Don't blame yourself for not being able to hide your fondness for de Courcy, he said coldly. Even if I hadn't guessed, de Courcy took the precaution of telling me. I was shocked into open-jawed silence. The night with Zara and Selma, he said. As soon as you'd left, he phoned me. So that was why Damien hadn't answered my calls that night. Damien? Tears began to pour down my face. I wanted to tell him that I'd been temporarily mad and that I was better now. I wanted to beg for his forgiveness, but I knew he wouldn't, couldn't grant it. The worst thing, the most unbearable part, was that Damien had warned me this would happen. Last summer, when I'd been in the thick of my decorsiitis, he'd said that if either of us cheated, we might get over it, but that things would never be the same again. The innocence and trust would be gone. I've ruined it, haven't I? He wasn't being gratuitously harsh, but there was only one answer he could give. Yes. Ma opened her front door. Grace, what are you doing here? I need sixteen euro to pay the taxi. I nodded at the car, idling by the curb. Why have you come in a taxi? And why can't you pay for it? I can't find my car key. Or my wallet. Where are we going to find sixteen euro? We'll have to go through your father's glass things. Dad collected one-cent coins in old jam jars. I'll go and tell your man we'll be a while. I dropped my rucksack by the door and started back down the steps. Grace, are you all right? You look a bit... You know the way you said there was always a bed for me here? Ma gazed at me, her face changing and becoming luminous with shock as understanding dawned. I've come to take you up on it, I said. What happened? she whispered. Paddy de Courcy. Paddy de Courcy? He'd won. Lola. Thursday, 12th February 2057. The Horse Show House. Bridey, Barry, Trees and I awaiting the unveiling of Gwen. Jem's new girlfriend. Why are we in this bloody pub? Bridie asked. Is miles out of the way and full of rugby-type oddballs. Jem wanted neutral venue for the meet, Trees explained. No reminders of Claudia. He actually called it the meet? I asked. Yes. Cripes! What do you think she'll be like? 
I asked. This so-called Gwen. Well, she needn't think she can take Jem for a ride the way Claudia did, Bridie said grimly. Yeah, Barry agreed. Too right. We'll be watching her. Shh, here they are. Jem approached, grinning, grinning, grinning. Also sweating. Also rubbing his hands around and around each other, as if washing them. Clearly under considerable stress. He ushered forward tall, dark-haired girl. This is Gwen. At first glance, her knocker is not fake. Yes, hello, Gwen, we all cried. Lovely to meet you, yes, lovely. We were smiling, smiling, smiling with our mouths, but our eyes like flint. Lovely to meet you, too. Gwen was sweating around her hairline. Yes, gin and tonic she said to Jem. In quieter tone, she added, make it large one. Stab of pity for this so-called Gwen. Few experiences in life more daunting than beauty contest with new boyfriend's old friends. Wondering if you'll be accepted into gang or cast into outer darkness. However, could not permit heart to soften too much. She could be fake knockered hustler like Claudia. Mind you, she didn't seem like hustler. She seemed nice. Drinks, chat, anecdotes. Under guise of fake friendliness, Bridey, Barry, Trees and I assessed this so-called Gwen's every move. Much shrill, anxious laughter on Gwen's part. Perched on edge of banquette, her legs crossed three times around themselves. Jem watching us, his eyes pleading. Please like her, please like her. Jem went to the bar again, to pour more alcohol into us, and while he was gone, Gwen slumped. Mother of fuck. She wiped her forehead. This is worse than job interview. Chest burst of compassion for her. You were friends with Jem's previous girlfriend for a long time, she said. It'll be hard to accept me, but give me time. Bridey, Barry and Trees also riddled with compassion. Actually, we hated her, Bridey confided. Hated her, Trees confirmed. Hated her, I said. Suddenly all of us roaring, laughing and firm friends. Yes, Gwen, the right one for Jem. In a way, their names almost rhymed. Everyone truly settled now. Except me, of course. Not bitter, no, simply observing. Marnie She rose inexorably towards the surface. I'm still here. I'm still alive. Desperate for oblivion, she tried to push herself back down into the nothingness, but she resurfaced again popping up like a plastic bottle on the waves. It was over. She had returned. She was conscious. She was, dispiritingly, still alive. What would it take? Automatically, she looked around for a bottle. The one beside her bed had toppled over and emptied itself onto the carpet. She'd have to go on a search. She stood up. Her legs felt as if they were being operated by someone else. There was a loud humming in her ears, and her tongue tasted thick and numb, as if it was coated in paraffin wax. Down the stairs, someone else's legs carrying her, and into the hall, where a light flashed on the answering machine. She didn't know when she'd developed a fear of hearing messages, but she had. The same with the post. She could barely look at it much less open it and make neat piles. She had better listen to the messages. She'd been out of it for nearly four days. Something might have happened. When she heard Ma's voice, she bit her thumb to tamp down her dread. But it was good news. Bid was better. She was too numb, still too stunned from her hangover to feel glad. But she knew she was relieved she was simply too anaesthetised to feel it. There was a second message. Again, from Ma. 
Damien and Grace had split up. Grace had moved out of their house and was back living in her old bedroom. Something to do with Paddy de Courcy, Ma said. She's not so good. This was such astonishing news that Marnie sank to the cold parquet floor and listened to the message again, just to make sure she'd got it right. It was hard to believe. Grace and Damien had seemed so... together. So unbreakable. Clearly, Paddy de Courcy was even more powerful, more destructive than she'd realised. She should be glad. Glad that Grace had paid the price for messing with someone she shouldn't have. And glad that she herself wasn't the only one Paddy de Courcy had ruined. After all, if it could happen to strong, scary Grace, then it could happen to anyone. But she was surprised to feel something winkle its way through the numb, buzzing force field that surrounded her feelings. Poor Grace, she thought, a shard of compassion warming her deadened heart. Poor, poor Grace. Grace. I opened my bedroom door and met Bid on the landing. You look like shit, she said. Good morning to you too, I said wearily. Would you not wear a bit of makeup? she asked. You'll scare the public going out like that. It's not fair on people. I didn't look like myself. She was right about that. Three nights ago, the night Damien and I had split up, I'd undergone some sort of transformation while I'd been asleep. I'd looked 35 when I went to bed, but when I woke up the following morning, the hollows around my eyes had sunk down into my skull, and suddenly I looked like I'd been roaming the earth for 4,000 years. Even some concealer for those black circles, Bid suggested. I haven't got any with me. Most of my stuff was still in the house. You could go back and get some. Not today. You could ask Damien to pack up some of your stuff. Not today. I couldn't cope with any of that organizey type stuff. All I could manage was the bare minimum required to get through the day. I'd left our house, my home, on Tuesday night. And when I woke up on Wednesday morning, shivering in Ma's spare room, I thought, I have to survive today. The same thing happened on Thursday. Now it was Friday, and like a mantra going through my head were the words, Just get through today. There was an awful tightness in my chest, and I still couldn't feel my feet. And my face and head felt like they were going to burst apart, and splinters of my skull were going to go flying everywhere, like in a video nasty. Down in the kitchen, Ma and Dad leapt up all concern when they saw me. Are you going to work, Grace? What else would I do? You know you're free to smoke again, Ma said. Indeed, thanks to Bid's cancer-free status, everyone was free to smoke again. However, Ma, Dad and Bid had decided to stay nicotine-free. They didn't want a recurrence of Bid's cancer. Also, I think they liked the extra cash. But they kept encouraging me to start back on the cigs. I couldn't. When I'd first given them up last September, a peculiar part of me had been glad I was denying myself something I loved. The order to stop smoking had been handed down about a week after Paddy had hit me. Bizarrely, it had felt appropriate to do some sort of penance. Now it felt even more so. I don't want to smoke. Well, I do, but I'm not going to. I have to atone for what I did to Damien. Ma flinched. You weren't even brought up as a Catholic. Ach, Dad said. If you live in Ireland, there's no escaping the guilt. I think they pump it into the water system like fluoride. I'm going to work, I said wearily. Will you be here tonight? Ma asked. I'll be here for the rest of my life. I got through Friday, then I got through the weekend by sleeping for large patches of it. Marnie rang to offer stiff condolences, and if I hadn't felt so dismal, the fact that she was talking to me would have cheered me. But I was uncheerable. Then it was Monday morning, 
and as I was promising myself that all I had to do was get through today, my bedroom door opened and Bid tossed a small beige tube across the room at me. What's this? Foundation! We bought it for you. We clubbed together. Put some on. I rubbed a handful of gunk over my face and it warmed up my death pallor. But within moments, my greyness had risen once more to the surface, cancelling out the tawny beige. I got through Monday and I got through Tuesday and on Tuesday night, when Ma came to wish me sweet dreams, I said, It's a week now. It's a whole week. You've heard nothing from him. She knew I hadn't. I suppose she was just making conversation. No word? No. And I won't. There will be no reunion. This is over. I knew he wouldn't forgive me. But I accepted it. That was the one good thing. I didn't daydream about him arriving to claim me. I didn't ring him and call round to the house pleading with him to forgive me. I knew Damien. The qualities I'd fallen in love with, his independence, his conviction in his own rightness, his essential unwillingness to trust another human being, had become the stumbling blocks. He'd trusted me, and I'd broken the trust. It couldn't be fixed. I lay on the bed and thought back to those days last summer and wished fiercely, scrunching up my face and clenching my hands with the force of my longing, that I could go back and change things. What are you doing? Ma asked. With your face? Wishing I could go back and change things. I really miss him, I said. I miss talking to him. Right from the start I was pathetically in love with him. Even at parties, on the few occasions I could drag him along to one, he was the only person I really wanted to talk to. Did you tell him? Ah, no, we're not like that. But he knows. Knew. So why the hell did you get involved with de Courcy? Ma asked, almost in exasperation. I don't know. I really couldn't understand it. Boredom? Curiosity? A sense of entitlement? All shameful reasons. People, human beings, I said helplessly, we're fucked up. Why do we do the things we do? I sounded like Marnie. For the first time, I really understood the despair that ran through her like a black seam. To err is human, Ma quoted. To forgive divine, I said and I couldn't care less if the Divine forgives me or not. I want Damien to forgive me, but he won't. Ma acknowledged that by keeping her mouth shut. I know you all think he's grumpy. She maintained a diplomatic silence, but he's my favourite person. Eventually, she asked, What are you going to do? With what, the rest of my life? Yes, I suppose. Or until you get over this? I don't know. What does anyone do? Live through it. Easier said than done, though. Lola Monday, 23rd February, 1911. Bridie's flat. Dance, little sister, dance, Bridie urged me. VIP had done a special de Courcy pre-wedding pullout. Bridie had removed all the pictures of Paddy and spread them across the floor like carpet tiles. Come on, little sister, dance! Little sister. Trees and I exchanged a glance. Perhaps words from a song? No knowing where Bridie gets her phrases from. She played Billy Idol. No knowing where Bridie gets her CDs from, either. And we all danced, and, must admit, I gleaned pleasure from stamping foot on Paddy's smiling fizzog. Cripes! Look at this! Had kicked up legs so energetically that had overturned one of the pages, and on the back was picture of Claudia, at launch of new athlete's foot powder. Her 3D knockers almost jumped out of the page and hit me in the eye. 
she was posing cheek by jowl with TV3 weatherman. Her new boyfriend, apparently. Quote said, Claudia and Felix, very much in love. We can stop worrying about her now, Trees said. Trees very dry. Back to dancing on Paddy de Courcy's face. What is danger of you having relapse on the wedding day itself? Bridie asked. Time will tell, I suppose, I said. Bridie displeased. Course you won't have relapse. Well, why you ask? Rhetorical, rhetorical. You are over him. In fact, let's gate crash K Club and you can throw confetti. Let's not. You not feel better enough to throw confetti at his wedding? Ridey's eyes narrowed. Not exactly, but don't feel like throwing rotten tomatoes either. So what was bloody point of that lovely showdown with him? Facing fears and all that, and am much better than was. Work going well. Modest understatement. Was riddled with work. Had been wobbly when first returned, but now was in the zone and at top of my game. Everything I did was a triumph. Not boasting, no, not boasting. Simply saying how it was. Could cherry-pick jobs. Keeping best paid, most interesting ones for me, and passing on overflow to, yes, in catchy. Why not? She was excellent stylist. Also, she had suffered a loss. In stunning, shocking move, Rosalind Croft had left her husband, the horrible Maxwell Croft. Unprecedented. Society wives never leave society husbands. Always other way round. Rosalind Croft no requirement for stylist, because no jingle to pay for one. In catchy down one very lucrative client. Remember the night of the soup, Ridey chortled, when you camped outside Paddy's front door and asked me to bring you soup. God, you were certifiable! Ha ha ha, yes, indeed. Was a few months there, Ridey said, when I thought you would never be normal again. I thought would never be normal again either, I said, remembering just how wretched had felt. But, said Trees firmly, your life definitely back on track. Never thought it would happen. Never thought it could happen. But damage done by de Courcy seems to have healed, I said. Look at me now. Swished hand around self to indicate sleek hair, calm demeanour, phone which never stopped ringing. No need to go into it with Bridie. But I knew would never again be the person I was before I met Paddy. Was less naive now. Less trusting. But maybe that not a bad thing. Less scared also. Not afraid of being back in Dublin. In fact, nice to be reinstated in own flat, with fully connected telly. Right in the thick of things with grunty men wrestling outside my window at four in the morning. Transition, naturally enough, not entirely smooth. Missed things about Nokovoy. The peace, the cleanness, the sea air, despite ruinous effect on hair, and of course my many, many friends. Thought of them often, with great fondness. Frequent memories of Boss, Moss and the Master, accompanied with slight dread in case they made good on their promise to visit me in Dublin. Thought of Mrs. Butterley every day, especially when heard Coronation Street music. Also thought of some of others every day, sometimes twice a day. Or even more if, for example, heard Achy Breaky Heart on radio, mercifully rare occurrence, or saw a programme about badgers, or passed by Eco Swat Prius in street, or noticed man with unkempt hair, or heard the word pothole, or used shower cap, or ate tortilla chips and brushed crumbs onto floor, or drank Fanta, or saw someone tossing a coin, or noticed law and order in TV listings, or bought a new bulb for bedside lamp, or wondered if she'd do home cholesterol test, or tried a new flavour smoothie. Not knockavoy memories, so cannot account for this phenomenon. Considine texted often, 
with caring questions about my progress. Always replied, Am riddled with work, Considine. Initially slightly exaggerated quantity of work I was receiving. Important for him to think I was doing well. Had been instrumental in my rehabilitation, and he deserved to feel warm glow of satisfaction. However, he did not mention visiting Dublin, and, unlike Boss Moss and the Master, would have actually liked him to come. But that is men for you. All liars. Not bitterness, no. Simply the way things are. Grace Make sure you put on that foundation. Bid walked into my bedroom like she did every morning. There was no privacy in this house. No privacy, and no heat, and no biscuits. We didn't spend our hard-earned pensions. What in the name of God is wrong with your chin? The entire lower part of my face was weeping, blistered, and crusty. It's a cold sore, I said wearily. That's no cold sore, Bid was appalled. That's some sort of disease. Trench foot, you look like you're rotting. It's a cold sore, I repeated. I used to get them when I was a teenager. It's just a very bad one. Bid yelled from the landing. Is that alleged cold sore any better? She was pretending that she couldn't bear to enter the room because of my disfigurement. No. It lasts for ten days, I keep telling you, and I've only had it for four. She came in anyway. Is that another cold sore on your eyebrow? I got out of bed and looked in the mirror. I don't know. It might be just a spot. A boil, you mean? Mother of the divine, you've more on your legs. I looked down. Christ alive! A selection of medieval-style boils had erupted around both ankle bones. I was almost afraid to investigate further, but I had to. I whipped down my pyjama bottoms to confirm the presence of several eruptions on my thighs. Sweet Jesus, Bid moaned, raising her cardigan to cover her eyes. You could have warned me you were going to flash your growler. And why haven't you had a Brazilian? Is it any wonder he got sick of you? The following morning, when I woke, I heard Bid poking about on the landing. Bid, I called. Bid! What is it today? Bid! I'm blind! My right eye had swollen shut because of a sty. Ma was summoned. I've had enough of this, she said. I'm taking you to Dr. Schwartkop. You might be anemic or something. I'm not... I knew what was wrong with me. Ma, I'm not going to the doctor. I've to go to work. But she rang Jacinta and said I'd be late. I was 35 and I was getting a sick note from my mum. And I went along with it, because I didn't know how to resist. I'd forgotten how to do that. It was a skill I'd had once, but didn't have any longer. Interesting thing, Ma mused as we sat in traffic on the way to the doctor. Some people, Marnie to take one, become really quite beautiful when they're heartbroken. Strangely luminous. Then she clapped a hand over her mouth. Grace, sorry, I wasn't thinking. Dr. Schwartkop was a woman. Ma wouldn't countenance anything else. Ma knew her well enough to call her Priscilla. She also knew her well enough to insist on accompanying me into the consulting room as if I was six. Cold sore, Priscilla said to me. Boils? Sty? Anything else? An ache in my chest, I said, and an ache in my face and head. She gave me a sharp look. Have you had some sort of loss recently? My partner. Ten years. We split up two weeks ago. No chance he'll come back to you? No chance, Priscilla. Ma answered quickly. I could send you for blood tests, but they'll come back normal, I said. Priscilla nodded. I suspect they will. Anything else you can suggest? Ma asked. Antidepressants? Antidepressants? 
Ma coaxed me. I shook my head. Something to help you sleep, Priscilla said. Some nice sleeping pills, Ma suggested kindly. Once again, I shook my head. I had no trouble sleeping. You could get your hair cut, or... Priscilla cast around for another suggestion. Or have an inappropriate fling? Or go on holiday? She shrugged. Or indeed, you could do all three. Thanks, I said. Maybe a holiday. Come on, Ma. I've got a job to go to. I ran out of petrol on the way to work. I'd known my car had needed petrol, but over the preceding few days there had been so many choices at the station, premium and super premium, diesel and non-diesel, that I'd had to drive away, convincing myself that I had enough left for one more journey. When the engine spluttered and died, I didn't even care. I just abandoned the car on the Black Rock bypass and got the bus the rest of the way to work. Then I rang Dad and asked him to get a canister of petrol and go down and retrieve it. When I finally got to work, it was midday. I walked into the office, and they howled with laughter when they saw the sty on my eye. We've a present for you, TC said. What? For some reason, I thought it might be cake. Between my disfigurements and my petrol-free car, I thought they might have got me a nice cake. It was a paper bag big enough to fit over my head. We've cut out eye holes, TC said. I tried to laugh, but to everyone's horror, tears came to my eyes. It was only a joke, Lorraine said anxiously. Maybe you should take some time off, TC urged. How much holiday time have you left? A couple of weeks? Go someplace. Maybe get a bit of sun. I went to Jacinta, who wasn't unsympathetic. One of the canaries, she suggested. Lanza Grotti? Costs nothing at this time of year. But I'd no one to go with. So I'd go on my own, I decided. It would be good practice for the rest of my life. That evening, Marnie rang Ma. They spoke for ages. Then Ma handed me the phone. She wants to talk to you. I hear you're going on holiday, Marnie said. That's right. I could come with you. It was an olive branch. I won't drink, she promised. Of course she'd drink. But it was better than going on my own. Lola Saturday, 7th March. Paddy got married. All over the news. Not exactly skipping around my flat, throwing hat up in the air, as if I'd just won eight million euro, but didn't have relapse. No demands for non-lumpy soup. No driving around the city without due care and attention. Day passed peacefully. Sunday, 8th March, 1705. Phone rings. Bridie. You want to go to Knockavoy next weekend? She asks. Patrick's Day holiday? Thought Cousin Faunchy had house booked. Another peculiarly named relation. Is there no end to them? He had, but fell off ladder. Temporarily blind. Can't drive. Will we go? 1708. Texted many Knockavoy pals to notify them of my forthcoming arrival. Grace We went to Tenerife. We got a little apartment in a resort that was faked up to look like a fishing village. The place was about a quarter full, and Marnie and I were the only people under 90. Every day, we each lay on a lounger beneath the weak March sun, and I read thriller after thriller, and Marnie read biographies of people who'd killed themselves. Every evening we had our dinner in the same restaurant, and every night we both slept for twelve hours. We took care of each other, finding lost books and sunglasses, 
rubbing on each other's sun cream, warning each other about overdoing it in the sun. There was no mention of Paddy, nor the bitter falling out we'd had. We were like two frail elderly convalescents, doing for each other what we weren't able to do for ourselves. I'd decided I didn't care if Marnie drank. But, true to her word, she didn't. Maybe that was all she'd needed, I thought wryly. A fortnight in the Canaries to cure her of alcoholism. We talked a lot while we lay on our backs facing up through sunglasses at the sky. Funny how our lives have paralleled each other's, I said. You mean both of us being left by our men? Yes, I suppose. Was it my fault that you and Damien split up, she asked, because of all that time you spent with me? No, of course not. But I understood that perhaps I'd welcomed the chance to spend weekends in London with Marnie, because it took me away from the stilted terribleness of Damien and me. By the time we'd passed the halfway point on the holiday, I was certain that Marnie wouldn't drink. Then, on the eighth day, she had a tearful phone call from Daisy. And just like that, she was off, drinking round the clock. For three days, I spoke to no one. I just read my books and lay on the lounger and let the sun warm my eyelids. Now and again, I'd go back into the apartment to check that Marnie was still alive. Every five hours or six hours, she'd come to, get up, go out, buy more vodka, come back, drink it, and pass out again. Dutifully, I'd pour away whatever was left in the bottle. But when she emerged from her coma, I didn't try to stop her from going to the mini-market to buy more. After three days, she stopped. Like she'd run out of the necessary self-hatred to fuel the binge. Sorry, she whispered at me. It's okay. Don't worry. Do you feel well enough to go out for dinner tonight? Maybe. I don't know. I could cook. You haven't eaten in days. You should have something. She was confused. Through her haze, she asked, Why are you being so nice to me? Because I love you. The words were out of my mouth before I'd thought them through. You're still my sister. I've always loved you. I'll never stop. Why aren't you angry with me for drinking? Marnie asked. Again, the words came without my volition. Because there's nothing I can do about it. It didn't mean that it wasn't breaking my heart, because it was... But I knew now that there wasn't a thing I could do to change things. And Marnie, there's nothing you can do either. You've no choice. I used to think you had, but you haven't. You're powerless. As powerless as I am. It was the strangest feeling. I'd forgiven her. She wasn't going to stop drinking. I knew that now. Nothing could make her stop. She would keep drinking and keep drinking, and sooner or later it might kill her. But even for that, I'd already forgiven her. Lola Saturday, 14th March, 1859 Ridey, Barry, Trees, Jem, Gwen and I arrive Uncle Tom's cabin. All together in Trees' new SUV. Present from Vincent. Vincent not present. 1903. Open bottle of wine. 2008. Knock on door. That'll be Considine. But when opened door, who was standing there? Only Chloe. Yes, Chloe. Eyes sparkling, hair glossy, clothing as on trend as ever. Delighted hugs, proud introductions, over-interested gawking from Bridie, Barry, Jem and Gwen, less overt staring from trees, strong drinks, high spirits, out on the town, Nokavoy crammed with visitors, people everywhere, 
no one sussed Chloe was tranny. Simply thought she was, perhaps slightly tall, slightly bulky, girl from Dublin. Chloe, huge hit with friends. Full of life and laughter, Bridie kept saying about her. Do not know where she got that phrase. Bridie has propensity for peculiar phrases. Do not fancy her as, unlike you, Lola, am not lesser inclined, but full of life and laughter. Bridie, tremendously drunk. All of us, tremendously drunk. Great, great night. Sunday, 15th March, 1209. Quite unwell. Jem and Gwen carried sofa round to back of house for me, too hung over to do it myself. Then lay on it, huddled beneath duvet. Kept Considine's house in my sights, hoping to see him and give little wave. But he never appeared. Down pothole, no doubt. Fourteen, fourteen. Trees got up. Fourteen, twenty-two. Trees went back to bed. 1701. Aided by Barry, Bridie crept downstairs. Had been vomiting since sunup. Toast, she whispered. 2027. Jem and Gwen cooked dinner. Bottle of wine opened. Tentative sips. Suddenly everyone talking and colour back in our cheeks. 2119. Knock on door. That'll be Considine. But when opened door, who was standing there? Only Chloe. Yes, Chloe. Again. Different clothing this time, but just as dazzling. Thrilled, yes, thrilled to see her once more. Could not understand why I felt so disappointed. Strong drinks, high spirits, out on the town. Knockavoy crammed with visitors. People everywhere. Again, no one sussed Chloe was tranny. Simply thought she was, perhaps, slightly tall, slightly bulky girl from Dublin. Again, <laughs> Chloe, huge hit with friends. Full of life and laughter, Bridie kept saying about her. Decided to count how many times Bridie said, full of life and laughter, but lost count after 48. Bridie, tremendously drunk. All of us, tremendously drunk. Great, great night. Did not really enjoy it. Monday, 16th March, 6.14. Had been asleep for only two hours, but was awake again. Thinking of Considine. Keen to see him. Very keen. Needed to get to him before he started applying false nails and chicken fillets and became Chloe again. Now as good a time as any. Slipped from bed and, still in pyjamas, crossed grass to his house. Knocked on door. No answer. Knocked again. Much louder. No answer. Knocked again. This time so loud, almost missed him protesting, is middle of bloody night. Let me in, cranky arse, is Lola. He opened door and I scooted past him. His hair must and face sleepy wearing blue sweats and raggedy grey t-shirt. All traces of Chloe removed was relieved to see. Badger's arse, I asked with sympathy. Badger's arse. He nodded dolefully. You? Yes. Tea? No. Anything? No. Sit beside me? I moved. Emboldened. I put head on your shoulder. Yes. I put arm around you. Yes. Sat side by side in hungover silence. Remarkably pleasant. Considine, cleared throat. Never thought would hear self say these words, but I'm happy to see you. Was starting to think wouldn't see you at all this weekend. Thought you liked Chloe. Got Chloe out of retirement specially for you. Do like Chloe. Kindly of you to go to trouble. But like you too. He rubbed hand over stubbly jaw. Raspy noise. 
sexy, if truth be told. Like you too, Lola, he said. Silence. Like you very, very much. More silence. But not normal silence. Silence where a lot of emotion happening. Very much. Missed you since you left. Pause where weighed up what should say. Missed you too. Think about you all the time. Another pause. Think about you all the time too. Think about you every day. Another pause. Think about you every day too. He yawned. I yawned. He said, Better go back to bed. Seemed to be struck by notion. Twisted head to look at me. You like to come? Gazed into his eyes. Ah, uh, yes. Good. Sudden, most unconsidine like grin, and he swung me up into his arms, carrying me. Was mortified. Put me down. You will hurt your back. I have large bottom. Perfect bottom. He was climbing the stairs, not even puffing. How you so strong? Potholing. He kicked bedroom door open. It vibrated with force, then placed me in centre of bed. Still warm from him. All happening too fast. Lost my nerve. We have had no sleep, Considine. Let's have little snooze. Whatever you like. Got under duvet, but kept my pyjamas on. He kept clothes on also. Gathered me to him, pulled duvet tightly around us. I began drifting off to sleep, but felt would combust spontaneously. I'm too hot, Considine. Me too. I'm taking off my top. Me too. I unbuttoned my pyjama top. He pulled T-shirt over his head. Warm, smooth skin against mine. Hard muscles. Taut stomach. Oh, delicious. Shut my eyes and resumed sleeping position. I'm still too hot, Considine. Me too. But once all clothes off, felt hotter still. Freedom of unfettered limbs, legs tangled with his. I shifted and his erection banged against my thigh. Sorry, he said. Ignore it. Would prefer not to, if that's okay with you. That's okay with me, all right. Amused. Was bloody fabulous. No porn, no prostitutes, only one position. Focused, intense. Holding himself effortlessly on tensed arms, like doing push-ups, he moved slowly in and out of me, while staring into my eyes. Thought would die. 1501 Woken by double beep of Considine's phone. He read text, passed me phone. It's for you. Lola. You getting de ride off Considine? From Bridey. I replied in the affirmative. Text came back. Finish up now. Time to go home. Trees wants to beat de traffic. Considine, I have to go. Stay, he said. Cannot, I said. Big job tomorrow. Tomorrow? But I... He didn't say whatever had been going to say. You still very busy? Oh, very busy. Yes, had plenty of work, but making self sound even busier than was. No sign of it slowing down? No sign. And you're feeling good? Excellent. Glad to be back in Dublin. Overjoyed. Okay. Well, for what it's worth, Lola, I want to tell you something. It's important. What is it? 
Chloe here for you any time you like. Chloe? Not what had been expecting to hear. Kindly of you, I said stiffly. We'll let self out. 1538. In the car. So, Bridie said, you and tranny man. Is nothing, I said irritably. Holiday romance. Maybe he visits you in Dublin. I kept mouth closed. Considine hadn't mentioned any possible visits, and so neither had I. What's up with you? Bridie asked. Nothing. But not nothing. Had been stung by Considine's offer of Chloe's friendship. He hadn't said, I hear for you any time you like. Prepared to offer his tranny alter ego, but not himself. Grace I arrived home on the 19th of March, the day of the general election. D. Rossini's party is expected to do very well, Ma informed me. Good, good. I couldn't care less. I didn't want to hear about D or New Ireland or anything to do with them. Damien was looking for you, Ma said. My heart hopped, then immediately slumped to an even lower position. He must want to talk about what we were to do with our house. He rang while you were away, but I didn't want to disturb your holiday. He says to give him a ring when you're back. I'd give it a couple of days, I decided. It was going to be a painful discussion, and I wanted to put it off for as long as possible. He was bound to be working all hours on the election. That could be my excuse. I'd wait until after it was done and dusted. The following morning, I was woken at 7.30 by voices bellowing from the radio in the kitchen. Turn it down, I yelled. Turn the fucking thing down! But no one heard me, so I stomped downstairs. It's a bloodbath, Dad crowed, sitting at the kitchen table. Your friend D. Rossini is after making shite of the main parties. Everyone has lost seats to New Ireland, even the mighty nappies. She looks likely to double her number of doll seats. The nappies will be gagging to stay in coalition with her. Very good. I gave the dial such a swivel I hurt my wrist. Then I made toast and went back to bed. I ate my toast and drifted back into a funny, dream-filled half-sleep and was woken by a tap on the bedroom door. It was Ma. Someone to see you, she said. My heart leapt with hope and I sat up eagerly. No, it's not Damien, she said. Oh, okay. Slowly I lay down on the bed again. Get up, Ma hissed. It's D. Rossini. Oh, no. I'd have to be enthusiastic. Ma, tell her I can't. But Ma had disappeared out onto the landing. Then, practically bowing, she was leading D. into the room. New Ireland are forming a coalition government with the nappies. Ms. Rossini's just been made Minister for Finance and Deputy Prime Minister, Ma said bursting with pride. She just got a call this minute from Antishuk on her mobile. Antishuk? Ma loathed Teddy Taft. She hated him. She always referred to him as the thug and said his nose looked like a penis. But she'd even said Antishuk with its proper Irish pronunciation. Antishuk, as if she was dry retching. D hasn't been to bed yet. Ma said with admiration. Grace, Dee came towards me. Then she got a proper look. Oh my God, Grace, you look sick. Thanks a million, I said. I'm just back from holiday. I should look good. You'd want to have seen me before I went. Are you sure you're not sick? Completely sure. I went to the doctor. She made me. I indicated Ma who was still in the room. Ma put her hand to her chest and gave a little gasp, as if she too had just discovered that she was still in the room. I should really... She sounded disappointed. 
You must have private things to discuss. I'll leave you to it. Reluctantly, she left. Anyway, D. Congratulations. I remembered my manners. You've done amazingly well, Dad says. If it wasn't for you, Grace, I wouldn't even be leader of New Ireland, G said. I'm sorry you had to lose so much. I didn't know what to say. We're having a celebration tonight, D said. We're inviting every party member in the country. It's all being put together in a bit of a hurry. It's only right that you're there. D, no, I'm sorry. I have a surprise for you. A surprise? I didn't want a surprise. It's about Paddy. Ah! I held up my hand like I was warding off evil spirits. I didn't even want to hear his name. Come. Really? You'll be glad you did. Marnie. Marnie woke, in her own bed, in her own bedroom, feeling extraordinarily well. She'd slept through the night without once jerking awake from a terrifying nightmare. The sheets weren't tangled around her, drenched with sweat. And she felt full of hope, rather than her more customary dread. She'd got back from Tenerife the previous night. It was four days since she'd had a drink, since the lapse on holiday, and she'd made a little decision. No need to announce it to the world, but she was, very quietly, going to knock the drink on the head. It was Grace's pity that had done it. After Marnie had emerged from the lapse, which had happened a week into their holiday, she'd braced herself for Grace's fury. But Grace had responded with an astonishing lack of anger. There was a new look in her eyes. Like sympathy, but not as nice. Pity, Marnie had eventually recognised it as, and it had stung. The interesting thing was that during the weekends when Grace used to visit in an effort to police Marnie's drinking, her anger had had no effect at all on Marnie, except perhaps to make her retreat further into the cocoon of alcohol. It was as if Marnie had been able to see Grace mouthing the furious words but couldn't hear them. However, Grace's pity, that was a different story. Pity wasn't the same as compassion. A nasty vein of disrespect ran through pity. Suddenly she had seen herself as Grace and others saw her. Not as the intelligent, oversensitive creature she had always been treated as, but simply as a burden. Someone to worry about. It had been a bit of an eye-opener. That's what people think I'm like, she realised. Perhaps even my own daughter's. For the remaining three days of the holiday, words had kept swimming at her. Pathetic. Pitiful. Piteous. Tragic. Sad. It made Marnie feel... what? Misunderstood. She didn't want to be an object of pity. She wasn't the helpless, craven person Grace seemed to think she was. Especially when it came to alcohol. She drank because she chose to drink, for no other reason. And now I choose not to. She jumped out of bed and with great energy launched herself into unpacking her suitcase. Sandals were flung into the back of the wardrobe. Unfinished sun products were dumped into drawers, awaiting another holiday. And the washing machine was loaded up with bikinis and sarongs. With vigour, she shoved her suitcase under the bed, then got out the hoover. The house was dusty and smelt a bit peculiar after being empty for two weeks. And because the girls were coming after school, it was nearly three weeks since she'd seen them, everything needed to be perfect. As she scooted along the hall with the hoover, she saw that the answering machine light was flashing. Messages. She switched off the hoover and, taking a deep breath, hit play. There were only four messages. Not so bad. Actually, a surprisingly, embarrassingly small number for two weeks. I've been out of circulation, she reminded herself, flinching slightly. 
The first message was from her dentist. She'd missed her yearly checkup and she needed to reschedule. The second was a cold call from some poor creature trying to sell car insurance. The third was from Jules. Jules from AA. Just saying hi, Jules said, wondering how you're doing. Call any time. And the fourth was also from Jules from AA. Marnie deleted it before she'd listened to it fully, then went back and deleted the other message. She felt uncomfortable, almost sullied, that someone from Alcoholics Anonymous was ringing her. Right. Food. Apart from an almost empty box of Frosties, there was nothing in the house. She needed everything. Milk, bread, all the basics. Treats for the girls, something for tonight. She'd cook a proper dinner. Maybe Nick would stay. I miss Nick. Well, who knew, she thought, quite pleased. That's a normal feeling. Everything is becoming normal again. Everything will be okay. She made a short shopping list, pleased with how efficient and housewifey she felt. Got dressed, jumped into the car and drove towards Tesco. A few minutes later, she was surprised to find herself parked outside the off-license. What am I doing here? She had turned the car engine off. Turn it on. Turn it on and drive away. But she didn't. I don't want to drink today. I didn't want to come here. She stared at the key, hanging from the ignition. Drive away. She was opening the car door. I can get chocolate for the girls in here. She was climbing down onto the pavement. I can go to the supermarket after this. She pushed open the door of the off-license and heard it ping. Been away? Ben asked. Mmm. She picked up two bottles of vodka. Only two today? Ben asked cheerily, just making conversation. And twelve bars of chocolate. Then she was back in the car the chocolate bars and the two bottles strewn across the passenger seat. She looked at the bottles and thought, I don't want this, especially not today. I want to see Daisy and Verity. I don't want to be drunk when they come. I love them. I want things to be lovely for them. I don't want them to see me incapable. I love Nick. I don't want to disappoint him again. I don't want to wake up cold and wet, trying to remember what happened, wondering what day it is. But she knew what was going to happen. In a moment, she would pick up a bottle and she would drink from it. She would drink and drink and drink until she was lost. There was no choice. I don't want to, she said out loud. Please, something, somebody. I don't want to. She was crying now, frightened and helpless, hot tears pouring down her face. Why am I doing this? There was no one to blame. She'd stopped blaming Paddy. So why am I doing this? I don't want to. Alicia Ladies and gentlemen of New Ireland, I give you D. Rossini. In a burst of light, D. strode onto the stage, and all three thousand people present got to their feet and applauded wildly. The crowd was at capacity. Party workers, sponsors, well-wishers, and journalists and television crews from both local and foreign news outlets. D. took her place at the spotlit podium and Paddy and four other key New Ireland players arrayed themselves behind her on throne-like chairs. I want to thank everyone, Dee was saying, but most importantly, the party workers on the ground. Your dedicated and relentless work has given New Ireland these unprecedented returns. A smile lit up her face. New Ireland have agreed to form a coalition government with the Nationalist Party of Ireland. 
It might interest you to know that I've been offered and accepted the position of Minister for Finance. Everyone knew that. It had been on the news. But they roared anyway, like they'd just found out. And, Dee was bubbling over with pleasure, the position of Deputy Prime Minister. Everyone knew that too, but again they clapped with rowdy joy. Our success has given us a great platform to ensure that the policies and plans that we put to the electorate will form part of the programme for government. I promise to fulfil... Blah. Alicia wanted to tune out, but she had to listen. She had to watch Dee and watch how people reacted to her and be ready to report to Paddy if he needed it. This was her job now. As you know... Our deputy leader, Paddy de Courcy, recently got married. Cheering and whistling and foot stamping broke out, and Paddy got off his chair and acknowledged it with a little bow. From her position in the front row, Alicia was rapt. God, he was beautiful, she thought. The height, the shoulders, the ready smile, the twinkling eyes, the tie with the fat knot and he was all hers. After those terrible days so long ago, when she'd had to harden her heart against Marnie, the excruciating weight when he disappeared, the solitariness of her life when Marnie and Grace closed ranks against her, the bizarre compromises she'd made during her marriage to Jeremy, it had all been worth it. She'd got him in the end. Mind you, no honeymoon. She'd really been hoping for a proper one this time, one where she didn't have to go to gay bars. But with the general election being held two weeks after their wedding, the honeymoon had been postponed indefinitely. But Alicia's gain is New Ireland's loss, Dee continued. There was an echo on the mic, her words repeating themselves a split second after she'd uttered them. A tiny sliver of time for Alicia to wonder... What did Dee mean by that? Paddy, Dee said, has decided to take time out from political life. What? What? Alicia thought she must have misheard, that it must be something to do with the echo. But there was a muttering from the assembly that told her that others had heard what she'd heard. What was Dee talking about? Alicia didn't understand. Was she talking about Paddy going on honeymoon? Was there a honeymoon planned that she didn't know about? This evening, Dee continued, in fact, just before we came out onto this very stage, I had the sad duty of accepting Paddy de Courcy's resignation from New Ireland. The sad duty? Resignation? Alicia jerked her head to stare at Paddy. What was going on? Had this been planned? Why hadn't he told her? Paddy was slumped in his chair, his mouth fixed in an idiotic beam. Suddenly his face appeared ten foot high on the monitors. Blister like drops of sweat. Sweat? Paddy de Courcy, sweating. Sat on his temples, and his eyes were flickering beadily, like a trapped animal wondering how best to save himself. He hadn't had a clue, Alicia realised. D. Rossini was sacking him. Publicly, in front of the world's media. And he hadn't had a clue. Paddy, who always knew everything. Alicia was trying to think, but she was stunned with shock. How dare D. Rossini! The audacity! How could she be so cold-blooded, so ruthless? Admittedly, D. knew how Paddy had tried to sabotage her but Alicia had thought it was all sorted out, in the past, and that Dee and Paddy were once again moving forward with a shared vision. She hadn't expected that Dee would hold on to the grudge, like a dark, brooding mafia member. Half Italian, Alicia remembered. Dee was half Italian. Mind you, Irish people were champion grudge holders, probably far better than Italians. Dee reappeared on the massive screens, and Alicia was glad. Perhaps no one else had noticed Paddy's confusion, 
Perhaps it was only because she knew him so well that she'd seen it. But it was better not to take any chances. You've been a good friend and colleague over the years. Dee was giving the usual platitude-ridden farewell speech. What are we going to do? Panic seized Alicia, and she tried to connect with Paddy, to make him look at her. But his entire being was still frozen in that moronic smile. Then she noticed that the mood of the crowd had changed from euphoria to something far more subdued, and in a rush of hope, she thought, The party faithful won't stand for this. They love Paddy. But they loved Dee, too. And she'd just won an unprecedented number of seats. She was Deputy Prime Minister. She was Minister for Finance. She was more powerful than she'd ever been before. You've made real and lasting changes to Ireland. What are we going to do? Alicia forced herself to think. What did this mean for Patty? If the party faithful didn't rise up in revolt, what could be salvaged? Maybe it wasn't the disaster, it seemed. The long-term plan had always been that Paddy would eventually defect to the nappies. But now wasn't the right time, she acknowledged woefully. It could hardly be worse. Paddy had wanted to go to the nappies from a position of power, from a ministerial post. Now he'd have to come cap in hand, a sacked backbencher, with no leverage. And to think that if things had worked out, if he'd managed to oust Dee with that Moldovan story, he'd be leader of New Ireland right now. He'd already be a minister. In fact, he'd be the deputy leader of the country. He'd gone off his head with fury when that had fallen apart. God alone knew what he'd be like now. Paddy, Dee was winding up, you leave New Ireland with your integrity intact. Why wouldn't he leave with his integrity intact? Alicia thought. How dare Dee Rossini imply that Paddy was anything less than squeaky clean? And how strange that if you want to imply that someone is treacherous, you thank them for not being so. That one sentence was enough to do for Paddy. Alicia felt the mood of the crowd change, like a fast wind blowing across a field of ripe wheat. Out of the corner of her eye, she could see people raising their eyebrows and turning to their neighbours. No integrity. Funny, you should say. Never really trusted him. Too good-looking. Too charming. No one could prove anything, Alicia thought, and no one could prove he'd been sacked. Rumours would circulate, but he'd come back from it. Paddy could come back from anything. We wish you and Alicia much happiness together. Automatically, Alicia slapped a bright smile on her face. But inside her head, she was thinking, we should have seen this coming. We should have planned for it. But they'd sincerely thought that Dee needed Paddy too much. A horrible thought struck Alicia. He wouldn't blame her for this, would he? For the fact that they'd got married, which had given Dee a convenient reason to get rid of him. I'm sure we haven't heard the last of you. Dee twinkled over her shoulder at Paddy, still slumped in his chair like a stuck pig. Ladies and gentlemen, she faced the crowd again. Will you join me in thanking Paddy de Courcy and wishing him well in his life outside politics? Alicia began clapping. They'd all the time in the world to go on honeymoon now, she realised. But she didn't want to go. It would be like walking on eggshells. Paddy would be as angry as a caged lion. And they'd have nothing to plan. Plot. No. Plan was a better word. Plot sounded a little sinister. On the monitors, she saw clusters of people in the audience getting to their feet. They were giving him a standing ovation. Thank God for that. But as the seconds passed, most people remained seated, and the people who had originally stood up sat down again, looking a little red-faced. Shit. 
but Alicia wouldn't show her disappointment. She smiled and smiled, because you never knew when the camera might land on you, and clapped even harder, slapping her palms together with force. Her hand was almost better now. It barely hurt at all. Grace I gazed up at the stage, my jaw slack. I was gobsmacked. Dee Rossini had just sacked Paddy de Courcy in front of the world's media. Not only that, but she'd managed to imply that he'd been up to no good. It was so surprising and amazing I could almost have laughed. Why hadn't I seen this coming? Dee was a survivor of domestic violence. She'd set up her own political party and made an unprecedented success of it. She was steeled to the core. It was suddenly obvious that there was no way she'd share power with someone who tried to shaft her as Paddy had done. Or someone who treated women like Paddy did. Still, though, I was stunned by her brutality. Stunned in an admiring kind of way. She was a politician, that was the long and the short of it as ruthless as the rest of them. I was glad now I'd come. I so nearly hadn't, but Ma had chipped away at me until I had left the house just to escape her. The clapping began to die down. They hadn't even given Paddy a standing ovation. Christ, it was funny. I couldn't begin to imagine how angry he must be, and I wondered what form his reprisals would take. But I felt safe. Paddy's wings had been clipped, and he'd been stripped of most of his power. And even if he'd been at the height of his influence, there was nothing he could do to hurt me. Well, in theory, of course, there was. He could burn out my car again. He probably still wielded enough influence to get me sacked. But the worst had already happened to me. Compared to losing Damien, nothing else could cause me pain. The glee which had bubbled up in me from Paddy being brought so low abruptly drained away. No matter what happened to Paddy, I was still without Damien. All of a sudden the sparkle had vanished, and I was back in my body, back in the heaviness. The ache in my chest started up again. People were getting up to leave, and I decided to go too. I wanted to go home. Luckily, because I'd arrived late, I was right at the back. I turned towards the exit and standing directly behind me, waiting for my attention, was Damien. It was so unexpected that I stumbled. It was inevitable that our paths would cross sooner or later. I thought I'd prepared myself, but, judging from the way vomit hopped up my esophagus, I hadn't. It made me think of those fairground things, where you hit a platform with a hammer and something zips up a scale. Mr. Brawley told me where I could find you. Damien, having the advantage, was wearing a smile, which froze when he got a proper look at me. Christ, Grace, you look awful. You always were a charmer, I managed, then ran out of words. After a few moments had elapsed, he said, That's it? That's all you're going to say? What did he want from me? You don't look so hot yourself? I chanced. Yes, you had me worried there for a minute. So have you been sick? No, just destroyed. You know yourself? Yeah, his look spoke volumes. I do. In fairness, he didn't look so hot himself, like someone who hadn't slept for a couple of years. I rang you, he said. Ma said. I thought I'd wait until after the election. I knew you'd be busy. Grace, don't cry. Was I crying? I put my hand to my face. It was wet. How was that happening? Will we go outside for a cigarette? He offered. I'm still off them. Serious? Damien furrowed his forehead. I've been on eighty a day since you left. How come you're coping so well and I'm a fucking wreck? But I'm not. I choked. My tears were flowing faster, people were looking, and I didn't care. I'm a shambles. 
I'm so bad that sometimes even Bid's nice to me. I dropped my head and swept my hand across my drenched face. I had to get it together. Damien, I'd better go. It was too painful to be in his presence. Come back to me, Grace. An eternity of seconds passed. You don't mean that. When have I ever said anything that I didn't mean? The time you said my arse didn't look big in those jeans? A man tells one white lie. Softly he said, I'm sorry, Grace. Why are you sorry? I'm the one who fucked everything up. I shouldn't have let you leave. I couldn't stay. I didn't deserve to. You're scaring me now. Please, Grace, come back. Let's try to work it out. We could go to therapy or something. Therapy? I managed to smile. Well, maybe not. You'd never be able to forgive me, I said. Even if we tried again, it would always be there. I ruined something beautiful. I have forgiven you. How? How did forgiveness happen? I don't know, to be honest. But forgiveness did happen. I knew it did. I'd forgiven poor Marnie. I'd seen how anger could exist, hot and dangerous, and then dissolve away into nothing. Could that have happened to Damien? And I love you a lot, Damien said. That helped. I searched his face for the truth. Were these just words that couldn't be backed up by actions? It would be too painful to try again only to fail. Better not to try at all. And I'm not saying I'd like to ride him or anything like that, Damien said. But in a way I can understand you falling for de Courcy. He has charisma, whatever the word is, that's almost inhuman. He sighed. Of course, they said the same thing about Hitler. I laughed out loud. It was such a surprise. I'd spent 38 days thinking I'd never laugh again. So, Dazzler, will you come back to me? I hesitated. Best offer you'll ever get, he said. And that was such a Damien thing to say that suddenly I knew it was all going to be all right. I suppose I'd better, I said. I mean, who else would put up with you? Marnie The whinging was in full spate as Marnie, shepherded by Jules, came into the room. So grateful for the clean, decent life I have today. Thought I was a free spirit, a rebel, drinking, kicking off, no job, no ties. But I was a prisoner to drink. Might as well have had the house in the suburbs and the 2.4 kids. Skinhead Steve pointed out two empty chairs, and people whispered their hellos to Marnie as she passed by. Ula quietly brought her tea. Three sugars, right? Marnie nodded her thanks. She took a sip and looked around. There was Australian Des, smiling at her, and respectable Maureen. Sexy Charlotte pointed at Marnie's feet. Nice shoes, she mouthed, with such pained anguish it made Marnie laugh. Marnie settled back in her chair and listened and held her tea, comforted by the heat in her hands. I still have the extreme feelings I always had. Maybe not as bad, but instead of drinking on them, I get to a meeting. When I started coming here, you people told me I need never drink again. And I haven't. As usual, after a respectable interval, they alighted on her. Marnie, would you like to say anything? Everyone shifted in their chairs towards her. Already they were smiling. She was always treated to the full force of their warmth, even though she resolutely maintained her distance. Look, sweets. Look. Sit up, Nick said urgently. She shifted on her towel and groaned. I was nearly asleep there. It's good. You'll like it. 
Look at Verity. Marnie sat up on the riverbank and shaded her eyes against the sun. And there was Verity, in her mermaid bikini, pushing earnestly through the water. Mom! Dad! Verity called. Look! I'm swimming! Go, girl! Nick called, his voice swollen with pride. Look at you! Marnie waved at Verity, who stopped swimming just long enough to wave back and almost went under. Oh! She laughed and spluttered. I swallowed some river! She was different back then, so much more robust than the nervy little creature she was now. Quick, Mum, dry me! Daisy came racing towards her, water dripping from her long, skinny body. Did you see Verity? She's not scared any more. I saw. Come here. She unfurled a huge Minnie Mouse bath towel, got Daisy to hold one end, then wrapped it round and round her so she was like an upright roll of carpet. Dry me! Daisy stamped her feet and shivered dramatically. I'm freezing! Drama queen, Marnie said. Wonder where she gets that from? Nick threw her a cheeky look. She widened her eyes. Certainly not from me, mister. Briskly she rubbed Daisy dry, along the wings of her shoulder blades, her narrow little back, and the legs so long and skinny they were cute almost to the point of comedy. God, Daisy, you're beautiful. So are you, Mum. Yeah, so are you, Mum. Nick snapped her bikini strap, and they held a look for so long that Daisy exclaimed, That's gross. Suddenly Marnie was back in the AA meeting, but the soft pink glow of the memory remained. She turned and smiled at Jules beside her. Jules, who had been so kind, who had come as soon as Marnie had phoned her this morning from outside the off-license. Wait there, Jules had ordered, and don't move a muscle. I'll be with you in ten. Marnie closed her eyes. The remnants of the mood of the day by the river had wrapped themselves around her. It had been wonderful, full of love in every single word and action and thought. All she had ever wanted had been right there. But where was it? As the memory receded, Marnie realised she didn't recognise that riverbank. In fact, she was sure she'd never been to that place. And the girls looked older than they did now. Daisy had been missing two of her milk teeth. Verity's squint was gone. Even she and Nick were different. She'd put on some weight. Her hair was longer. Nick's hair was greyer. How could that be? But it had happened. She was certain of it. It wasn't a dream or a fantasy. It was a memory. Then she understood it all. It was a memory. Of course it was a memory. It had really happened. It just hadn't happened yet. She opened her eyes. Every person in the room was still smiling at her. My name is Marnie. Their smiles widened. Hi, Marnie. And I'm an alcoholic. Lola. Saturday, 21st March, 
1-0-1. Buzzer ringing. Excessively early. Local scanger kids always at that lark. Youthful hijinks. Let's wake up silly purple-haired girl. I usually manage wry twist of lips at their scangy high spirits. But not this morning. In no mood. Very tired. Have not slept well for entire week. Since last weekend's jaunt to Nokovoy. The entire Considine Chloe business confusing. Upsetting. Distressing. Had done much brooding. Buzzer rang again. Pulled duvet overhead. Rang again. God's sake. Flung duvet aside with narky flourish. Stumped to entry phone in my pyjamas and said firmly, Fuck off, local scanger kids, and let me have my sleep. They respect use of language. Sorry to wake you, voice said. Not voice of local scanger kids. Instead, sexy bogger voice. The voice of Considine. What on earth are you doing here? You think Dublin is total kip of a place. Is total kip of a place, he said. So why are you here? Don't make me say it, Lola, said in low, sexy mutter. Not out here on street. Gang of young fellas in hoodies already laughing at my car. Make you say what? Mystified. Pause. Heavy sigh. Further low, sexy muttering. I love you, Lola Daly. This short, frankly stunning admission, accompanied by explosion of raucous laughter and catcalls from, can only conclude, local scangers. Disembodied scangful voice shrieked, The mulchy with the crap car thinks he's in with a shout with Lola. Is that true? I asked. Very early in the morning. All very unexpected. Lack of sleep distorting reality. This might be lovely news, but afraid to trust. Yeah, the mulchy's car is crap. Mulchy is hybrid word, conflation of culchy and mucker. Enough of this three-way conversation. Local scangers cruel. Needed to save Considine. Humble, culchy man. Considine, I said firmly, you are coming in. When you hear buzzing noise, push door, not pull, push. Is okay, Lola. Know how it works. Sarcastic addendum. Read about it in a book. Ah, ha. Huh. Our old friend Cranky Arse not entirely dead and buried. Pressed button, opened my front door. Considine appeared. Unkempt, stridy, sexy. Into my flat. Maleness. Muscles, general delicious manliness, pulled me to him, looked up into his face, his mouth very near mine. That thing you just said, I said, you say it again, please. Dublin total kip of a place. But he was laughing. Very, very handsome when laughs. Oh, very handsome. You mean part when I said I love you? Yes. That bit. I love you, Lola Daly. This news has come as surprise, I admitted. Chloe, yes, misunderstanding, he said. Wanted to lure you back to Nokovoy with Chloe. Thought you loved Chloe. Do love Chloe, but, and cannot understand this, Considine, love you more. Both of us somewhat startled stared at each other in shock. Eventually he said, Don't mean to alarm you, but you used word love just there. Replayed sentence in head. Yes, I did. You mean it? Thought about it. About how much had missed him since I'd left Nokovoy in January. How every tiny thing had reminded me of him. Yes, Considine would appear that I do. His hold on me tightened. Lola, Lola, 
He sighed, as if mightily relieved. Christ, you've no idea. Shook his head. Couldn't stop thinking about you after you left on Monday. Nothing new there, though. Think about you all the time. Day and... Night. Liked the way he said night. Sexy sounding word. You had done something wrong, he said. Had misread what you wanted. Going out of my mind. Bad week. Couldn't sleep. Last night, decided. That's it. Had to get in car and find you. I drove all night. Sexy sounding sentence. If you drove all night, I said, you must have gone via Morocco. Only three and a half hour journey. He laughed. Again, like comedy festival round here. You serious about this? I asked. More serious than trying to think of something very serious. Bowel cancer? Anna Wintour? Rise in ocean levels? All of them. Impressive. Anna Wintour, very serious, I believe. Come on. I got my car keys. Where are we going? To see my mum. Should I wear a tie? Considered him. Jeans, black fleece, stampy style boots. No, you have your look, working it well. At the cemetery, three kids noisily playing football around a grave. Disrespectful. Until realised it was their little brother who had died, and they had made him goalie. Life so very, very precious. Picked our way through the graves until got to Mum. Mum, this is Considine. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Daly, Considine said to her headstone. Think, Mum said. Nice to meet you too. But hard to hear her because football children shouting, Yes! and No! and other football words. She says, nice to meet you too, I said, because she probably did. She is tremendously polite. Now, Considine, I need to have a little private chat with her. I go away. No, is silent chat. You may stay. We both sat on little curb, and in my head I said, take a good look at him, Mum. Now, not your fault you had to die and leave me, but really need your advice. Afraid to trust own judgment after de Courcy. What do you think about this cranky tranny who lives on other side of country? Voice in head answered, He is not cranky. Yes, but he is not tranny either. True. Admittedly, he does live on other side of country, but is very small country. Please do not mention Kildare Bypass. Do you love him? Yes, Mum. Then you have to go for it. Moment of doubt. Was I only telling self what wanted to hear? Mom, are you really there? Yes, one of the kids yelled. My anxiety dispersed. Had not imagined that voice. And at the same time, sun shook itself free of cloud and beamed sudden yellow light down on us all. Mom, tell me honestly, will it be okay? Yes, the kid yelled again. You quite sure? Yes, yes, yes. The End You have been listening to This Charming Man by Marion Keyes. Narrated by Caroline Lennon. If you have enjoyed this recording and would like to receive information on the latest titles, please contact us at the address on the cover. We will be pleased to send you a catalogue of available titles.